The Rules Committee will come to order. Um, we have a busy day in front of us as we consider five measures this morning, and I will discuss them here in the order that they will be considered. Uh, first, we will consider H.R. 1425, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Enhancement Act, to reverse the President's sabotage of the landmark health care law that improved access to care for millions of Americans. Second, we will consider both H.R. 5332, the Protecting Your Credit Score Act, to modernize our broken and outdated credit reporting system, and H.J. Res. 90, the Congressional Review Act, a joint resolution of disapproval on regulations issued by the Trump administration to weaken the Community Reinvestment Act and erode civil rights law. Uh, these are especially timely as Americans try to better understand their financial situation during the COVID-19 pandemic. Under H.R. 5332, millions of Americans can receive a free credit score with their consumer report. Third, uh, we'll consider H.R. 51, the Washington, D.C. Admittance Act, to finally make our nation's capital the 51st state and provide more than 700,000 citizens with the full representation that they've been denied for too long. The world recognized just how important self-governance is when the Trump administration recently used the National Guard and the federal law, enforce and federal law enforcement to crack down on constitutional, peaceful protests, something we've traditionally seen from dictators abroad, but not from a president of the United States. Finally, uh, fourth, we will consider H.R. 7120, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, to reform policing in this country and bring an end to systemic uh, racism and brutality in our criminal justice system. No one is suggesting that all police officers are racist or break the law, but in America today, a black American is three times more likely to be killed by, by police compared to a white person. Police shoot, arrest, and imprison more people in our country than in similar advanced nations. It's the exception when an officer who broke the law when committing a fatal shooting is convicted of a crime, not the norm. These are systemic problems. It is beyond time that we listen to the American people and we deliver uh, uh, systematic solutions. Uh, before I turn to our witnesses, let me first uh, turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any comments uh, he wishes to make. And let me just say to everybody who's on the, uh, uh, you know, at this hearing, you all look good. I know most of you are here in Washington, but uh, we're trying to comply with the recommendations from the attending physicians to uh, safely distance from one another. Uh, and so we're all in various offices here, uh, but it's great to see everybody. And I now will yield to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any comments that he wishes to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our hearing today covers a wide variety of items ranging from a partisan police reform measure to statehood to the District of Columbia to the CRA resolution on banking regulations. Since we last met four weeks ago, the world has once again shifted under our feet, particularly following the reprehensible treatment and tragic death of George Floyd. Indeed, Americans have rightly converted into the horrific. Mr. Chairman, I can't hear Mr. Cole. And the uh, service, maybe no. we are in despicable violations. Follow most police officers take to serve and protect their fellow citizens. Mr. Mr. Cole, yeah, yeah, there we go. The mic. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. I thought I was going to. That's, that's yeah. perfect. Thank I you. I apologize. Thank you for bringing the mic. Um, I want to note that I've spoken with numerous members of law enforcement in my district, and like all of us, they could not be more strongly, uh, they could not more strongly condemn what happened to George Floyd and others in similar scattered incidents. And that's because the overwhelming majority of police officers faithfully and bravely discharge their responsibilities each and every day. Unfortunately, while law enforcement is supposed to be carried out in a dispassionate manner without regard to color or creed, the death of George Floyd. Uh, George Floyd is a sobering reminder that abuses of power clearly exist and must be addressed. As we've all grappled with this hard reality, it has rightly led to demands for real change related to how law enforcement acts as they strive to keep our communities safe. Moreover, it caused all of us to take a closer look at how our society treats people of color generally and African Americans specifically. Clearly, there's an important national dialogue underway on the issue of police reform. 
The noble aim of that discussion is to produce a reform package that will enhance the professionalism and transparency of community policing while increasing the competence and security of every citizen, particularly those living in communities of color. Today, the majority is bringing forward a bill, H.R. 7120, to reform policing in America. Unfortunately, I cannot support it as written at this time. I want to remind the majority that everyone in this House, regardless of party, believes that policing reforms are needed. Republicans stood ready to work hand in hand with Democrats to pass meaningful and needed legislation. But yet when H.R. 7120 was written and marked up, Republicans were completely shut out of the process. It comes as no surprise that a partisan process has resulted in a partisan bill. It absolutely did not have to be that way. My friends across the aisle did not even attempt to engage Republicans in a meaningful way and consider our ideas for advancing our shared goal of meaningful reform. As a result of being shut out by the Democratic majority's conversations, Republicans have put forward our own proposal led by Senator Tim Scott and Congressman uh, Pete Stauber. The Justice Act contains a number of critical reforms that, unlike H.R. 7120, should be signed into law tomorrow. The Justice Act provides funding for body cameras for police officers nationwide, requires de-escalation procedures, bans chokeholds, and makes lynching a federal crime. I'm encouraged that all four Republican members of the Rules Committee, myself, Mr. Woodall, Dr. Burgess, and Ms. Huskin, are all original co-sponsors of this measure. Anytime the majority wishes to bring this bill before this committee, we stand ready and willing to work with you in a bipartisan way to quickly move it through the House and ultimately to the President's desk. Even in divided government, the country deserves and expects us to work together to produce police reform legislation that upholds the constitutional rights and inherent dignity of every individual. In addition to H.R. 7120, today's hearing covers a variety of other items. We're considering H.R. 51, a bill to grant statehood to the District of Columbia. This bill is a well-intentioned but deeply misguided effort that fails to pass constitutional muster, while at the same time ignoring the practical and fiscal implications of turning the seat of the federal government into its own state. The majority is also bringing forward H.R. 1425, a massively expensive and partisan bill designed to expand the Affordable Care Act. And contrary to the majority's claim that remote committee proceedings would allow committees to continue to do their important work, this hodgepodge of various bills includes the text of only eight bills that have been reported out of committee, and includes the text of 16 bills, which have not even had a markup. Let me make that clear. Nearly 70% of this bill has not been considered <coughs> a markup, even though the Democrats have all the tools to do so at their disposal. On the substance, H.R. 1425 amounts to yet another Washington power grant at the expense of states. For the 14 states that have not expanded Medicaid, like my own home state of Oklahoma, it literally reduces Medicaid funding and imposes reporting requirements designed to embarrass those states. Most distressingly, the bill uses the Orwellian euphemism, quote, encouraging expansion, unquote, to describe this process. When the Affordable Care Act was passed, states were promised that they would have the option to not be required to expand Medicaid and would be assisted financially if they chose to do so. Now the majority is seeking to overthrow that promise and uh, pitch it out the window, using only uh, sticks to discourage states who have chosen not to expand. It seems to me to be a mistake and a misuse of federal power that goes against the solemn promises that were made a decade ago. The bill also includes the text of H.R. 3, a partisan bill the House has previously passed. I'll repeat what I said the first time the Rules Committee considered that bill. H.R. 3 will stop drug creators and researchers from developing life-saving treatments and will result in delays in getting new cures to the patients who need them most. At, the, at a time when we are in the middle of a global pandemic, where our hopes for protecting human life and returning to normalcy rely on drug companies developing vaccines and new treatments for COVID-19, this bill will discourage that process. This seems enormously misguided to me. Finally, we're also meeting on two bills from the Financial Services Committee. The first, HRES 90, uh, is a resolution uh, arising under the Congressional Review Act to strike down regulations issued by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency 
to regulate banks under the Community Reinvestment Act. Regulations used by the OCC will update the rule of the road for banks and other financial institutions, particularly given the expansion of technology and the move to online banking in recent years. The regulations will in no way prevent the OCC from continuing to regulate the notorious and nefarious practice of redlining, as has been alleged. I do not believe there's any need for a CRA action on these regulations today, and I consequently oppose uh, this resolution. And finally, Mr. Chairman, we're considering H.R. 5332, the Protecting Your Credit Score Act. I understand that Republicans on the Financial Services Committee have raised significant concerns with this bill, including that it is overly prescriptive, is heavily reliant on using full Social Security numbers for identification, lacks strong cybersecurity protection, and increases the power of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I look forward to hearing their concerns during today's hearing, and I hope this committee will make amendments in order, allowing all members an opportunity to improve this bill and all of the others before us today, uh, before we reach final passage. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the time and yield back. Well, Ranking Member Cole uh, yields back his time. I thank you very much for your opening. Uh, I'd now like to welcome our witnesses to provide testimony on HR 1425, the Patient Protection and, and Affordable um, Care Enhancement Act. Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Walden, Representative Estes, thank you very much for providing testimony today. Without objection, any written materials you submit uh, to rulesdocuments at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. I now would like to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, uh, Chairman Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm pleased to speak in support of, I'll call it the Enhancement Act, which follows through on Democrats' commitment to lower the rising cost of health care and prescription drugs for the American people. Now, over the last 10 years, the Affordable Care Act has led to historic coverage gains and provided American families with more consumer protections and value in their health care. Under the ACA, the uninsured rate reached historic lows in 2016. People with pre-existing conditions are protected from discrimination by insurance companies. Preventive care includes flu shots, birth control, and mammograms. They're all free of cost, and parents are able to keep their children on their insurance plans longer. Annual and lifetime limits were eliminated, and millions of Americans received financial assistance to lower the cost of their monthly insurance premiums. Unfortunately, a lot of the ACA's progress was halted and in some cases reversed under the Trump administration because it waged an ongoing campaign to sabotage and undermine these important consumer protections and coverage gains. After President Trump took office, the Trump administration worked with the Republican allies in Congress on a series of efforts intended to undermine and ultimately repeal the ACA. Even now, in the midst of a public health crisis, the administration is urging the Supreme Court to strike down the entire ACA and take coverage away from millions of people. The administration's campaign of sabotage has driven up the uninsured rate to its highest point in years. Unfortunately, this also created conditions that have left us more vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic, with millions of Americans uninsured and afraid they won't be able to afford the cost of care if they become sick. So this Enhancement Act will reverse these trends by expanding coverage and making health care and prescription drugs more affordable. The legislation is a common sense, fiscally responsible, one-two punch, I call it a win-win, that uses the federal government's savings from lowering prescription drug costs to reinvest in measures to lower health care insurance costs for Americans. Now, this bill does that by empowering the Secretary of HHS to negotiate a fair price for prescription drugs, which will be available to both seniors and people on the commercial market. With lower drug prices, Americans will be able to reliably take the drugs they depend on, and the legislation stops the gouging of Americans at the pharmacy counter, which will translate into billions of savings for both the federal government as well as consumers through lower out-of-pocket spending and monthly premiums. H.R. 1425 reinvest these savings to lower health care costs for consumers. Under the Enhancement Act, for the first time, more middle-class Americans would receive financial assistance with monthly premiums, including those with incomes above 400 percent of the federal poverty line. And this means that a family of four, for example, with an annual income of $60,000 would save $2,000 annually, and a family of four with an annual income of $100,000 who previously did not qualify for subsidies would save $8,000 annually. 
The Enhancement Act also lowers Americans' health care costs by reversing some of the worst sabotage done by the Trump administration to the health care system. It reverses the Trump administration's deregulation of junk insurance plans. These junk plans deny access to basic benefits like prescription drugs, maternity care, mental health, substance abuse treatment, and they set arbitrary dollar limits for health care services, leading to huge surprise bills for consumers. They also discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. Now, the bill also, low, also lowers consumer costs by reversing the Trump administration's funding cuts to the Navigators program, restores outreach and enrollment funding, and offers a financial incentive to establish or have states establish their own state-based marketplaces, which I think also makes healthcare more affordable. And the bill also provides funding for a reinsurance program, which helps states further lower premiums, deductibles, and out-of-pocket costs. The legislation builds on the ACA's progress to expand and strengthen Medicaid, uh, which is a lifeline for so many people. The ACA's Medicaid expansion was intended to ensure that those who could otherwise not afford insurance have access to care. And while the expansion has been incredibly <coughs> successful, there are millions more who don't have access to this because the states have refused to expand Medicaid. So H.R. 1425 expands the Medicaid program by increasing the federal matching rate. It's 90 percent now if a state wants to expand. This makes it 100 percent. So if fully adopted, an additional 2.3 million uninsured Americans would gain coverage and overall health outcomes would be improved. So in conclusion, Mr. Chair and to the committee, the Enhancement Act restores the balance of power back to the people lowers health care and prescription drug costs, expands coverage for millions of Americans, and reverses the Trump administration's year-long effort or years-long effort to undermine access to quality and affordable care. So I strongly urge support for the bill. I just wanted to say one new thing that happened this morning, Mr. Chairman, it's not in my remarks, but I want to add is that the CBO, uh, we have a CBO score now, and it says the premiums will be 10% lower and 4 million more people would be covered as a result of the Enhancement Act. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to all the members of the Bills Committee. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pallone, uh, Chairman Pallone. I would now uh, like to recognize the distinguished gentleman from Oregon, uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Walding. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the ranking member Cole for letting me testify today. Uh, let me be clear, um, this legislation, H.R. 1425, has not been through any sense of regular order, um, which is unfortunate. The Energy and Commerce Committee produces a lot of bipartisan work. Um, this is not among that work, um, and it has multiple problems as a result. Uh, we heard Mr. Cole say approximately two times as many bills contained within this shell uh, have never been marked up or considered by the committee as have. So I'd like to uh, say a couple of things along the way. Uh, we need to work to, to help states stabilize their healthcare markets that were damaged by the ACA, um, the pledge that our, our premiums would go down and every family would save 2,500 bucks a year uh, simply has not been uh, realized as uh, deductibles have skyrocketed and premiums have gone up. We wanna lower out-of-pocket costs for patients, especially for seniors. We should be reforming Medicare Part D. We had efforts underway to do that in a bipartisan way until they were shelved by the Democrats. We ought to limit the out-of-pocket costs for seniors on, on Medicare. Uh, we should expand access to preventive services. Uh, there's a lot of work we can be doing there. For example, why have the Democrats not fully funded for multiple years um, our community health centers? These are a lifeline for people all across my district and all of our districts. And yet the funding runs out again uh, in November. Um, this has been put off multiple times, leaving our health care centers uh, in the lurch. Uh, we should encourage participation in private health insurance, as we did in the PPP program, uh, to help employers keep their employees covered by their private insurance. Uh, and we should increase the number of options available through the market. Unfortunately, this bill does none of those things. It does, however, provide a $100 billion bailout to big insurance companies for the next 10 years. But wait, it's actually every year for $10 billion every year uh, for perpetuity, in perpetuity. Insurance companies would get $10 billion a year provide 400 million to prop up the ACA enrollment, including $100 million for the failed and discredited Navigators program. And, you know, we've had a lot of debates about the Navigators program. I would just remind you of sort of the waste and, and abuse that's occurred there. In fact, as we all know, 
Um, navigators enrolled less than 1% of total enrollees. And there was even a situation, I think it was in South Dakota, where taxpayers forked over $200,000 to the Navigator program there, and they enrolled one person, uh, one single person. Um, in total, the group received $2,300 per enrollee in North and South Dakota, 2,300. Now on the private sector side, where they enroll uh, most of, of the folks that come into this exchange, their average cost per enrollee is $2.40. So uh, this is not a good bargain for the taxpayers to throw $400 million to prop up ACA enrollment, including $100 million for the Navigators program, $100 million for outreach. This is a 10-year-old uh, federal insurance program. Uh, it shouldn't require this kind of uh, additional funding every year uh, unless it is just not succeeding out there. It provides $200 billion for states to get another chance at establishing their own ACA exchanges. However, states are already able to do this, and some already are. Just last week, Kentucky notified uh, CMS that it would create its own exchange. This legislation actually reduces flexibility to states to reduce premiums and decrease options for consumers. It also attempts to force states to expand Medicaid to allow states to get a 100% funding for their Medicaid population whenever they expand. But as Mr. Cole talked about in his state of Oklahoma, it actually penalizes non-expansion states by cutting their Medicaid. This is both vindictive and I would argue potentially unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said it is the state's decision. This plan ignores that. Not only do the provisions in this bill ignore the bipartisan work that's been done at the Energy and Commerce Committee, the bill also includes the socialist drug pricing scheme that would devastate the country's innovation in the middle of a global pandemic. As we know from the facts that were presented in the debate on HR3, HR3 would cause a 58% reduction in industry revenue, reducing investment, and reducing access to new medical cures. It is stunning that the majority would move forward with this proposal when we know for a fact that their estimates of up to 100 cures would be lost, medicines that would never be developed, treatments that would never be uh, developed, vaccines that might never be developed. And here we are in the middle of the COVID crisis, COVID crisis, where we are pleading with our great innovators in America to develop new cures uh, for this terrible disease and treatments, um, the, the Democrats' plan would reduce, and it is a fact from CBO, access to new cures and treatments. I think we can lower drug prices without sacrificing that innovation and the American jobs that would be lost by the Democrats' plan. I've offered many chances to work on bipartisan legislation that would lower drug costs without limiting innovation. In fact, Republicans offered up H.R. 19. It's our bipartisan alternative. Everything in H.R. 19 was bipartisan, and already seven of those provisions have actually been signed into law through other vehicles. Democrats plan H.R. 3, not a single provision has made its way into law. So instead of pursuing proven bipartisan solutions, here the Democrats go again, forcing partisan policies that will actually result in fewer medicines and cures for patients when we need new treatments and cures the most. Instead of working to cap seniors out of pocket annual costs, Democrats walked away. Last Congress, I advocated for multiple policies that would help states stabilize health markets damaged by the ACA. But unfortunately, House Democrats repeatedly blocked our creative solutions. Solutions like actually improving the 1332 waiver process to better meet states' unique needs and modernizing programs to stabilize premiums. Now, Oregon's a pretty blue state, as you all know. We actually have a very active 1332 waiver for a cost-based reinsurance program and I supported my state's application approval because it represents the very fabric of federalism. What works best for Oregon may not work best for Massachusetts or California. And in Oregon, the reinsurance program kept premiums 6% below what they would have been without it. These are real savings for Oregonians. So we all want patients to have access to high quality, affordable health coverage. But unfortunately, the Affordable Care Act has ironically made insurance far too unaffordable for far too many Americans. This measure doubles down on policies that have already not worked as promised. We need to work together with the states as our partners, not as our subordinates. In 2018, I led Congress in reauthorizing the longest extension in history of the Children's Health Insurance Program. While CHIP is a vital program, and I've been a strong supporter of it, this bill's permanent extension of the program is, I believe, careless and rash, and let me explain why. Congress should not surrender its rightful oversight
oversight responsibility that comes with regular reauthorization of programs. One thing's clear, we need to make our healthcare system work better for all Americans. That's why our goal should be to advance solutions to protect patients, stabilize healthcare markets, encourage greater flexibility for states, and promote policies to help Americans get and keep healthcare coverage they can afford and want. This bill is not a solution to our challenges. Instead, I would say it's kind of a lazy attempt at vindication for the previous administration's single achievement, which has left too many Americans high and dry without a pocket expenses they can no longer afford. I could go on, but I know many of my colleagues have more grievances to share on this bill. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I am now uh, pleased to yield to the distinguished uh, gentleman from Kansas, uh, Representative Estes. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, uh, Ranking Member Cole, and all members of the Rules Committee for allowing me to join you today. Now, I'm glad to be with you to debate the severe consequences of the policies in H.R. 1425. Still, I'm disappointed that the House Democrats insist that we waste time and risk the health of members and staff on partisan bills uh, like those partisan policies like those in this bill. We have to stop these partisan games and work together to find real common sense solutions to help Americans that we were elected to represent. Our focus should be on mitigating the coronavirus spread, developing treatments and vi vaccines, and getting our economy back up to full speed. Instead, the Democrats are pushing items from a progressive wish list that have been developed over the last several years. How can we rationalize slowing down cures and vaccines like those for the coronavirus from getting to Americans to expand the role of government in healthcare? We can't forget our nation is still in the, nation, in the middle of a public health crisis. Officials across all levels of government and throughout the healthcare sector have learned valuable lessons that will help make us better prepared for the remainder of the crisis and in the case of a future pandemic. H.R. 1425 includes the centerpiece policy from the Democrats' failed drug bill, which would give the government the power to set drug prices. As highlighted during the debate on H.R. 3, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has estimated that price setting policies like these will result in less innovation and make fewer cures and treatments. These policies will surely make the United States less prepared for future pandemics. Thankfully, this bill, just like HR3, is going nowhere fast. The extremist policies contained in this bill uh, have no chance of becoming law. The Senate's not going to debate the bill. The president will never sign it. It's genuinely surprising that the House Democrats have chosen to advance such a tone deaf policies at this time. Doesn't stop there. The bill creates a new entitlement targeted to get higher income Americans into Obamacare. It will result in a substantial expansion of government, but will fail to recognize and resolve Obamacare's most significant flaws. According to estimates from the Kaiser Family Foundation, only 32% of Americans eligible to enroll in Obamacare chose to enroll in an Obamacare plan last year. Rather than finding a way to make it more attractive and affordable and have better options for consumers, Democrats think it's a better way to cover up their Obamacare pay, uh, policies and failures with larger taxpayer subsidies, throwing more good money after bad. More offensively, the bill cuts one of the few non-Obamacare options people can choose, the short-term health plans. These lower cost plans have been a lifeline to people who don't want or can't afford Obamacare plans. Sadly, this is just another casualty of the Democrats' ruthless pursuit to prop up Obamacare. They think Washington knows better than Americans that have to choose these plans. I want to encourage my colleagues to drop the partisanship, work with Republicans to find common sense solutions that will actually help Americans now. We can work together to make health care more affordable while providing Americans with greater choice and control. Thank you, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I don't have any questions, but I just want to point out for the record that uh, prior to the ACA, uh, working people were priced out of health insurance uh, and they were blocked from accessing life-saving health services and medication. Uh, and I, I was around when my friends uh, not too long ago were in charge of this place and, um, and, I, uh, and, the, and the policies that they pursued uh, uh, increased the number of people who were uninsured. Um, uh, didn't provide protections for people with pre-existing conditions, um, uh, and, uh, and quite frankly, didn't do what the American people wanted us to do. Um, 
I'm, you know, I'm proud that we passed the ACA. I think it's not perfect. I think we need to, to do more to expand health care protections. But it is frustrating uh, that we have a president who uh, seems committed uh, to uh, doing everything he can to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act, even right as we speak, you know, pursuing uh, measures in, 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 a, in federal court uh, that if he were successful would literally take away protections for people with pre-existing conditions. I find that offensive, quite frankly. So I appreciate uh, the testimony. I have no questions. I'm happy to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any questions he may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin with a point that my good friend from Oregon made, and I made in my opening comment. Again, uh, this bill in front of us is actually a combination of, uh, of 24 different bills, eight of which had a markup, uh, 16 of which did not. And we've adopted all sorts of tools, uh, you know, and we're using them here today to allow for remote markup. So, uh, Chairman Pallone, can you tell me why you chose not to uh, mark up any of those uh, 16 bills instead to bring them before us, before this committee, without the Committee of Jurisdiction actually having done its work on those 16 bills? Well, Mr. Cole, most of the of what's in this bill has had some hearing. I mean, obviously, H.R. 3 passed the House that dealt with the prescription drugs. I mean, when we're talking about increasing, you know, uh, uh, re reversing the sabotage in terms of, you know, saying that you can't have junk plans, uh, a lot of these things we've had hearings or, you know, markups on. Uh, you know, it's also the fact that, you know, this is something that's got to be done fairly quickly in order to help people. Uh, and, you know, that that process takes a long time, because remember, in our committee, you know, we have a subcommittee hearing, subcommittee markup, full committee uh, uh, markup. So, I mean, I have to be honest with you that given that most of this has already been heard before, already passed the House before, I just didn't think it was necessary, uh, given the, 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 the need for quick action. Did you have felt it was necessary if you were in the minority uh, to had an opportunity to ask questions, make suggestions, offer amendments on 70% of the bill? Well, Mr. Cole, remember that, it, you know, and no offense, I mean, I love you guys, but, you know, no offense, but you guys want to repeal the ACA. I mean, tomorrow, the administration's in court in the, at, before the Supreme making an argument the whole thing should be repealed. So for you to suggest that somehow you want to work with us on enhancing the ACA. I mean, you want to repeal the ACA. So, I mean, I don't really- I won't take you all the way back to the beginning of this process, but uh, Republican Congress actually working with President Obama passed nine different measures to change the ACA. Uh, so you don't have to agree with the bill to have an opportunity to make it better. And in this case, you know, again, 70% of this bill just simply hasn't been heard by your committee. We're just rushing it right to the floor. Well, I would not, I don't agree with you that, that most of this bill hasn't been, I think almost everything bill has been heard in some fashion before the committee before. Um, and, you know, frankly, if I thought that, you know, at any point that the Republicans would be supportive of the ACA and I just want to repeal it, uh, you know, I might uh, have a different attitude. But, you know, as I said, the Supreme Court's going to hear oral argument on repeal tomorrow. There's no reason to believe that any, any of uh, my Republican colleagues or the leadership want to work with us on any of this. I, I don't think I, it's look, the I, case. I just go back to history. Look, when we were in the majority, uh, again, there were nine different measures. Everything from getting rid of uh, 199s to uh, junking the long-term care portion of ACA, which even Secretary Sebelius at the time said was unaffordable. In other words, there were a lot of measures. Now, we still wanted to repeal the ACA. But we did work with you, worked with President Obama a lot. And in this case, we just haven't done it, my view. So, uh, you know, again, I don't have to agree with you about the ACA to think there are things we both could work on together that would make it better. Well, I do hope at some point we can, but I haven't seen any indication of that, to be perfectly honest. I mean, the one thing that, that um, you know, of course, this had a full committee markup HR3, the prescription drugs. I mean, the president has said that he wants negotiated prices for prescription drugs, but I wish he would put some, you know, pressure on McConnell and the and the Senate Republicans to actually move that bill. But that bill, you know, passed the House. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Walden, if I could, let me just basically ask you sort of the same thing. Were you and your colleagues 
afford any opportunity to work on any bipartisan path forward in this legislation? No, uh, not on HR fourteen twenty five, uh, Mr. Cole. We uh, there there are some bills as you know, and you pointed out um, that there was markup and, and hearing on, but the vast majority of them, I think you said seventy percent, uh, we weren't even asked. <laughs> you know, I, I, the chairman and I have a very good working relationship, but it's you feel kind of left behind when it's like, well, one person decides, oh, we don't need to have a hearing, we don't need to have a markup. We talked about them. It's okay going forward. with another one be senior. Here's the other point, Mr. Cole. Um, we did work together and still are on the issue of surprise billing. We passed that bill out of committee a year ago, um, unanimously out of the Energy and Commerce Committee. It's, it's, People out there every day are getting surprise it's, bills. It's, Why isn't that bill making its way to the House floor? Now we're continuing to try and, and get that done. The Democrats have been a majority now for a year and a half. Um, consumers have been getting ripped off uh, on surprise medical billing, things where they follow the rules, they pay for the insurance, they do everything they're supposed to do, and then boom, they get hit. Like Sonji Wilkes uh, in, in Colorado, whose child was born with a, uh, with a condition that took that child into a pediatric intensive care facility, a, a NIC unit, um, and it turns out the hospital had contracted out the neonatal intensive care unit that was just a matter of a few yards from the maternity wing. And she got stuck with a, a fifty thousand dollar bill, as I recall. This is outrageous. Now we passed that. Why? Why isn't that in this package? Why haven't we funded community health centers for multiple years? We did that as Republicans. We extended CHIP as Republicans. We started this Congress advocating for protections for people with pre-existing conditions. We have legislation that would do that. That has not been brought up. That could be a safety net underneath whatever the Supreme Court does. But Democrats, it appears, would rather have the argument than solve the problem. And it's really frustrating. When I was chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, we I think we passed out 143 bills out of the committee. Virtually every one of them was bipartisan. If you look at our work on opioids, our work to reauthorize brownfields, our work on autonomous vehicles, it's hard to legislate. And I will give the chairman uh, some room here in the sense of it's hard, especially in COVID and the way we're doing it, but it can be done. Um, and it should be done. That's what the process is for. And you get better product when you follow the process. If you just want to do something partisan to make a statement, well, that's what brings us here today. That's what's before you today. And it's bad policy on top of it. This is correct. Well, to, uh, to be fair to our, uh, to our friends, um, we have there are parts of this bill we have seen. I've experienced HR3 is one of them. That's been an area that I've had very deep concerns about. Yep. I think it disincentivizes investment uh, and improvement in drugs. We've got studies and people dispute how many. There's some, somewhere between 15 and 100 drugs that uh, would never come to the market right. in a variety of different ways. So I just wanted to know for the record, do you share that concern, number one? And number two, I remember HR3 didn't get very far once it got outside this chamber. Any reason to believe that uh, it's going to get a different perception? No, I, I don't believe so. Look, there's there's uh, presidents wanted to do work in this space. President has, has done everything he can to help um, go, help consumers. If you think about the, the effort that he's done on surprise billing to move forward, the effort that the court just stood behind him on uh, yesterday, requiring hospitals to disclose their pricing so consumers are better informed of charges. Um, I mean, he has done everything he can in that respect. Uh, moving forward. But here's the, the tragedy of, of all of this. Um, even the Congressional Budget Office said they predicted 38 fewer cures. There are other, or, and that's just uh, related to Medicare Part D. The, uh, funding, it, it, it could be hundreds. And here we are in the middle of a COVID outbreak looking to our great innovators in America um, to, uh, to develop treatments and cures at, at warp speed, and the president's moved forward on that, and the Congress has been right there, too. Except that you go through all that in the trash bin of history and send the job somewhere else, and we lose access to, uh, to uh, innovative cures. That could be for pancreatic cancer. I'm meeting with those folks via phone today. Um, it, it has one of the highest death rates. Why would we risk that? Um, and, and further, the legislation could eliminate 80,000 high paid biotech and R&D jobs nationwide. That that was what California Life Sciences told us. 
Uh, well, you uh, touched on some of my concerns. Let me ask you another question. I'll also ask this uh, sort of a follow up to, to uh, Chairman Salone. Um, uh, one of my concerns, Section 116 of this legislation provides uh, health and human services with the authority to quote, take corrective action to any quote, uh, uh, excessive, unjustified, or unfairly discriminatory health insurance. Those are awfully broad terms. Any definition for those terms? Uh, in legislation, or we just left up to the administration to decide uh, what they mean? Well, it's a, it's a good question. You know, maybe if, if there had been, I don't believe we had hearings on, on that part of this bill. Um, those are exactly the kinds of points, <laughs> Mr. Cole, that we should be looking at in depth um, because you can be pretty reckless in this space and end up um, countering what you're trying to achieve. You know, the, President Obama promised Americans a $2,500 a year reduction in their their premiums, uh, their health insurance. And I can't find one yet that, that's really seen that, but they've seen their deductibles go up um, by thousands and thousands of dollars. And so not only are the premiums higher, but the deductibles are out of pocket costs are higher. And then they're getting stuck with surprise bills on top of that, that they have to pay completely out of pocket. And, and this Congress has done nothing uh, to move forward on the surprise billing issue, leaving consumers in the lurch. Uh, Chairman Paul, I ask you the same question. Are you comfortable with some of these terms? Again, are very sweeping. They're not very defined. Are you comfortable with the Trump administration effectively making up their own definitions in these areas? Uh, Mr. Cole, I didn't understand. Do you want to repeat your question? Yes, I will. That's, uh, that's certainly fair. Uh, let me go back to... Uh, uh, to, to, um, Section 116 legislation uh, gives uh, Health and Human Services the authority to, quote, take corrective actions against any, quote, excessive, unjustified, or unfairly discriminatory health insurance rates. And again, those terms aren't really defined very well. Are you comfortable with the Trump administration? That it, will, it will, this legislation will ever become law, which I think is unlikely, but actually follow congressional intent? Well, yeah, Mr. Cole, I, I don't see the, the president as the enemy on this issue. I mean, he has repeatedly from when he ran and repeatedly over the last few years since he's been in office said that he wants to lower prescription drug costs, that he wants to lower health care costs. He's actually said he supports negotiated prices for prescription drugs. I mean, my criticism is that he doesn't do more to try to convince uh, the Republican leadership, particularly in the Senate, to move in that direction, then it's just you know rhetoric and it's not followed up. But I, I don't have a problem giving um, the, uh, the the secretary the authority to try to reduce costs, if okay. that's what you're asking. Very good. Um, one more question to all of you. As I mentioned in my statement, I find it uh, pretty offensive that we're going to use the federal government to force the decided uh, not to uh, uh, engage in Medicaid expansion. Uh, by punishing them, by literally cutting reimbursement rates, putting burdensome requirements on them that other states don't have. Um, in full disclosure, I would tell you, I think Oklahoma probably eventually will. We have an election schedule on Medicaid expansion. But that's, you know, that should be our, our choice here. Um, so I'm just curious to each of you, do you find this troubling? Uh, should we allow states to determine, wasn't that the intention? Uh, certainly the Supreme Court, States to make the decision themselves, not for us to punish them if they don't do what we want them to do here in Washington, D.C. I'll go to you first, Chairman. Go to the well, I mean, it's, it's the whole thing is a carrot and stick approach, right? In other words, what do you do? You can incentivize by giving, giving a carrot, which is why we say if you expand, go back to the 100% rather than the 90% they would get now if they expanded. But on the other hand, you know, there's there's, uh, you, we're not mandating that you have to do it completely. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I frankly wouldn't have a problem mandating that, but you know, again, it's a carrot and stick. So the carrot, when they say mandate you to expand, what we do is we say, look, if you do expand, we'll give you the hundred percent as an incentive. On the other hand, if you don't, then there's going to be a, 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 a penalty. Uh, you know, you, it's just your approach. So this is the approach rather than just saying it's mandated and that's it. Well, you know, I find it frankly offensive that you would cut Medicaid uh, reimbursement rates uh, you know, to force what you think 
in a state that you can find. Uh, Mr. Walden, do you have a response to that? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Cole, and I do. First of all, back to your original point, the Title II portions of this bill, all the Medicaid portions, we have never had a hearing. We have never gotten into the detail. We don't know the implications of them because the Energy and Commerce Committee advocated its responsibility and put this in your pocket, your lap here at Rules Committee. So had we had hearings and a markup in subcommittee, a markup in full committee, we could have our other colleagues about the pros and cons of this. Let me suggest the carrot and stick approach is applied in the drug negotiation process too. If a company comes up with a new drug, um, they either agree to a set of prices the government sets or the stick is 95% of their revenues. Now that's a pretty big stick. That's why you're gonna lose tens of thousands of American jobs and you're gonna chase innovation probably over to China or somewhere because that capital is gonna leave here and we're not gonna get the benefit of those innovative new drugs. Um, and so for states, I, I, I'm more of a federalist in this matter, Mr. Cole, like you are, which is Oklahoma and Oregon ought to go down the paths they think are best. Because when you think about healthcare in America, it is very diverse and there are different needs in each of our states that our states are better, better able in a partnership with the federal government to work out. Oregon's been very inventive in many of these areas, I've supported the waivers to allow that innovation. Um, and now we're moving into a new direction, which is either do it the federal way or the Democrats will hit you with not just a stick. When you're taking away states Medicaid money, it's a club. This bill takes away state Medicaid money from states who don't do what the Democrats want them to do. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your back, my time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate I appreciated that exchange. I just I just would say to my Republican friends who I have great respect for, um, uh, you know, when they invoke process and um, and talk about the importance of markups and things like that. I again I you know um, it wasn't too long ago when um, they were in charge and I think five of your top ten bills in the last Congress uh, didn't get marked up uh, before they were brought to the floor. Um, and, um, and so I, I just point that out for the, for the record, because I think it's important. Um, and yeah, I appreciate the Republicans now, uh, believe we ought to protect people with pre-existing conditions, but before the ACA, they didn't, um, nothing, you, you were in charge, you, when you were in control, you did nothing. Uh, now, uh, you, uh, I think based on the fact that most Americans think people with pre-existing conditions ought to be protected, uh, you've introduced you know, various bills that quite frankly um, are, are deficient because, uh, you know, saying that we are gonna protect people with pre-existing conditions, but not impose other constraints on insurance companies um, and find ways to be able to make that a reality means that more and more costs will be passed on to consumers. So again, um, as we speak, and Mr. Pallone pointed this out, uh, the president of the United States uh, without a plan for an alternative is in court trying to take away people's health care protections. I mean, that is a fact. Um, and, you know, and I find that terribly offensive. Um, uh, I now yield to Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all, all of the witnesses. I have uh, the opportunity tomorrow um, uh, to manage the rules. And therefore, it won't be necessary for me to ask an awful lot of questions, but I appreciate all of our witnesses. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. And I yield to Mr. Woodall. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, begin thinking about the uh, process, uh, you're absolutely right that that uh, uh, Republicans doing it the wrong way uh, before is no excuse for Democrats doing it the wrong way now. And I hope that uh, when we take the majority back next Congress, we won't use the failings of the Democratic uh, majority as uh, excuses for our failings uh, in leadership uh, next year. Um, this is my gonna be my second uh, online markup that I've done. You know, we didn't have as much of a partnership in designing the rules of, of online markups as we uh, might have, have hoped. But if I could just ask a, a parliamentary inquiry, because we saw it in the Judiciary Committee, we saw it on the Transportation Committee on which I sit, 
um, if if uh, the rules committee could take some time uh, to talk about what the rules are for online uh, markups, if folks are making points of order that you cannot be seen on camera, uh, does that stop the hearing? Does that stop the markup or does it uh, continue? Are those left to a chairman's discretion or is that something that the House uh, enforces. Uh, uh, can you be on uh, under uh, 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 when when the chairman switches? Uh, do, can can I come and sit in the McGovern chair with McGovern's name under my uh, uh, under my uh, 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 mug as I as I leave the committee, or do I have to log you off and, and start back on? We've started to see those things pop up, and when I look at the gravity of the conversations we're having today, so many of the bills that haven't had a chance to get marked up. If we don't uh, provide some of that clarity, I fear that folks will be reluctant uh, to do more of these. And I, uh, irrespective of, of how we feel about the virtue of of, uh, of online hearings and markups, I know when the Rules Committee crafted the rules, it was to try to create more uh, flexibility and functionality here in the House. And I just put that on your uh, on your plate as as uh, now that we've had a week. Uh, to see how these are, are unfolding. Uh, perhaps there'll be an opportunity for the Rules Committee to provide additional guidance to, to some of the chairmen who've, who've seen these challenges. Yeah, well, let me just, if the gentleman yield to me? I'd be happy to yield to my friend. Yeah, uh, I appreciate the gentleman's comments. Um, uh, yeah, we, I, we're going to try to provide more clarity, um, you know, uh, and as you know, we're in a hearing right now, um, and I'm happy to kind of, uh, again, call it the ground rules once we get to, get to the markup. But look, I mean, um, I mean, we, we, we're going through this process of these virtual uh, committee hearings for a reason, and that is because we are told uh, by the attending physician that, um, you know, all of us bunched in a room together is not a wise idea. And some of us believe in science, and we believe that we should take the uh, advice of our medical experts, and, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, it is certainly my, it was my hope that uh, all the, um, protections for minority rights um, would be ensured as we, in a hearing and in a, in a markup. And so before we get to the markup of the various bills here, um, I will, we will try to address all of your questions. And, um, you know, and again, um, to try to be as accommodating as possible. Uh, this is not the way I hope Congress will continue to operate uh, forever. I hope uh, we can get to a, an end to this uh, soon i think we'll get close sooner we'll get to an end to it if everybody wears their masks and listens to the doctors and um and if you have any pull with the man in the white house i would hope that you would pass that advice on but in any event i will address your questions before we get to the markup but i thank the gentleman for uh for his um for yielding well and i'm i'm, I'm happy to yield mr chairman i didn't mean that to sound like a, a criticism i wanted to sound like a, a constructive uh, counsel I, I know the 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 pure motivation that the that the chairman had in, in crafting this process. And sincerely, uh, as folks uh, have gotten frustrated with the process, again, I've seen that in the committees that I've worked on, I fear that we'll have less of the productivity the chairman uh, desires as opposed to more if we don't provide some of that clarity. I appreciate that. And the chairman, you have one with him. Maybe, maybe the rules committee can be the example for all the other committees. So let's let's make sure we get this all right and, um, and, we'll, and we can go from there. But I thank the gentleman. The, I, I do want to uh, uh, rely on my friend from Oregon's uh, uh, vast uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, I used to sit in this uh, staffer's chair right behind me, uh, Mr. Walden, uh, back uh, uh, many, uh, many years ago. And I remember during that time, uh, a young man from the great state of Georgia, Newt Gingrich, who led the United States House of Representatives. Uh, Bill Clinton was in the White House at the time. Turns out if you really want to do lasting things in this country, bipartisan partnership is the way to, to make that happen. Republicans have failed to live up to that uh, from time to time. Democrats have certainly failed to live up uh, to that uh, in, uh, in, in recent, uh, uh, in recent uh, memory. But my recollection is that uh, when Newt Gingrich led this institution and Bill Clinton was in the White House, we came together uh, for all the plans that the federal government had dominion over. Of course, there are lots of health care plans the federal government has never had dominion over, but for all the plans the federal government had dominion over, and we abolished pre-existing conditions. We said for everybody who's playing by the rules, everybody who's in these ERISA plans and playing by the rules, not trying to game the system, that you never have to worry about pre-existing uh, conditions again if you're in one of those ERISA uh, plans. I, I ask you because Chairman McGovern suggested that that uh, Republicans have had a change of heart on pre-existing conditions. 
do you recall that existing condition solution from back uh, back I, in I do. I, I won't pretend to be an expert on it. Um, I do know that was an existing underlying law as a, re as a result of a bipartisan effort. I know when I was in the Oregon legislature, I fought to deal with this pre-existing condition issue there by creating high risk pools. Um, so that people with pre-existing conditions could get access to affordable and subsidized health insurance. Um, we did nothing to undercut uh, that guarantee, despite the political rhetoric of the left um, in the legislation we moved last Congress. Um, and I realized we had opponents to that legislation, um, but we always guaranteed access uh, to uh, to coverage, irrespective of a pre-existing condition. And I would just say that I chaired the longest markup in the history of the Congress, according to the parliamentarian, when we wrote that bill. We gutted it out day and night. Everybody had their chance. Um, it's unfortunate we weren't given a, a chance on this legislation to have a markup or a hearing on the bill at all in the Energy and Commerce Committee. The, the final thing I, I would say on this point is I, I would say that Chairman Pallone and I have worked well together in this virtual environment to get it right for our, our members on the committee. And I think we continue to have a very good relationship in that respect um, from an Energy and Commerce Committee standpoint. Um, we've been working our way through this stuff, but more clarity from the Rules Committee would be helpful about access to rooms. And when we do have these glitches that we're all trying to figure out how to work through, because I think members of both sides that I want to get this right so that no voice is denied and unheard in a markup or frankly in a hearing. And, you know, we run into people not taking their mute off, <laughs> you know, or they get dropped. And, uh, and we, we really do need clear guidance and i think all of us together respect the party want the system to work so i appreciate your your inquiry the chairman on that yeah. i saw my colleague uh, dr burgess nodding uh, uh, aggressively when you were talking about that uh, record-breaking uh, long markup in uh, in the energy and commerce uh, uh, that has often been the concern is that uh, i i may lose but i want my voice to be heard that's right and, and that can be a problem in a, in a regular environment it can certainly be a problem in a, in a digital environment uh, you mentioned federalism when, in your conversation with uh, Mr. Cole. I actually think that's where the evolution of Republican thinking has happened. Back in, in uh, uh, 1996 with, uh, with the HIPAA bill, we agreed pre-existing conditions uh, shouldn't be a problem for American families, right. but we only solved it for plans that the federal government had dominion over. Right. What the Affordable Care Act did was say, we're going to do it for plans that the federal government doesn't have dominion over. We're going to take control over all of these, these state-based uh, plans. I do believe that the Republican thinking has evolved around that because, as you suggested, all of the proposals that I have seen uh, that you have worked on in a bipartisan way continue to right. regulate in what has traditionally been a state-based uh, regulatory environment and has continued to guarantee pre-existing condition uh, coverage. Am I understanding that correctly? That is correct. That is correct. And, and I would further say that uh, we supported efforts to lift the lifetime caps on insurance company coverage. Uh, there were lots of things that were bipartisan agreements, um, even when the ACA was being debated, that, that a majority of Republicans, majority of Democrats could have rallied around. But in that process, we were fully excluded as well. And as you know, um, that bill came through this committee. Republicans were denied any amendment. We were allowed no amendments on Obamacare uh, through the House. We had all kinds of ideas. And I'll tell you, there's, there are a few things more frustrating than having 66 different ideas for improvement of Obamacare and being told you can't have a single one of them debated on the House floor. Sorry, go away. Uh, and, and that's what happened. I don't remember exactly 66 amendments, but as, as memory serves me the best possible, uh, I think it was. But I do know Republicans were given no opportunity to offer amendments on the House floor to improve Obamacare uh, at the time it was considered, because the Senate had already crammed it through and they weren't going to allow any changes in the house well we're about to see that same thing unfold with the policing bill this afternoon as mr cole That's right. mentioned there are opportunities to do a, a wonderful things in a bipartisan way much right. things in a bipartisan way and in fact we're going to jam out the partisan bill through instead um i, I want to i know uh, the supreme court and the, and the president's uh, position has been, been mentioned I've, I've read the articles uh, uh, with great interest to where his advisors have said this is a very difficult time for healthcare in America. Maybe this isn't the time to try to defend the Constitution. And the president has said, uh, no, I want to go ahead. Um, I'm not fighting this bill because I'm opposed to health care. I'm, fight I'm fighting this bill because I support the Constitution. I believe the bill is constitutionally flawed. 
Um, uh, is there anything that you have seen coming out of, of the White House uh, or out of your committee that would suggest uh, that when the Supreme Court uh, agrees, as we have often argued, that this bill was constitutionally flawed, constitutionally flawed because it was jammed through in a, in a partisan way instead of uh, being able to use the full process in a bipartisan way, uh, if the uh, Supreme Court were to strike this uh, uh, bill down, is there any set of circumstances uh, where you would not be a partner with Mr. Pallone to, to coming back and, and reinstituting uh, those much needed protections that we all agree on uh, the very next Absolutely. Day? No, I, I can't think of a, a, a situation. I mean, we need to always protect people with pre existing conditions. We've had family members with pre existing conditions um, in, in very serious situations. Um, I, I believe fully in providing that protection. And we should not go back to the days of the abuses. We all agreed, Republicans and Democrats, existed under prior law. We were all for making many of those changes. Um, and I, I don't think there's ever a day you don't defend the Constitution. I really don't. I mean, and it's hard when the issues are as big as these are. Um, you know, we've done a lot, as I said, in Oregon on Medicaid expansion. Um, Oregon adopted that. I actually chaired the committee that rewrote the Oregon Health Plan long before Obamacare to provide expanded access to coverage, to create high risk insurance pools. Uh, this was in their infancy um, when, uh, when we did that so that people with their existing conditions could have to. I remember going to a convenience store in my hometown and the clerk saying, I have diabetes and I can't get access to health insurance. I said, that's outrageous and wrong. And I mean, so we created systems. They might, might not have been perfect, but they were in their infancy in this debate. Um, and they were approved upon later. Uh, but so it, it is something we shouldn't fight over. This is something we should agree on. And, and then there, but I get back to, you can have a system in place, but if you can't afford to access that system, you know, it, it, that, that denies access to health care. When you look at some of the deductibles that are out there now in co-payments, there are 3,000 bucks or 6,000 bucks for a family. And your colonoscopy is almost that much, and you're paying a thousand bucks a month for your insurance. Is that really affordable? How many people do, do not delay getting access to care? We have to go after the costs in this system that Americans are bearing. And that's what the president's been doing. I am glad he pushed forward on getting disclosure of prices at hospitals. Now, that may not be the perfect way to do it, but I'll tell you what, we will try how many blocks to get cheaper gasoline. It's all on display. You tell me, I think you used an example of, I believe, when you had your snowboarding accident or whatever, trying to get an MRI in this now and, and figuring out all the different prices. It's almost impossible to do. We need price disclosure. We need to end price billing. We need to, to bring down the out-of-pocket costs of seniors and Medicare. Why aren't we working on these things where we have common agreement? And we, we can fight over these other things, that's fine, but Americans expect us to get our work done. And those issues, just on the face, we should be dealing with, as well as funding our community health centers. Uh, the, the, the program that allows a Medicaid patient to have the money follow that patient is especially important to renew right now, and it's about to expire. That means that your, your mother or father in the nursing home can be moved out of that situation into a less COVID exposed situation and the money would follow that mother or father in Medicaid. That's going to run out. And there's no plan to extend it right now. Why aren't we fixing that? The, I believe the, it was the PACE program with uh, Bob Dole that, uh, uh, as I recall, started the money following the, uh, the, the, the patient. Uh, uh, Chairman McGovern, I, I hope that everybody was was listening uh, intently to to Mr. Walden. He's passed many a bill in this Congress that I have opposed, uh, but he's passed it because he's worked in a bipartisan uh, way, and he's uh, he's done it uh, uh, by by uh, uh, by responding to needs that the American people uh, have. Uh, a lot of folks out there are scared. Uh, they're scared uh, uh, because of the situation we're in uh, already. They're scared because of of uh, what I would call irresponsible comments about the the uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, cases that are moving forward. They're scared because of irresponsible uh, campaign advertisements uh, uh, that are on the uh, on the television. Uh, what you heard from from Mr. Walden are the are the words of a serious legislator uh, who has a very serious track record of solving very serious uh, problems. And I, I hope that uh, folks who do have those concerns uh, will uh, will be comforted uh, by by uh, that. Uh, I, I believe that uh, 
his motivations characterize more of us in Congress than the American people uh, uh, generally uh, uh, understand and and uh, his leadership and your leadership, uh, Mr. Pallone, and yours, uh, Mr. McGovern. I'm I'm grateful for. I yield back. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me let me just uh, let's see. I am you. Yeah, uh, me. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, uh, and let me. I just want to say for the record, um, you know, I if if anybody thinks that uh, uh, President Trump's opposition to the Affordable Care Act uh, is based on his deep concern for the Constitution. Uh, I have news for you. Uh, that's, not, that's not what motivates him. Uh, you read his Twitter account, uh, you listen to his speeches. Um, his obsession with everything Obama related uh, is uh, to the point uh, of it's an unhealthy obsession. Uh, anything that has that anything that passed under the Obama administration, anything with his name on it, um, he's determined to try to undermine, and he's been born in the courts not only on this, but on everything else. Um, and yet people are scared. People are scared they're going to lose their health care. People are scared they're going to lose the pre people with pre-existing conditions are afraid they may lose those protections. Uh, people are scared when they hear the president get up and, uh, and basically uh, 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 urge people not to wear masks. Uh, I mean, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, where over 120,000 of our fellow Americans are dead. Um, they're scared when they look at the graphs of the numbers in this country going uh, skyrocketing, while in other countries uh, they are going down. So there's a lot to be to be concerned about here. But I don't I don't believe that this president's concern is the Constitution. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, happy to yield to the gentleman. I, I thank the, the gentleman for yielding. Just to to because the the media doesn't always tell the whole story. Just as a reminder, this case is titled Texas versus the United States. Uh, this is not. A President Trump-led uh, uh, campaign, and that's no wonder that folks it, believe that because of the stories that are told. This is led by state governors across the uh, the country, and I, I appreciate the gentleman yielding. And, and, and if anybody believes that the president is not uh, somehow behind in supporting this case uh, fully, then I, I've got a, a bridge to sell you in New York uh, for ten dollars. I mean, this is—I mean, please. I mean, I now yield to the general lady from California, Ms. Torres. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thanks um, everyone for the opportunity to participate. Although I am in Washington, D.C., having the opportunity to participate um, through video conferencing so that I am not exposed um, to it, you know, uh, to the germs that all of us carry from having to come together across the nation. Um, indeed, um, the lawsuit, let's, let's just call it for what it is. It's not just governors, it's Republican governors um, trying to undo everything, all of the protections that President Obama and the Democrats um, try to bring about as it relates to health care, affordable health care for all Americans. This pandemic has been hard hit. It's hit every single person, 120,000 plus Americans are dead, are dead. Did I say they are dead? They have died because of this pandemic. Yet you sit there and try to hide the truth from the American people that you guys refuse to wear masks on most days and that, um, the fact that the president himself has said that he has tried to slow down, slow down testing so that we know who may be infected to try to protect the rest of our families, our neighbors, the workers, you know, the people that are actually helping to serve our food. So I'm looking forward to having this conversation on the floor, moving this bill forward. American people know who's on the right side of history here. Um, everyone knows how many times you've tried to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act when, when you were in charge. And I'm sorry, no, you're not gonna be back in charge because Americans, American voters have already stated that they don't trust you. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, and I yield to the uh, gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess.
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Walden, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Walden, I need to ask you a question just based on what we last heard. Um, we had a hearing yesterday in the Energy and Commerce Committee. We had all of the principals, the people who recognize as the foremost authorities on public health in this country. And I think, I think it was you that asked the question right down the line. Have you been asked or told that the goal is to reduce testing? Do I recall that correctly from yesterday? Uh, yes, you do. Um, and every single panelist said no. They had not been directed to uh, reduce testing. And in fact, um, the president's team that sat there before us said they're increasing testing and that is their plan going forward. And, and could I just say regarding face masks, Mr. Mr. Uh, Bur Dr. Burgess, um, at our Energy and Commerce Committee hearings, I think nearly every Republican member has been wearing masks. Um, my wife actually made this mask and made one for every one of our family members. And we have been wearing them. And, and so uh, I, I'm sure my, my friend that spoke recently um, um, wasn't referring to any of us in, in this room about not wearing masks because we've been pretty diligent about it and will continue to be because it's the right thing to do. Correct. Uh, when I'm on camera and socially distanced, I generally do not wear a mask. If I'm in a situation where I cannot socially distance, I, I do put a mask on. Um, let me ask you this too, because in the Energy and Commerce Committee, let me just say, I feel so fortunate to be able to serve on the Committee on Energy and Commerce. It's been my high honor to be on that committee since 2005. I've seen a lot of things come and go across our jurisdictional plate during that time. We deal with big issues. Those things that are dealt with where there is really broad support from both sides of the dais and energy and commerce does tend to be one of those committees that is that is more broadly bipartisan that's right but when we have buy-in from both sides of the political spectrum those big bills tend to be more enduring than if it is narrowly crafted to only appeal to one side of the dais that might happen to be in the majority that day and and i think back to things like cures for the 21st century, and we will probably have an opportunity to revisit uh, Cures 2.0 at some point in the future. I hope we can maintain the, the bipartisan nature that we did in the, in the first Cures bill. The Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act, the bill that, that did away with the sustainable growth rate formula. 13 years in the, in the making since I, since I arrived here was a bipartisan bill. Okay, here's the newsflash. I knew that getting rid of the sustainable growth rate formula was important, but I also knew we weren't going to get every single part of what happened next absolutely perfect at the first pass. And as a consequence, we did need a broad bipartisan consortium of members, House and Senate, Republican and Democrat, to monitor the implementation of this very complicated structure as it goes through the agency process and and that's key if you don't have that as as you go through the agency process it can it can become very very different from what you intended to at uh, when you passed it out of committee correct and i know you've had experience with that as well yeah no and i i think back to the work we did in a bipartisan way on the opioids epidemic striking america uh, both the uh, investigative work that our oversight investigation teams did on both sides of the aisle to track down bad actors and hold them accountable. Uh, but moreover, the work we did to pass, I think it was upwards of 60 pieces of legislation into one bill. We had a member day. We invited everybody to come testify. Um, we took their ideas. Every single bill that became part of that package had a Republican and Democrat co-sponsor. And guess what? That's now law. Now, we should be going back and saying what worked and what didn't work. We should do that on all of these programs. It's why I'm, I led the effort to fully fund CHIP uh, for 10 years, the Children's Health Insurance Program, which I think started under Republicans. It was a Republican Federalist idea, state federal partnership of insurance for children. 
Um, that's the longest there had ever been expanded was 10 years. And frankly, the Democrats voted against various iterations, at, I think four and six and whatever. And finally, in a big package, they, they joined us voting for it. Now, they probably had other reasons they voted no, because they can't imagine they're against children's health insurance, but, but they voted no. And now they're going to make it permanent, which means you basically, once you make a federal program permanent, I think Ronald Reagan said that, that, that only a temporary, only a federal government, a temporary program is, is, is permanent. Well, this one they make permanent, then you lose your ability to really do the serious oversight author, reauthorization work. And, and that's, not, that's not necessary. But meanwhile, our community health centers are saying, what happens to us in a matter of a few months? You know, hard, they told me when we were reauthorizing, we did at record levels. Um, all the problems they were having hiring, not knowing whether they'd have funding. I mean, it was a national news story. Now, the, the national news has moved on to other topics, um, apparently, when it comes to our community health centers, because there hadn't been a story about them not getting fully funded for more than a few months at a time for a long time. Um, but we should be dealing with that here. Yeah, having run a medical practice for 25 years, I can just tell you that you do need to be able to plan long term because the contracts you are offering to people, to doctors, to nurses, to vendors, all are going to be longer than a couple of months in duration. And the fact that we have restricted our community health centers by not providing them the stability of long-term funding, teaching health centers, we've not provided them the stability of be able to enter into long-term term contracts with young physicians who are just starting their training. This is a serious flaw and you know just points that there's a lot of good work this committee, Energy Commerce Committee rather, could be doing. Uh, it's languishing and, and it's not getting done. We're going to pass a very partisan health care bill and it goes nowhere during this Congress, but there's some very important things some pieces we could put in motion absolutely that we, that we haven't done are there any others that we're overlooking well well i think when it comes to seniors we worked a lot on trying to put an out-of-pocket cap in place for seniors uh medicare we were in great you you were negotiating that you and your team as the as our top republican on the health subcommittee i mean here we have a physician who knows more about medicine than probably anybody in the congress as well as running a practice so you know the practice of medicine and we had a bipartisan effort underway until i guess the speaker's office interceded and put an end to it so now seniors are left there with no cap on out-of-pocket costs because it became a partisan issue that's never going anywhere in the senate why can't we part the partisan swords put them back in their sheaths and 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 get together and use the process that the uh, our, our founders gave us to work things out between parties and, and get good legislation into law. The president's proven he will sign the bills that, that we send him on almost every occasion. Um, but he can't sign something he doesn't get. And, and a partisan drug pricing bill that everybody knew was partisan. We had a lot of things we could agree on to hold down the cost of drugs, stop the bad behaviors. And HR 19, again, our bill uh, on, on the Republican side, but every single provision in HR 19 had a Republican and Democrat supporter. It, they were all they were all bipartisan, and seven of them, as I recall, seven of them have now become law because they have put in other bills. Uh, my goal is put together packages that work, packages that help the American consumer, put the consumer first, get the bill on the president's desk signed into law, and we ought to be just chewing our way through these problems Americans face to bring down the cost of drugs, bring down the cost of healthcare. Let's let's allow consumers to know what something costs so they can shop around for their health care like like we do for gasoline or a grocery store. You think about all the other price disclosure. Why is it health care? You get a price disclosure. I, <laughs> there's a variety of reasons. It's a, it's a broad question. I, I did attend the it's odd. We have a signing ceremony for an executive order, but I went down to the White House when the president signed his transparency order. Yep. It's uh, it, In fact, if people have not read that executive order, it's very thorough. It's very well written. It's very well thought out. And I, I do encourage people to look at it. I knew that the court challenges were not far behind because that's the way we do things in this town. But the president prevailed. And I'd say that's a victory for American patients and the American people to finally be able to understand the cost obligation that they're undertaking when they when they have a medical 
procedure or or enter into a, a, a have a a, 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 a a diagnosis made by a by a doctor or a clinic it's it's phenomenal that it's taken this long to get something that simple basically the starbucks principle everything's on the on the menu board right and you know what it costs <laughs> And then you have competition, and hopefully that that benefits consumers with innovation and competition. And and we don't have that in this sector. And I hear it all the time from constituents. You know, they don't understand why something costs what it does, and they don't find out until a month or two later when they get a bill. And then it turns out they get a surprise bill in some cases because they what they thought was covered, it turned out somebody that was in the plan didn't show up that day, and somebody else did. Then they get stuck with the bill. These are issues Americans pleading with this Congress to deal with. They're not asking for partisan bills that aren't gonna go anywhere other than a TV ad and a campaign. They're kind of sick and tired of that. They want legislation that's actually gonna solve problems and put good public policy into law. And we can do that together. We've proven that uh, time and again, where we have been able to work together, where bills aren't just brought up here to the Rules Committee and, and you know, in a partisan way jam through, which is what you've got with this one. Um, and, and and as a result, consumers get stuck again with higher costs, higher bills, and uh, it's it's really really tragic. It it doesn't have to be this way. And and it's worse than tragic, as as we saw with the markup for HR three in in, in our committee. That's the Speaker Pelosi's yeah. prescription drug confiscation bill, and the absolute abolishment of any innovation because of the punitive nature of that bill, the confiscatory nature of that bill. So that was last October, just a few months ago. And then right after the first of the year, we're faced with this global plague. And we are asking our pharmaceutical innovators to innovate, please innovate. Can you do it a little faster to deliver us medical countermeasures, vaccines and cures for this plague? And literally that bill, HR3, would have removed any possibility for innovation in this country. Even the Congressional Budget Office acknowledged that eight new products would not be delivered over the 10 year continuum. They couldn't tell us what those eight products were, but if one of them was remdesivir, we'd be in tall grass right now. That's right. Well, and, and I would just point out, <clears throat> the authorities the administration is using very aggressively to bring new medicines to market safely, but to cut the bureaucracy out in the middle, our authorities, Congress granted in a bipartisan way, when I chaired the Energy and Commerce Committee and we rewrote Padufa, Madufa, Gadufa, all the UFAs, which are the user fee agreements for pharmaceutical drugs, for medical devices, for generic drugs, actually even for animal drugs. We rewrote all that body of law. I think nearly every one of them ended up passing unanimously. That's more than bipartisan, mm -hmm. because we have an independent now, unanimously into law. And it's a result of those and other authorities under, under the 21st century cures that Diana get. my friend and colleague, Democrat from Colorado, and Fred Upton, friend and colleague and Republican from Michigan did, that opened the door to this innovation at NIH, that combined, we do our best work when we work together to solve a problem. And that's why it's so disappointing to be here today, not before you all, because you're all wonderful people, but to be here with a bill that 70%, according to Mr. Cole, has never had a hearing or a markup in the committees of jurisdiction, and it's just dumped in your lap up here in the Rules Committee, and it's never going to become law. This is not what Americans want, but it's what you can do when you're in the majority, because when you're in the majority, you can make sure things are bipartisan, or you can do what has been chosen to be done here and just cram something to, through because you have the votes and they have the votes and they're moving it through and it's unfortunate. It doesn't have to be that way. No, it doesn't. And I, I, I really don't want to be a, a political during a, a rules uh, <laughs> hearing because we're never political up here in this committee room. But I, you, what you have just outlined is exactly right. You can do things in the majority because you're in the majority, whether or not they're particularly useful for people is certainly just not even necessary to consider. And this bill will pass this House of Representatives, go no further, but it is a marker for the agenda 
Should there be more power that's devolved to the other side? We just heard another member on the Democratic side chastise Republicans about what they did when they were in power. I guarantee you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. America, this is what you are going to see uh, should the all the reins of power uh, be devolved over to the uh, to the other side of the dais. And further, I think you will see a restructuring of the filibuster rules in the Senate. So things that in the past might have been difficult to impossible to get across the finish line now will be immediately available. And people do need to pay attention to that because this is our country. It's it's all of us. It, every one of us participates in this. And if we don't, if we take our eye off this particular ball, it is going to be to our detriment. This is the last thing that I'll close with. We, we got to get out of this pandemic. We all know that. American innovation is going to lead the way out of this pandemic. We're not going to depend on anyone else in the world to get us out of this problem, but we will lead the way. And certainly work that's done in the Committee on Energy and Commerce that sets the stage for that. And uh, I'm just proud to be part of the effort, regardless of who's in, in, in the in the in the chair when it's Mr. Pallone, so be it. I'll just try to make everything I can better as it goes through the process, but we got to have a chance. It's got to go through the process. This did not, and that's why it's flawed. That's why it needs to be defeated. I'll yield back. Thank you. Um, and um, I, I didn't know it was possible possible to make the Senate any worse than it is now. Um, we, we, have, we have passed uh, in this House uh, uh, and in some any instances in a bipartisan way, well over 250, close maybe to 300 bills that have been sent over to the Senate. Um, and the Senate Majority Leader, Mr. McConnell, has done nothing. Um, I don't know what it's gonna take to to get him to act on anything, um, but uh, quite frankly, it's a disgrace. And it's something that we all should be ashamed of, those of us who care about these institutions. Um, I'm now happy to yield uh, to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, um, and uh, welcome to our witnesses today. Uh, I'm in very strong favor of H.R. 1425. We know that ever since he took office, President Trump and his allies in Congress have been doing everything they can to destroy and demolish and repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and at the same time, they've engaged in this ideological campaign, which continues to this very day in federal courts, as you say, Mr. Chairman, millions of Americans are struggling to afford prescription drugs that they need to survive, to remain healthy. So H.R. 1425 will counter the Trump administration's unceasing efforts to undermine and destroy the Affordable Care Act by taking important steps to expand coverage and lower healthcare costs while delivering relief to Americans who are struggling to pay for the skyrocketing cost of prescription drugs. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> before the GOP tried to repeal, sabotage, undermine, and destroy the Affordable Care Act, they tried to block it, and they tried to keep it from ever becoming law. And in their desperate struggle to keep President Obama and the Democratic Congress from obtaining health insurance and health coverage for tens of millions of uncovered Americans, they got uh, increasingly frantic and desperate in their rhetoric. And they began to say that the Affordable Care Act would create death panels for America. They said there would be death panels all over America. You could not turn on the TV or the radio or the internet without hearing some Republican House member or senator on a high horse with the full reservoir of uh, ideological contempt and self-righteousness that we see today denouncing a government plan to impose death panels on the American people. Well, let's see. Several years later, the President of the United States presides over the deaths of more than 120,000 of our countrymen and countrywomen. 120,000 people. The sickening of 2.3 million Americans under this epidemic, the throwing of 40 million Americans out of work, and our economy brought to its knees. Now, what would they be saying if Barack Obama were president? Well, we don't really have to guess because Barack Obama was 
president when there was a pandemic, the Ebola pandemic. And we tragically lost two Americans. We lost two Americans. And there were Republicans calling for his resignation and denouncing the incompetence of the president. Then they knew how to assign responsibility to a president of the United States for addressing a pandemic that comes to these shores. They knew how to blame a president in those days. Now they'll blame Andrew Cuomo, they'll blame the World Health Organization, they'll blame President Trump's friends in the Chinese government and the Central Communist Party. They said we're doing a great job, a very good job, a good job, and they were making the greatest deal of all time with him through January, February, March, April. He was praising the Chinese yeah. government, but they get a memo from their political phone saying, this is serious business, guys. We got to find some somebody to blame. We got to find a scapegoat. Not anybody in the U.S. government, not the president of the United States, the most powerful person in the world. Let's, bray, let's blame some people in China for it instead. And so here we are. The Democrats control one half of one third of the federal government of the United States, the House of Representatives. We are doing whatever we can to get health care to our people. We are the party that brought the Affordable Care Act to the people and gave health insurance to tens of millions of Americans, and they called it death panels. And now they have a president of the United States who refuses to try to create even a plan for testing Americans. He joked at his rally over the weekend, although he said it was no joke. He said, I don't kid. He said he tried to get his own administration to lower the amount of testing. He does. He wants less testing. It's the only thing we've got. We don't have a cure. We don't have a treatment. Uh, we don't have a vaccine. All we've got is testing. That's how all these nations around the world are dramatically lowering the incidence rate. And guess what? America is number one again. In what? We're number one in case counts. We're number one in death counts. We are leading the world with the lethal chaos and incompetence of this administration at the helm. We are leading the world in the coronavirus epidemic. And our colleagues have the gall and the temerity to lecture us. Unbelievable. They should be hiding under their desks that they defend this president, having brought our country to its knees in this crisis, while he has his silly, ill attended rallies around the country, just spreading more of the virus as they don't wear their masks. And if we can't meet in person, if some of our colleagues because of their health condition can't meet in person, because we have to wear masks, that's what we have to do to try to get through this crisis presided over by this president. So we absolutely have to pass HR 1425 and we have to continue to do whatever we can do to lift our nation out of this dungeon, this hell that the administration has brought us into with its lethal mismanagement and chaotic misleadership of the country. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I know I'm happy to yield to Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Walden, thank you for being here. And I really don't have any questions for you. I've heard quite a bit and I agree with your concerns and I think you did a very good job of explaining uh, your concerns and Republican concerns about the bill. I do wanna make a statement to my Democratic colleagues, not all of you, of course, but stop with the righteousness on the masks. I'm absolutely sick of it. Um, I hear this now. I think, Mr. Chairman, you said some of us believe in science as if implying that some of us don't believe in science. Um, I hear you, you know, another one of your members going on and on about how we don't want to wear masks. For goodness sakes, we are like sitting maybe 10, 12 feet apart from each other. Everyone in here that is within six feet of us, or actually everyone is wearing masks, even though we're not even within six feet of us. I tested negative on Saturday, negative yesterday morning because I was with the president. So don't be telling me how I'm unsafe and I'm doing things that are gonna affect people. I'm in judiciary committee too. And Mr. Nadler had the gall to say he wasn't gonna call on anybody in a hearing 
if they didn't put on a mask. And when it was asked what rule was voted on that said you won't call on someone if you don't wear a mask, he, we did, never voted on a rule like that. So stop with the freaking righteousness. I'm sick of it. And that I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, just for the record, uh, my uh, urging for people to wear masks um, is to try to counter what the president is saying, because I'm worried that a lot of people think that it is not important. Um, it's not about being righteous. It's it's about uh, I, I wear a mask to protect you uh, and you wear a mask to protect me. This is not a political statement. Um, it shouldn't become a political statement. Um, I appreciated the comments of Mr. Walden um, uh, when he talked about uh, the mask that he wears, but uh, this is serious. 120,000 people dead uh, in this country. Um, millions have been infected. Uh, the, the the curve is going up. It, 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 the line is going up. It's not going down. So this is not about you know. This is not about politics. It's not about righteousness. It's about uh, doing uh, what's right. Um, and uh, and, and it is about, yes. I, Mr. Uh, Chair, can I, yeah, can I yeah, sure, have a yeah. second? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, this is just a pattern and it's just, you have to understand, it's just getting totally ridiculous and sickening. Um, you know, I, I, maybe you did. Maybe some of you that are like calling out Republicans for not wearing masks, said this publicly to protesters, rioters, looters, the people that are tearing down statues in our nation, that are on megaphones that don't have masks on. I, I hope you have, well, I wish that you would say that to those people too, because seriously, this is, this is really getting old. I think we're adults, we're responsible people. Uh, and, you know, if I was so irresponsible, I don't think I would have tested negative twice. I go around to stores, I wear masks. So stop, please stop with this saying that some of us believe in science as if some of us don't. I, you know, it's just not needed. Well, it's not needed to try to get along together. Thank you very much. And I yield back. Well, I appreciate that. And let me just say for the record, uh, as somebody who actually uh, participated in some of the uh, protests and marches uh, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, along with others who were outraged by that killing, um, I wore a mask. Uh, I think everybody around me who, who marched wore a mask. By the way, they weren't looters. Uh, they, were, they were patriotic Americans who were just sick and tired of, of racism. Uh, in this country at every every level, the systemic racism that still exists. Uh, and um, and look, there is such a thing as science. And when we hear people like Dr. Fauci and others talk about the importance of wearing masks, we should. And so it is a little bit concerning to some of us when the president hold, holds indoor rallies and says that it's optional, optional. Yes, we're, we're all adults. People can make their own decision, but you're not wearing a mask and I'm not saying you personally, but people who decide not to wear a mask uh, are essentially putting the lives of others uh, in danger. And I just think that that's wrong. Uh, at this point, I yield to the general lady from Florida, Ms. Shalala. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me get back to the bill, H.R. 1425. When the House started working on this bill last year, and at the beginning of this year, it was most certainly overdue. The Affordable Care Act and the American people need our help. And now more than ever, after failing to repeal the ACA, the president then tried to weaken and sabotage it in any way he could. This was before there was a worldwide health pandemic. But even the COVID-19 pandemic, which caused the deaths of of more than 120,000 Americans and the loss of livelihood and often health insurance for another 40 million Americans. It hasn't slowed down this administration to destroy the Affordable Care Act. Because the administration is supporting a lawsuit to completely repeal the Affordable Care Act, if they're successful, more than 2 million Americans who've tested positive for COVID-19 could be prohibited from buying health insurance 
because they have a pre-existing condition and all of the people who lost their employer provided health insurance would have little to or no place to get affordable comprehensive health insurance my district and this is personal for me has the highest enrollment in the marketplace with more than 100,000 people getting health insurance from the ACA. The people of my district who likely had never had health insurance before the Affordable Care Act was became law, they understand there, that there are still things to be improved in the ACA. And now is the time to do that. This bill will take critical steps to expand coverage and to lower costs and will also help to reduce drug prices. And let me talk a little about um, drug prices. I, I also need to say that I come from a state, even though I have this huge enrollment in the Affordable Care Act, I come from a, to a state that has not expanded Medicaid, which meant we've left more than 800,000 working people, or they were working before, um, and 123,000 people in my county who fall in that Medicaid gap uh, without health care, without access to health care. Now, 1425 uh, establishes the Fair Drug Pricing Program, which we've debated before. It is precisely what the president said he wanted. He said during the campaign, I believe that we should negotiate like crazy directly with the drug companies. This does that. When I was secretary, I would have loved to have had this uh, law in place. I would have loved to have saved Medicare $448 billion. Um, that was included in, in HR3. Um, other critical provisions of the bill, including expanding eligibility for tax credits beyond 400% of the federal poverty level and increasing tax rates for individual and, and families so everyone could get affordable um, health coverage. Look, we've just got to cover more Americans. The one thing COVID-19 has told us is the gaps in our insurance system, the real gaps in our insurance system. And as much as I'm committed to community health centers, they cannot close those gaps. So I strongly support this bill and urge my colleagues uh, to support the rule. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. And I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, have no questions. I have a few comments to make. I'm really pleased to uh, support the Patient Protection Affordable Care Enhancement Act, which will take important steps to expand coverage while lowering health care and prescription drug costs for American families. This is really very important. We worked on the Affordable Care Act years and years ago. It was working. And to have this undermining is absolutely ridiculous. This legislation will reverse the Trump administration's concerted efforts to erode Americans' access to quality affordable care by expanding eligibility for premium assistance, incentivizing states to expand Medicaid, and permanently authorizing funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program. Critically, this legislation will lower drug costs now by establishing a fair price negotiation program which will for the very first time require the secretary to negotiate Medicare drug prices. This legislation is a collective achievement of House Democrats from across the country who are working to reverse the GOP's healthcare sabotage by updating and improving the ACA. I'm proud to support many of the bills in this package, like the Fair Index Housing Act legislation I co-lead to reduce out-of-pocket healthcare costs by reversing a Trump administration rule that makes fewer Americans eligible for health care premium tax credits. As the pandemic continues, and as it is, the challenges are collective public health and well-being. American families need relief from soaring health care costs. I urge my colleagues to support this comprehensive legislation and the critical solutions it includes to protect patients, expand access, and lower costs. With that, I yield back. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Matsui. Um, does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question? Seeing none, I would like to thank our witnesses for their testimony. Uh, appreciate uh, you being here and uh, being so responsive. It's always a pleasure. Uh, you are now excused.
Um, is there any other uh, member uh, who wishes to testify in HR 1425? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on uh, HR 1425. Um, I would now like to welcome our next panel uh, to testify on HR 5332 and HJ Res uh, 90. Uh, we have Chairwoman Waters and Representative Tipton. We're delighted that you are here. Without any, without objection, any written material you uh, you submit uh, to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. Um, and I would now uh, recognize the distinguished gentlewoman from California, uh, Chairwoman Waters, for her testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the committee for inviting me to testify on House Joint Resolution 90, the Congressional Review Act Resolution of Disapproval of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, uh, that's OCC, their final rule that undermines the Community Reinvestment Act. This resolution is sponsored by myself and the chairman of our subcommittee on consumer protection and financial institutions, Mr. Meeks of New York. I will also discuss HR 5332, the Protecting Your Credit Score Act of 2020, a bipartisan measure sponsored by Representative Gottheimer of New Jersey. I strongly support the committee's efforts to advance these two measures to the House floor to help struggling consumers fix errors in their credit reports and to stop any unilateral effort by one Trump regulator to undermine an important Civil Rights Act. So I will start with H.J. Res 90. The Community Reinvestment Act is a civil rights law enacted in 1977 to prevent the discriminatory practice of redlining and to require banks to invest and lend responsibly in low and moderate income communities where they are chartered. Unfortunately, implementation of the Community Reinvestment Act has not been robust. Today, 98% of banks routinely pass their CRA exam. However, research has shown that more than 60 metro areas across the country are experiencing modern day redlining today. These findings clearly demonstrate the need to strengthen the implementation of the law. However, despite the warnings and objections of community banks, consumer groups, and members of Congress, former Comptroller Auding used to finalize his CRA rule in the last few days he was on the job, doing so without the support of Federal Reserve and Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. The recently departed comptroller has been determined to undermine the Community Reinvestment Act ever since the law complicated his efforts to quickly obtain regulatory approval for one West Bank, a bank he ran with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin to merge with another bank in 2015. I'm gravely concerned that the OCC's final rule will harm low income and minority communities that are disproportionately suffering during this crisis, effectively turning the Community Reinvestment Act into the Community Disinvestment Act. If the rule is allowed to be implemented, it would create different rules for different banks leading to regulatory arbitrage. Notably, the rule was adopted with insufficient and incomplete data and incentivizes large deals at the expense of smaller and more continuous financial transactions that truly benefit LMI communities. For example, the OCC final rule allows CRA credit to be given for activities in LMI qualified opportunity zones, but does not require that these activities promote community development that includes affordable housing or small business economic development. This could lead to the unacceptable result of banks receiving CRA funding for building luxury housing in opportunity zones, providing no direct benefit to LMI communities. 
A wide range of stakeholders have criticized the OCC's efforts. For example, a group of civil rights and consumer groups issued a statement noting, and I quote, the new rules stick with an overly simplistic metric system that creates a loophole for banks to exploit, <coughs> allowing them to get a passing CRA rating by making investments in communities where they can reap the largest rewards while leaving too many credit needs unmet for underserved consumers and neighborhoods. During these difficult times, communities across the country have taken to the streets to demand justice and to tell their elected officials that they can no longer ignore the needs of communities of color. I'm proud that the House of Representatives is taking up police reform, but we must not end our efforts there. Congress needs to send a strong message to federal regulators that they should be doing all they can to help not hurt low income and moderate income communities and especially communities of color. Congress must block the OCC's harmful rule so that once the pandemic passes, banking regulators can renew efforts to strengthen and reform the Community Reinvestment Act to truly benefit these communities. Therefore, I urge the committee to advance H.J. Res 90 to the floor for its adoption. Now turning to the next bill, H.R. 5332, the Protecting Your Credit Score Act, which address several problems in the broken credit reporting industry. According to the Federal Trade Commission, roughly 42 million consumers have errors in their credit reports. Consumer complaints regard credit reporting areas and failed attempts to fix these errors of consistently pop complaint submitted to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Federal Trade Commission demonstrating that consumers are frustrated with the current system. Additionally, a representative of the National Consumer Law Center <laughs> our committee that the credit reporting system is biased against communities of color, directly impacting how much we pay for a car loan, whether we can get a mortgage or rent an apartment, in some cases, well, whether we can even get a job. We need a modernized system that empowers all consumers, especially those facing these new challenges with this pandemic, to quickly correct errors to their credit reports. The Protecting Your Credit Score Act offered by Mr. Gottheimer directs the nationwide consumer reporting agencies to create a single online portal for consumers to access free credit reports, credit scores, dispute errors, and place or lift security freezes. This portal would also contain information on consumer rights and clearly written language as to how to handle report disputes. This bipartisan bill will help consumers have better control of their data and will streamline a difficult and frustrating process for consumers who want to be better informed about their credit reports and scores and how to improve them. Importantly, the bill will also empower the CFPB to strengthen its oversight of the consumer reporting agencies, cybersecurity to help prevent another data breach like the one in 2017 when Equifax exposed the sensitive data of 150 million people. I know that I have a manager's amendment to the bill uh, that makes a technical change and I ask that it be made in order. Mr. Chairman, it is time to block efforts by Trump appointed officials to weaken civil rights protections, and it is time to modernize the outdated credit reporting system. During this pandemic and periods of political unrest, our communities need our help. Therefore, I urge this committee to advance HJ Res 90 and HR 5332 to the House floor and request the committee provide appropriate rules for their consideration. Finally, I would like to thank both representatives Meeks and Gossamer for their extensive work and leadership on these important issues. I, again, I'm very appreciative for the opportunity to present these two bills to you today. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Waters. We appreciate your testimony. 
I'm now happy to uh, welcome the distinguished gentleman from Colorado, uh, Representative Tipton. Uh, um, you may proceed with any opening remarks uh, you may want to deliver. I think you, you have to unmute. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. I'd like to thank you for taking the opportunity uh, today for me to testify on H.R. 5332 and House Joint Resolution 90. Committee Republicans stand ready to be able to support policies that protect consumers and to be able to support our communities. There is a bipartisan support for reforming the credit reporting process. In fact, I know that the ranking member worked closely with the bill's sponsor for the better part of last year to try and produce a bipartisan bill. Instead, this is another attempt by the majority to socialize the credit reporting and scoring industry. H.R. 5332 will weaken underwriting standards, increase the costs of credit, and ultimately decrease access to credit for borrowers who need it most. As many of us know, there are only three nationwide credit reporting agencies to start with. This bill furthers that market structure by mandating that many of these entities' services be commingled into a single website. The bill fails to ensure that appropriate cyber protections are in place to secure information on the portal, creating additional vulnerabilities for consumers at a time when they can least afford it. H.R. 5332 also mandates that credit reporting agencies match all nine digits of a so consumer social security number for including any information in the consumer credit report. This policy will have two negative consequences for consumers. First, valuable and otherwise accurate information will be excluded from credit reports when all nine digits of social security number are not recorded creating barriers to accurate reporting and jeopardizing the availability of low-cost credit for consumers. Second, data furnishers will start aggressively capturing social security numbers from consumers, which creates additional exposure to risk of fraudulent activity. Finally, this bill continues the Democrats' long-held goal of expanding the statutory authority of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Republicans continue to support policies to place the unaccountable government agency under the annual appropriations process. Moreover, the Bureau's single director structure is currently being litigated before the Supreme Court. Let's fix the Bureau before we start expanding it. Republicans offered targeted solutions to be able to protect consumers, protect minors against fraud, and help those consumers who may be facing medical debt as a result of the global health care crisis. I urge my colleagues to oppose 5332 and urge the majority to work with Republicans to be able to identify bipartisan solutions. Now on HJ uh, Res 90, uh, I'd like to be able to make a few points. The Community Reinvestment Act was enacted in 1977, and the last major regulatory overhaul of the Community Reinvestment Act was in 1995. Since CRA was last overhauled, the banking industry has undergone dramatic changes, like the rise of interstate branching and the shift to online mobile banking. There are three uh, key specific aspects of this rule. First, the OCC's rule eliminates subjectivity in the CRA process by providing clarity to banks on what activities count for CRA credit. The OCC will maintain a public list of activities that qualify for CRA credit, helping banks and community groups alike proceed confidently in the projects that they undertake together to be able to improve their communities. Second, the OCC's rule updates the geographic definition of a bank's community. Previously, a bank was only evaluated on its lending and investments in an area around its physical footprint. But banking today, with the help of new technology and innovation, has changed. As currently configured, the CRA functions on physical branches. The branch strategy has changed. Many banks have focused on their online presence. If an online bank chooses to headquarter in one state, it should not be precluded from helping other communities where it has a presence through CRA. Under the final rule, online banks will get credit for investments in areas where they take deposits, and all banks can get credit for investment in underserved areas, distressed areas, disaster areas, and tribal and native lands. This means an online bank headquartered in the West 
may want to provide assistance to a low-income community in Miami or New York. This rule would give them credit for those investments. Third, the rule introduces objective reporting measures that will allow comparison over time and between banks, which has never been possible in the history of the Community Reinvestment Act. Finally, I would like to be able to add that the OCC's rule is more than a decade in the making. It reflects more than a decade of stakeholder dialogue, as well as recommendations from the Treasury Department. It reflects feedback gathered by the Federal Reserve and thousands of public comments on both the advance notice of proposed rulemaking issued in 2018 and the notice of proposed rulemaking issued last December. House Joint Resolution 90 is a partisan attempt to overturn this long overdue regulatory update of the Community Reinvestment Act, an act uh, which I would argue is needed now more than ever before. I'd urge my colleagues to be able to oppose this resolution, and I support the underlying rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate the time, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Tipton. I appreciate it. Uh, and. Uh, I have no questions. I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any comments or questions he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of uh, brief questions. Uh, first, Mr. Tipton, uh, on the credit score issue, I certainly, and I certainly just let me say for the record, I understand there's always going to be differences between Republicans and Democrats on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We, we have a very different view of it, although I would commend to my, my Democratic friends they might want to think about uh, bringing it under congressional purview uh, in terms of its appropriations, because you would actually have more influence over it than you do now. It's as if it was written, you thought you'd have the presidency indefinitely. I, I think this is actually a, just a question of, uh, of uh, legislative branch authority. So I hope you rethink that in the future. But I was surprised, and I need a little more clarification, on the debate over the use of the full Social Security number. I mean, I, I would think we would all want to minimize that and be as protective as that as we can. So could you throw a little more light, perhaps, on, number one, what your concerns are about that? Uh, and number two, was there any bipartisan discussion, any effort? Uh, because I would think privacy concerns and the possibility for error here is something that both sides would be very focused on. I'm a little bit surprised we couldn't find more common ground there. And that was addressed to Mr. Tipton. You may be muted again. Thank you, thank you Mr. Cole. I appreciate the question. And uh, this is a primary concern. First of all, I think it is worthy of note that the ranking member had reached out to try and be able to get a bipartisan solution uh, to be able to address some of the challenges that we have with credit reporting. Uh, we want to be able to keep this affordable, but it's also important to make sure uh, in this day and age that we are going to be protecting the information that people provide by requiring that we uh, submit uh, all of the digits of the social security number. There are no provisions in this legislation in terms of cyber attack. Uh, we have access to those social security numbers. Uh, obviously, a lot of mischief uh, could take place and impact consumers' credit reporting. Uh, ultimately, if they don't provide all of the numbers, there are going to be additional costs, which is going to inhibit uh, the affordability of credit reporting for consumers to be able to get the information that they need to be able to get loans and to be able to address it. And um, always found it interesting. If you actually look on your social security card, it says it's not to be used for purposes of identification. Uh, but uh, we have a piece of legislation right now that is actually going to promote that uh, in terms of credit bureau information, you would have to get all of the digits of your social security number. And this is of concern. Madam Chair, I'd like to give you a chance to respond on that. Do you have any concerns about the use of the Social Security number or uh, got an area that maybe you could find some common ground with the Republicans on? Madam Chair, you may be muted as well. Chairman Waters, did you? My question, or do you need me to repeat it? Did somebody? The chair, Waters, did you did you hear the question? 
I'm sorry. We're oh, unmuted now. Go right ahead. What is uh, the question? The, the question, Madam Chair, was on the Social Security number issue. Do you not have concerns about uh, the misappropriation of those? Is that an area you think you can find some common ground working with the Republicans on? It seems like a technical issue to me. But not really work out. Okay, well, if uh, it's whether or not a Social Security number in some way is going to be exposed and made public, uh, certainly not. As a matter of fact, you know, the credit bureaus already have your social security number. Uh, it is verified uh, uh, when they, um, you know, gather your, the information about you, they already have that and it is not made public. So you, well, as you pointed out yourself in your own testimony, lots of things that aren't supposed to be made public are experienced pretty good example of that. Uh, so do you just not have any concerns there? Is that not, you're not too worried about it? No, we have no concern. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Tipton, just one last question. I mean, to me, uh, again, uh, I respect your committee. A lot of times it's very complex for the rest of us, but uh, uh, let me ask you on the Community Reinvestment Act rule. Well, to me, the bottom line is we want to encourage more investments than historically deprived of investment. Um, you think that changes are going to increase investment uh, in those communities or decrease investment? Well, that's why uh, we're asking for disapproval. Uh, the way we, this is Congresswoman Waters responding. Um, we're asking for disapproval because we certainly think it does encourage this investment. One of the problems that we've had, you know this has been a controversial issue for a long time, where we've tried to do everything to encourage uh, you know, credible investment. And we want to make sure uh, that the reviews that are done to determine whether or not the banks are in fact uh, living up to uh, the mandates of the Community uh, Reinvestment Act uh, are such that um, not, they're not absolutely given just a, a, a passing grade uh, but they are given a passing grade because they are absolutely doing the investment. Now, I mentioned the opportunity zones. Uh, the opportunity zones are encouraged to go into low-income communities, but there is no requirement that they invest in the community that they go into in ways that will help the community. As a matter of fact, I've gotten a lot of complaints already about people that are concerned about gentrification. If they come in and they're making investments in upscale housing, for example, or even uh, you know certain kinds of buildings, uh, and uh, they're taking up the land, they're taking up the space, and everybody who is uh, you know supported by the opportunity zone is making money, but the people in the community are not getting invested in. I think we have to uh, correct that because that's what's allowed now uh, with your opportunity zones. So we just want to make sure uh, that the uh, this um, rule that is being developed uh, and Mr. Uh, Otting is gone now, uh, that it be corrected and that we have a rule that will stop what is now modern day redlining. You know, this is a big issue in minority communities. We've been confronted with redlining for years, and uh, we attempted to address some of this with Dodd Frank, and we have corrected something uh, with the exotic um, loans that were given, et cetera. Uh, but it's still an issue and it's still a problem. People talk about wealth building. We'll never be able to build wealth if we keep getting undermined or excluded in ways that we have tried to correct this. So the um, this, this legislation would uh, attempt not to go backwards, but to continue to go forward and make sure that the Community Reinvestment Act uh, is an act that invests in the community rather than disinvests in the community. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Tipton, let me address essentially that same question. Give us your thoughts on uh, whether or not the rule is going to help or hinder uh, investments in historically deprived communities. and. Uh, what the consequences of overturning it? Uh, you know, I think actually we're going to see probably more investment because we're going to be having clarity 
again, it's worthy of note. Uh, the act for the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act was 1977. The last time it was addressed, 1995. And we have a real challenge with the new banking world that we're in. Uh, there are fewer brick and mortar branches that are going to be in place, uh, particularly in some of the low to moderate income communities uh, throughout the entire United States. And this rule is now allowing an opportunity for that investment based off of deposits, to be able to make those investments, giving clarity in terms of what is going to be credited for actual reinvestment into the communities. And uh, many of us uh, that have uh, small community banks, uh, particularly within our districts, uh, have fully recognized that uh, they want to be able to obviously make those communities thrive and be able to grow and be able to help create jobs. Uh, they can get that credit. And uh, with the new banking world that we are in, with mobile banking, uh, remote banking, people are participating in, uh, it would actually, uh, I believe, create uh, opportunities for more investment uh, to be able to actually come into the areas. And particularly in a lot of our tribal areas, our rural communities, uh, which often uh, some many, many do not have a branch bank specifically in the area under the rule with the deposits. Under that structure, I believe there is a good opportunity to be able to see real increased investment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hastings. Chairman, I have no questions. I thank our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Torres. You have to unmute. Uh... Ms. Torres, do you have any questions? No? Okay. Uh, Ms. Lesko? No, Mr. Chairman, no questions. Thank you. Mr. Perlmutter? To say hello to my colleague from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, and to my chairwoman of financial services. And with that, I'll yield back. Uh, uh, Ms. Shalala. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. All right. I think Ms. Spencer. I, does any other member have any questions? Um, hearing none, the um, witnesses are um, are excused. Thank you very much. Uh, does uh, any other uh, member wish to testify on behalf of HR five three three two or HJ Res ninety? Seeing none, uh, this closes the hearing on, uh, on these measures. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I would now like to call up our next panel to testify on HR 51, the Washington DC Admissions Act. Uh, a delegate to Holmes Norton and Representative Heiss, we are delighted that you are here. Uh, without objection, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. Uh, so at this time, um, I would like to welcome uh, and recognize the gentleman from Washington, D.C., Delegate uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. And, and we need you to turn your camera on. Can you see and hear me, Mr. Chairman? I can, loud and clear. And in, yeah, you look great. <laughs> I, I thank you for this hearing, Mr. Chairman. I am speaking for the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, as well as for myself, in strong support of HR 51, the Washington DC Admission Act, which would admit the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth as the 51st state and reduce the size of the federal district. Congress has both the moral obligation and the, and the constitutional authority uh, to pass HR 51. If the House passes uh, my bill, which has 226 co-sponsors, not more than enough to pass on Friday, it will be the first time since the creation of the District of Columbia, 219 years ago, that either chamber of Congress has passed a bill to grant statehood to the residents of their own nation's capital. The United States is unique among democratic 
nations in denying both voting rights and national uh, in the national legislature and local autonomy to the residents of their nation's capital. Adding insult to injury, DC pays more federal taxes, and let me repeat that, more federal taxes per capita than any state which is now a, a member of the union and pays more federal taxes than 22 states. And DC residents have fought in every American war, including the Revolutionary War that established the United States of America itself. It is fitting that the House will take up HR 51 between Juneteenth and Independence Day. HR 51 would end for DC residents the nation's oldest slogan, no taxation without representation, and apply the principle of consent of the governed to, the, to DC residents. HR 51 has both the facts and the constitution on its side. The constitution does not establish any prerequisites for the new state, for new states, but Congress generally has considered three elements in admitting them, population and resources, support for statehood uh, among the population, and commitment to democracy. DC, DC's population of 705 uh, residents is larger than that of Wyoming and Vermont. And the state of Washington, DC would be one of seven states with a population under 1 million people. DC's $55 billion budget is larger than those of 12 states, and DC's triple A bond rating is higher than those of 35 states. DC has a higher per capita personal income and gross domestic product than any state. 86% of DC residents voted for statehood in 2016. DC residents have been fighting for voting rights in Congress and local self-government for 219 years. That's since the creation of the District of Columbia. The Constitution's admission clause gives Congress the authority to admit new states and all 37 have been admitted by an act of Congress. The Constitution's district clause, which gives Congress plenary power over the federal district, sets a maximum size of the federal district of 100 square miles. It does not set a minimum size. Congress previously has changed the size of the federal district, including by reducing it 30% in 1846. Under HR 51, the new state would consist of 66 of the 68 square miles of the present federal district. The reduced federal district over which Congress would retain plenary authority would consist of two square miles. The reduced federal district would consist of the Washington members of Congress and visitors associate with the nation's capital, including the White House, the Capitol, the Supreme Court, the principal federal mo monuments and the federal executive itself. Um, as well as as well as I should add, as judicial buildings located adjacent to the National Mall and the Capitol. The major difference between HR 51 is introduced and the Rules Committee print, which is identical to the statehood bill passed by the Committee on Oversight and Reform in February, is that the Rules Committee print addresses transition matters. Historically, Congress has provided new states with transition assistance, including after admission. And the Rules Committee print would provide the new state with transition assistance as well. The Rules Committee would increase the House of Representatives permanently to 436 members. The Rules Committee print would clarify which laws apply in the reduced federal district 
and that the National Guard, which is controlled by the president, would become the National Guard of the reduced federal district and remain under the president's control. The new state would have its own National Guard, just as all the states do today. Since the Committee on Oversight and Reform passed the state of bill in February, the nation and even the world has witnessed the discriminatory and outrageous treatment of DC residents by the federal government as perhaps never before. March, Congress passed the CARES Act, which deprived DC of $755 million in coronavirus fiscal relief by treating the district as a territory uh, for the first time, rather than as a state. And just this month, federal police and out-of-state National Guards occupied D.C. without the consent of the D.C. mayor to respond to largely peaceful protesters. Prior to this occupation, D.C., in, in our city of the district, there had been much more looting and property destru destruction in other cities, but the federal government did not occupy those cities. The federal occupation of DC occurred solely because the president thought he could get away with it here. He was wrong. For me, HR 51 is deeply personal, Mr. Chairman. My great grandfather, Richard Holmes, who escaped as a slave from a Virginia plantation, made it as far as DC to walk to freedom, but not to equal citizenship. For three generations, my family has been denied the rights other Americans take for granted. Congress has two choices. It can continue to exercise undemocratic autocratic control over 705,000 American citizens who reside in our nation's capital, treating them in the words of Frederick Douglass, as quote, aliens, not citizens, but subjects, end quote. Or Congress can live up to this nation's promise and its ideals in taxation without representation and pass HR 51. Mr. Chairman, I wanna close by thanking the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform Chair, Carolyn Maloney for her leadership on DC statehood, as well as you, Mr. Chairman for your leadership on our bill. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now uh, happy to recognize uh, Representative Heiss. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you uh, giving me this opportunity to speak to you and, uh, and the members of the Rules Committee. Uh, the, the proposed uh, statehood comprises about 68 square miles. That's uh, in the ballpark of one-tenth of one percent of my home state of Georgia. And the reason it's such a small area is because Washington, D.C. obviously is a city. It's not a state, it's a city. And uh, there is no such thing as statehood for cities. Atlanta is not a city. Chicago is not a city. Los Angeles is not a city. The supporters of the D.C. statehood uh, bill are arguing for the creation of something that our constitution does not allow. It really is that simple. Uh, the, the attempt is to seek to convert a city and, and the city government into a micro state with all the rights, responsibilities, and privileges of a state. But America is not classical Greek. This is not Sparta. This is not Athens. And for us to go down this path is, is somewhere we don't need to go. Our, our founders uh, intended specifically for us to have a separate district that is our seat of government that is not influenced by a state. In fact, it's, it's totally fair and right, proper, to say that our framers specifically crafted the Constitution to avoid this very situation. And I want to say that again, our framers crafted the Constitution for the distinct purpose of avoiding a situation like this. They, they did not want our federal government to be within any state. In fact, James Madison expressed it in Federalist number 43, 
where he said that the capital city, if it were situated within a state, the federal government would be subject to undue influence by that host state. And so make no mistake, this whole, this whole thing really creates Washington, D.C. and puts Washington, D.C. in a position of superiority to any other city or any other state if the statehood bill were to pass. This is a superiority bill that, that puts this city and potentially this state in a position like no other city or state in our nation. But that, and that is what this bill ultimately would do. And I would further state that as members of Congress, we cannot legislate this 51st state into existence, making the District of Columbia the 51st state would require a constitutional amendment. Uh, and I know that supporters of this bill state otherwise, but it, it would. I, there's no way around this. The 23rd Amendment, just for an example, the 23rd Amendment to the Constitution grants this district three electoral votes. That's the amount that a, a small state would be allowed. But it's important for us to understand that the 23rd Amendment would need to be repealed before this proposed bill could be enacted. Otherwise, the residents of the new state uh, would only be the president and his family. And based upon the 23rd Amendment, they would have three electoral votes. How, how could that be? Obviously, that goes contrary to a plethora of, of, of constitutional issues as well as uh, election violations. And obviously, I, I would say that that uh, is in direct contrast to the Democrats' grievances already, uh, many of them, uh, with the Electoral College as it is. That would they really want the president to have three electoral votes for him and his family? Well, the, obviously, that would have to be repealed for us for this to, to move forward. Um, and so repealing a constitutional amendment requires passing of another constitutional amendment. I actually brought forth some of these amendments in, in our markup, uh, among other things, uh, to expedite the proposed constitutional amendment process. But the Democrats opposed that amendment as they did 14 other amendments. Uh, and I would also say that the Democrats also believe that excluding a small federal uh, enclave from the new state would not require a constitutional amendment. That simply is not true. The Constitution does not make a distinction. It does not make a distinction between the seat of our federal government and the district where that government is seated. It's all one and the same. The plain language in the Constitution speaks for itself. Uh, and I, we, we cannot escape that. We simply can't escape it. The Constitution does not grant Congress exclusive authority over the district where the government is seated. And in fact, since 1963, every Justice Department that has addressed uh, the district statehood issue has decided that Congress cannot alter the, the status of D.C. legislatively. So as a result, uh, to make D.C. The, the 51st state, make no mistake, there must be passed by Congress and ratified by the states a constitutional amendment. And uh, there is just nowhere near that kind of support. In fact, a majority of Americans do not support D.C. statehood. In 2019, Gallup did a poll and found that 64% of Americans opposed D.C. statehood. Only 29% approved it. Gallup also found that Americans have consistently opposed D.C. statehood in polls over the last three decades. And I would just bring up uh, one final consideration uh, in my opening statement, is that the, the district is not prepared to shoulder the burden of statehood. And this would apply economically, fiscally, 
as well as a host of other ways. But let me just give this example since it was just brought up. Uh, following the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, of course, we all know that civil unrest took, took place in multiple places throughout our country, including right here in Washington, D.C. On May 29th, protesters crowded Lafayette Square uh, and streets outside the White House. They were throwing water bottles. They were uh, doing a host of, uh, of activities that, that were uh, just uh, destructive in multiple ways. We saw the fires, uh, even with, with the, the church, people began uh, rioting and looting uh, from, from Georgetown to Foggy Bottom, down H Street, and, and all across a host of places. We saw the fire at St. John's Episcopal Church. Uh, and, and all of this, the response from May 29th to the 31st was the Metropolitan Police Department and the U.S. Uh, Park police attempted to squelch and to uh, quiet the, the crowd and to bring a peaceful situation. The mayor even imposed a as, as well as other attempts were ignored by protesters and in fact they were not even enforced by the municipal government. It was not until June 1st when Attorney General William Barr deployed federal riot teams, National Guardsmen, and an assortment of federal officers from the FBI, from DEA, and from ATF, finally, the violence subsided. In fact, from May 29th to the 2nd, uh, when it was largely the municipal authorities who were quelling the violence, there were 427 arrests on June 3rd, when the federal officers in DC were, were on the streets there were only three. So this is just one example of federal intervention compared to the MPD, where they could not contain the protest, they could not stop the violence uh, that was taking place in the, in the district, proving yet again, just how fundamental the federal government is in Washington, D.C., in this instance, for maintaining order and civil civility. And so, I mean, it, we, we do, there's just a host of ways that we can go here, Mr. Chairman, and I, again, appreciate your time, and with, with that, I'll yield back, but uh, there are major problems every direction on the D.C. statehood issue, and I'll yield back. Well, thank you. I thank you both for your testimony, and um, I mean, Mr. Heiss, I strongly disagree with you, uh, and, um, and I want to applaud uh, uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton for um, for championing the issue of DC statehood for so many years. I agree with her. Um, Congress has the moral obligation and the constitutional authority to admit uh, uh, DC as the uh, 51st state. Um, I mean, uh, the District of Columbia has 705,000 um, people, uh, and uh, that the, the, the notion that it is okay that they are disenfranchised. Um, to me is something that uh, should uh, be repulsive to all of us. Um, you know, uh, uh, people in, in D.C. Uh, pay more in federal taxes than 22 states, uh, and they pay more in federal taxes per capita than any state. Uh, they, um, they have, uh, the D.C. residents have, have fought in every American war. Including the Revolution War, the, Revo the, Revo the Revolution War during the Vietnam War, for example, 243 uh, DC residents were casualties of the war. A casualty future uh, figure greater than uh, that observed by 10 different states. Approximately 30,000 veterans live in DC, and yet um, their delegate, Congresswoman Holmes Norton, can't vote the same way we do. Her vote doesn't count the same way we do. They have nobody representing them. Um, in the United States Senate, um, and um, and that somehow it's okay for members of Congress from other states to meddle in the internal affairs of D.C. Uh, Mr. Heiss, you, you referenced uh, the protests in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. Well, D.C. wasn't the only state that uh, experienced uh, uh, protests, and some of the protests in other states uh, turned violent as well, unfortunately. Um, are you, I, I don't think anyone's advocating that the federal government take away statehood from those states uh, where there was civil unrest. 
Uh, and yet the example that you give on June 1st, 2020, when the federal government intervened, that was a peaceful protest. Um, what the president did was trampled on the constitutional rights of those peaceful protesters to get a photo op. I mean, he threw a chemical agent, had a chemical agent, some sort of tear gas thrown into this peaceful protest for a photo op that somehow that that is the federal government intervening in DC's internal affairs in a constructive way. Give me a break. I mean, that, that is going to go down in history as one of the low points of this presidency. Um, you know, uh, no other democratic country has a capital whose citizens lack equal voting rights. No other democratic country has a capital whose citizens lack equal voting rights. That, that somehow that we're all okay with that? Come on. Um, you know, I mean, look, I think, um, I think this is the right thing to do. Um, I hope it gets a strong vote. I hope some Republicans join with us uh, in supporting this. Uh, uh, but um, this is long overdue. Uh, I yield to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, for any comments he may have. Thank you very Thank much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate it very much. And uh, you know, we won't be surprised. I strongly disagree with you. I have great respect for you and certainly for our colleague from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. Uh, but, uh, you know, no other country has a constitution where it's federally uh, or specified that there'll be a federal city that will function as the capital. And this goes back to the very beginning of the Republic. So I want to ask Mr. Heiss just three quick questions. Uh, the first one, uh, if you could, you know, we talked a lot about your concerns, but I'd like to know why you think uh, the founders originally set this up in this way. I mean, they could have kept the capital in New York or Philadelphia. They could have moved it to any city in the country. They decided to do something very different and give it a different legal status. Uh, do you have any thoughts as to why they chose to do that? I think you need to put there your we go. Yep, got it. I apologize. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate the question. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, is our founders wanted a district where the seat of our government was not influenced by a state. I mean, it really is that simple. Uh, and it is citizens of states who have the representation because we are a federation of states. Uh, they, they restricted the size of this district because they did not want it to become a state. Uh, this this proposed bill is all about, I mean, uh, the, the chairman, I believe, alluded to it. We all know it. Everyone in here knows it. At the end of the day, this is all about getting two more Senate seats it is really what this is all about. If we wanted just representation, then we, they, we need to retrocede the property back to Maryland. Then, then that... Would, would all be resolved as far as the uh, representation issue, but that is not the issue. This is about Senate seats, uh, and our founders specifically did not want the seat of our government to be surrounded by a state or to be in a state because they did not want the influence of that host state influencing the entire nation. Rather, this is a district where the entire nation comes and influences this district, where our governmental issues are dealt with. Uh, and so it was very specific. In fact, Alexander Hamilton proposed an amendment for there to be representation in the House of, of Representatives, and it was rejected because Congress at that time did not want uh, this district to be anything but our the seat of our federal government. Uh, second question. It's my understanding the District of Columbia enjoys some of the unique financial relationship with the federal government. The government should staff. And uh, again, we could transition out of that, I suppose. If it became a state, I would expect its financial relationship to be like any other state. Uh, so could you explain what some of those relationships are, some advantages the District of Columbia might enjoy? Uh, other, other cities and other states? 
Yeah, I mean there are there are a host of them, and we could we we can talk about many of them. But uh, the the District of Columbia only is able to to handle about fifty percent of their budget. The taxpayers are carrying the rest of it. Uh, whether whether we're talking uh, seven hundred or so million, uh, something in that ballpark goes to for the courts alone. Uh, we have uh, in the ballpark of five hundred million. Uh, going to uh, uh, the a host of other things that really are the result of mismanagement in D.C. that goes back to the 70s under House rules. And eventually, Congress stepped in and and uh, bailed them out on a host of things. But if, if we have, just imagine if we had uh, this city surrounded by a state. Now this city. Virtually all the, if not all, the embassies in uh, here would be dependent dependent upon this new state for everything from electricity to water and sewer and police protection, fire protection, snow removal. I mean, we go down a whole list of things that would now come under this new state, and they're not even able to manage financially even now. And this bill has no deadline on the date for when the financial assistance from the American taxpayer would come to an end. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, you, uh, well, you, you no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, as I recall, one of our former colleagues, Tom Davis, used to have a solution similar to something we discussed. That is, uh, if we were going to make this a good, again, a part of the difficult return to Virginia uh, many years ago, uh, one of the other possibilities that we is carve out a federal campus, similar probably to what this legislation does, return the remainder of it, assuming Maryland would want it back, and it probably would. It's a very affluent area, a lot of wonderful people in it, uh, but to return that to Maryland, that sort of takes care of the representation issue. So we have a member of Congress certainly just given the side about what a congressional district is, there would be two senators. Was that considered by the oversight at all? It, it was considered and talked about. In fact, there uh, it was in line to be offered as an amendment. There was going to be an amendment offered to that uh, extent today. We just weren't able to get all the amendments uh, when we had the markup that we wanted to, to put forth. But yes, there was great discussion on that. And you're exactly right. Uh, if if the issue is that strictly of just representation, then just like happened with Virginia, this property hit that was given to uh, the district from Maryland needs to be given back to Maryland. Then everyone is in that uh, that state, and and they would be able to have that sort of representation. But that is not what the Democrats are fighting for. That's not what they want. We have we are offering a proposal. To take care of that problem, but they're rejecting it because that is ultimately yeah, my the issue. Last question, because I do take very seriously the constitutional issue here, and I, you know, recognize people can have different views, uh, but this is laid out in the Constitution of the United States. So, uh, if this were done without uh, a constitutional amendment that is done by an act of Congress, would you expect it to be challenged in the court? Oh, there's no question. This will be challenged in the courts, and even that in itself seems irresponsible to me for Congress to be proceeding in something that, without question, is going to be challenged in the courts. Uh, this, uh, there's no question whatsoever. This will be challenged. Thank you very much. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just want to say something before I uh, yield to Mr. Hastings. Uh, Mr. Heiss, you said that uh, Democrats, I think, and you alluded to me. You know, are interested in this to, to get two more Democratic uh, senators, um, um, you know, in the United States Senate. Uh, I, I assure you uh, that that's not my motivation here. Um, uh, I, I, I find that there's just something fundamentally wrong and offensive about 705,000 people that are disenfranchised, um, you know, and that have to take orders from members of Congress who come from Georgia or who come from Texas or who come from any other state in this country. Um, you know, the people of the District of Columbia um, are perfectly capable uh, of, uh, of advocating for their priorities. Um, and it is offensive when somebody from halfway around the country comes in and tries to instill their values 
which may be contrary to what the majority of people in, in D.C. think, force them on them. Um, and so this is about whether or not we believe that everybody who lives in the District of Columbia, the 705,000 people who pay a lot of taxes, you know, who fight in our wars, whether or not, you know, we're going to treat them like everybody else in this country, whether or not they are, they, whether or not it is somehow okay for them to be disenfranchised. I find that fundamentally wrong. Um, and so that is what is motivating me here. Uh, this is not a political question. Uh, this is about doing what is right. Uh, and I, with that, I yield to the gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. Hastings. You have to unmute, Elsie. I think you unmuted and muted again. All right. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I've indicated I will have a lot, a lot to say tomorrow uh, when I am managing the rule. But I want to take this opportunity um, uh, to, ta uh, to thank a tireless advocate um, uh, for the District of Columbia. Uh, as well as uh, uh, the rest of this nation, and that is my dear and good friend, Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, since I've known her, um, she and others um, I have worked on this particular issue, but she is also a tremendous legislator on many of our issues, and yet she does not have um, uh, the prerogatives that we do uh, when it comes to voting. Uh, sum up in um, uh, their uh, uh, motto, uh, um, taxation without representation. That's just wrong. And Mr. McGovern is right in that regard. Uh, I've been here um, uh, when there have been uh, uh, chairs of the subcommittee on appropriations that have literally meddled in Washington affairs. Um, I'd better stop because I get uh, pretty much I uh, uh, worked up uh, uh, about this, and I'll, I'll save my fire uh, for when I manage the rule on the floor tomorrow. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hastings. I now uh, will yield to uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to make a motion that Alcy go ahead and use some of his fire today and not save it all until tomorrow. Uh, I think that might be a benefit there. <laughs> um, I, I, I wade into this uh, with a dr great uh, trepidation. Uh, uh, I admire my friend from Georgia for, uh, for the relationships that he's built on the, uh, on the committee and, and for being here to, uh, to, to speak up today. I, I tell you that we are uh, benefited, uh, you and I, Mr. Heiss, by having uh, 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 our delegate from the District of Columbia remote uh, on the uh, on the screen because I have seen uh, because she is a tireless uh, uh, and passionate advocate uh, for the citizens that she represents uh, sit at that uh, that table uh, oftentimes uh, uh, with uh, a, a very visible sense of pain uh, because uh, she she is fighting so strongly for this uh, for this issue I happen to share. Uh, many of your constitutional concerns, but my chairman, who uh, very uh, regularly uh, is on the right side of issues, but just trying to solve them in the wrong kind of way, uh, is on the right side of this issue too. I, 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 I hear uh, his plea for the disenfranchised. Uh, I did not have the benefit of the, of the full uh, hearing. And so uh, if I can ask uh, 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 Ms. Holmes Norton, Certainly, D.C. statehood is one way to address the the, disen, uh, uh, the disenfranchisement uh, that uh, our chairman uh, discussed. Is it the only way? Uh, you referenced 1846 as the last time we we changed our our lines uh, here. There there are uh, a whole host of proposals going back 150 years to address this very same. Uh, issue, um, but we spent, tend to spend all of our time here talking about D.C. statehood. Um, 
when the chairman was talking about his passion uh, fighting on behalf of, of your constituents, he didn't mention statehood once. He just talked about ending a disenfranchisement. Is statehood the only way to get that done that would be uh, satisfactory in your opinion? Uh, excuse me, I, I did mention statehood at the beginning, so I just want to say that for the record, okay. I, I, I certainly didn't mean to mischaracterize you, Mr. Chairman. That's the, that's the beauty of having all these things recorded uh, these days. I, I, I will stipulate uh, to that uh, opening uh, uh, statement and, and ask my uh, question to, to Ms. Holmes Norton. I, I, I thank, uh, I thank uh, the gentleman for the question. I think it's a good question. Uh, and I think the reason that the chairman didn't repeatedly say statehood is because that there is only one way for the 700 and more than 700 that are growing every day residents of the District of Columbia to get the same rights that your, your, your own constituents have. And that happens to be statehood. We mean the right uh, to have representation in the House and the Senate, and we mean the right the right the members of Congress have now to intervene at will in the matters affecting the District of Columbia, as they could not, if I could say to the gentleman, intervene when they disagree with a law passed in your district. So if you look for the various ways that it would seem to bring the same equality to the residents of the nation's capital, that the residents, let us say, of Maryland, Virginia, which surround us, enjoy, and you will be hard put to find anything but statehood for the District of Columbia. Uh, I, rec I, I recognized in HR 51 the long list of, 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 of federal uh, exclusions that you tried to make to recognize the unique nature of a, of a federal district. Uh, Mr. Heiss raised the question of, uh, of international embassies, and I noticed those were not included. I would certainly imagine that many of our, our friends from around the globe located their embassy in the District of Columbia and not across the river in Alexandria, specifically because they wanted to be in the federal uh, district. Was there any discussion in the committee about including those international properties along with the the uh, uh, very extensive list of federal properties that you uh, would have excluded from the new Commonwealth? Well, quite as it's, ha as it's kept, our international uh, embassies are located uh, internationally. Our embassies uh, are located throughout the countries where they exist. Um, there's nothing in the Constitution uh, that says an embassy has to be located in the nation's capital. Many of their, uh, many of, uh, other parts of em embassies are already located in other parts of the United States. And so there's nothing sacrosanct about having the embassy right here uh, in, in, in the nation's capital. Point is to be able for the embassies to have uh, the same, to enjoy, in, enjoy uh, 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 being able to uh, function in the nation's capital. And it doesn't have to have an embassy per se in the nation's capital to do that. The, I, I confess I've never served on any of our foreign relations uh, committees. I was thinking that kind of by definition, an embassy is located in a nation's capital. We have the Indian consulate in the city of Atlanta. Uh, I've lobbied many times for them to move their embassy to the city of Atlanta because that is where, where all good things happen. Uh, but uh, have been told that embassies are in the in the nation's capital. Uh, uh, consulates are located in, in places around the city. But I, I see you have considered it. But but that is where you have. Yeah, concluded. I, I want you to know that 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 international law. I I I should have made clear that international law does not require that embassies or for that matter uh, diplomatic facilities be located in the nation's capital. And we do have. Uh, facilities from foreign countries in the United States uh, who work success, who work uh, uh, with uh, the federal government wherever they are. Uh, the embassies can be located in, in the new state uh, uh, and not the uh, reduced uh, federal district. Well, I like to say, I, I, I recognize your very sincere uh, commitment to, to this issue and for all of the, the reasons that you and the chairman included. I will uh, share with you, though, because our experiences are very different. 
if your goal with H.R. 51 is to keep a Congress from meddling in your new state, so let Mr. Heiss and I tell you on behalf of Georgia, that is not going to solve the problem. Congress will continue to meddle uh, with your constituents and their lives as they have with those of us in, uh, in Georgia for many, many uh, years. But I thank our witnesses for being here again, particularly appreciate uh, the gentleman uh, from Georgia. Uh, anytime we have Georgians uh, in leadership, I think the country ends up in a better place. And I'm grateful. Can, I, to can I respond to the, to the gentleman's uh, Please do. That he wants to continue to interfere. Uh, um, <laughs> I can understand that. And I, I do appreciate the, the gentleman's candor. But remember, I'm sure there are things, uh, and there is a national capital region. Uh, many and those states are not always traditionally Republican states. I, they say right now they're Democratic states, and I'm sure there are things you'd want to change there. All we do is say you can't change anything in the District of Columbia any more than you can change it in the surrounding states. The, I recognize that very, very sincere concern. And I, 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 I uh, if there's one thing I can count on not changing uh, when folks raise their finger up to the political breeze in Washington, D.C., uh, it is uh, the delegate and her uh, advocacy and passion on behalf of her people. So I thank you for that consistency. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Ms. Torres. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just quickly, for the purpose of it, I just got a brought a statement from the White House advising us of this legislation to be passed. The president's advisors would advise the to be doing. It. Like I said, that's the record. I, I, I'd like to say I'm surprised, but I'm not. But anyway, thank you. Uh, I yield to Mrs. Torres. I, I'm mute. Yeah. I have no comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, uh, Mrs. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a question for Ms. Norton. Um, Ms. Norton, do you think that it is uh, okay for the Trump administration, the National Park Police, or the National Guard to stop uh, anarchists from tearing down statues in Washington, D.C.? Uh, we don't object to federal officials, federal police uh, protecting uh, federal facilities here. I do want you to know that we are fully capable of protecting uh, ourselves and facilities under our jurisdiction. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Heiss, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, I was just, Mr. Heiss mentioned um, Federalist Paper 43, but I, I was just looking through the Constitution in I'd ask you, Mr. Heiss, or, or you, Ms. Norton, to point to me where it says that the District Columbia, District of Columbia is the seat of government and cannot be a state. Where does it say that in the Constitution? Well, it doesn't use those words, but it sets it up very uniquely by setting it up as a district. States are able to come from territories, U.S. territories, and Congress has authorization to deal with such. The but but show me where, show, Mr. Heiss, Mr. Heiss, I, I, my question is where, show me that in the Constitution, what section? It's, uh, I don't have the section right in front of me, where, what is it, section, what is it, four? Uh, article four? Uh, where the, the district is set aside uh, as, uh, our, the seat of our federal government. And we do know that uh, it was set up very specifically not to be a state. That was for a very specific reason. And we know from Federalist 43, the reason for that, because they did not want a state to influence our national government. That was the purpose while we were given a district. So I, I just read 43, and I think you're right about your interpretation of 43. The trouble is it didn't become part of the Constitution. And, you know, in the Constitution, for instance, and I can see why, you know, Ms. Holmes Norton, you know, would like to have the people in the district have a right to vote. 
And on section 2.3 of uh, section one, it says, you know, um, the number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000. So based on that number, the District of Columbia would get 23 representatives. Now we know that's changed over time, but the purpose of this was to give people a right to vote as part of their national government. And there, to my knowledge, and just looking through this, there's no prohibition period in the constitution to make the district a state or to give it the right to have some kind of um, vote in the Senate and in the House. And so for the people here, you know, in the constitution, it says you're supposed to have representative, you know, one for every 30,000 and two senators for every, you know, state. District of Columbia gets none of that. And that ain't right. And the constitution doesn't prohibit that. Can I respond? The, re the reason is because the district is not a state. The, the constitution does not set up Washington, D.C. either. Uh, it it uh, sets up a district uh, for our federal government to not be influenced by states to be. And, and let me just say this, too. The people of the District of Columbia do have votes. They vote in federal elections. Uh, they have their own self-government that they vote for. They have three electoral votes. No other city in the country has that. They have in tremendous representation uh, to large extents like no other city in this nation has. But, but they have no representation in the House of Representatives and clearly in the Constitution, it is saying citizens of this country are entitled to have representation in the House and in the Senate. And so I think that the Constitution is opposite of where you say it, it limits uh, the ability for the district to become a state. Everything in the Constitution talks about the ability of citizens of this country to have representatives in the Congress that have full voting authority. And so I hear you and I and I appreciate your argument about the Federalist Papers because that does give you something to stand on. The trouble is it's not in the Constitution. So I would just differ with your conclusion about all of this. The, the other thing, and Mr. McGovern, um, you know, said it pretty clearly, but the actions well i'm not even going to go there about the president and the, the photo op and all that stuff and uh but i don't i think that the your argument against statehood for the district based on federalist 43 and that not becoming part of the constitution when other parts of federalist 43 do become part of the constitution the treason clause for instance uh, i think cuts just the opposite of where you'd like it to go. And with that, I'll, I'll yield back to the chair. If I could just real quickly, Mr. Chairman, just add to that, that the citizens of this country are citizens of indiv individual states in this country. And it is those citizens of states who have representation in Washington. The seat of our government was designed not to be influenced by states uh, as, as we've discussed. And uh, further proof of that, again is that alexander hamilton offered an amendment to do just as you suggested for the district to have representation in the house and the congress at that time rejected that amendment because they were so committed that only citizens of states uh, as a federation of states which our country is are those who have representation here I okay yield. you and i disagree on this and i'll yield back Thank you. Uh, Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to be part of this historic moment as the uh, 700,000 plus citizens of Washington, D.C. Uh, finally inch towards the goal of real political equality and freedom and democracy under our Constitution. And I want to salute my friend, uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, who Thank makes you. an extremely powerful and I would say irresistible case for HR 51 today, uh, explaining that the population, uh, which used to be held against DC, is larger than that of two states, one a blue state, one a red state, 
She explains that the people of Washington, D.C. pay more in hard dollars than the people of 22 states and more per capita than the people of all of our states. Uh, she's invoked the triple bond rating uh, for those who would try to uh, make uh, obsolete arguments about uh, the fiscal solvency of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, she makes the point, which I would hope would be persuasive to my colleagues, that uh, residents of Washington have fought and died in every single war going back to the American Revolution and are draftable and are subject to every federal law and yet do not have equal rights of participation in the House of Representatives, in the U.S. Senate, uh, in the passage of federal laws regarding federal taxation, regulation of commerce, the um, approval of judges and Supreme Court justices, the declaration of war, all of those things that we hold dear as representatives on behalf of our people, they're completely shut out of, right in the shadow of the U.S. Capitol. What a tremendous affront and indignity that is. Um, we are, as the chairman tells us, the only democratic nation on earth that disenfranchises the people of the capital city. Can you imagine if France told the people of Paris that they could not be represented in their own national assembly? You'd have another French revolution on your hands. You'd have a revolution in Russia. You have a Russian revolution if they try to disenfranchise the people of Moscow. So this is very serious business. And I, so I want to take a moment to address in particular uh, Mr. Heiss's uh, arguments, which have a surface plausibility, but completely collapse when you look at the structure of this legislation and the real constitutional constraints governing the admission of states. And then I want to talk about why this is so important, not just for the people, of Washington, D.C., but for the people of America. So let me start with this. I believe that my friend, Mr. Heiss, uh, who is very eloquent and uh, well-spoken, misstates or perhaps misapprehends the meaning of H.R. 51. And, and I'm afraid that uh, he may have even confused uh, my, my good friend, Mr. Perlmutter from Colorado. H.R. 51 does not convert the district that is the seat of the government into a state. On the contrary, it respects precisely the constitutional contemplation of a district constituting the seat of government outside the control of any state. All that H.R. 51 does is to redraw the boundaries of the current Washington, D.C., the current federal district, so that it shrinks to the federal mall and the Capitol building and the White House and the Supreme Court. And then all of the residential lands containing more than 700,000 people and a majority of the people who have nothing to do with the federal government and people who lead normal everyday lives like people all across the country can get to be part of their own state. Then that state is admitted under Congress's power under Article 4, Section 3, the power to admit states. That is solely and exclusively up to Congress. No state has ever come in in any other way, despite lots of constitutional complaints about other states. For example, I know we've got members on this committee from Texas it was said it was unconstitutional to admit Texas as a state because it was not as a territory. And I think my friend, Mr. I suggested you need to be a territory. Texas wasn't a territory. It was a republic. It was its own independent freestanding republic. And yet we found that it was a political question and it was within the exclusive province of Congress to admit new states. And Congress admitted Texas as a state. Um, so... Um, it is the power of Congress to do it, which guarantees that it can do it. And it has also been established well by history, going back what, what, to 1847, Sam, that Congress can redraw the boundaries of the District of Columbia. If Congress could not redraw the boundaries of the federal district, then Alexandria, Arlington, and Fairfax County are all unconstitutionally within Virginia. Because those portions of Virginia were ceded to the federal government and they were ceded back for reasons that the historians will explain to you if you're interested. It was because the slave masters correctly anticipated that Congress was going to abolish the slave traffic in the District of Columbia, which it did uh, when that great Republican House member, Abraham Lincoln, introduced the legislation to abolish the slave traffic in the District of Columbia. But it established that Congress has the right to redraw the boundaries and it did that. And all that 
HR 51 is proposing here is to redraw the boundaries, shrink the federal district, and then admit this other state, which is called Washington, D.C., Washington Douglas Commonwealth, named after Frederick Douglass, who was uh, a great Marylander, our, our great leading abolitionist who moved to Washington and became the marshal of the District of Columbia, um, to admit that as a state. Congress has the power to do it twice over. One, it's got the power under Article 4, Section 3 to admit states. Two, it's got the power under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 to exercise exclusive legislation over the district that's to become the seat of government, meaning that, of course, it can draw the boundaries, as it has done repeatedly in the past. So um, Mr. Ice also throws in an argument about the 23rd Amendment. Well, the 23rd Amendment is what was adopted uh, as a way to give people stuck in Washington, D.C., without voting rights, the right to participate in presidential elections. You will notice that, like most of our Bill of Rights guarantees, it has in Article 2 an enforcement clause saying that Congress has the power uh, to pass appropriate legislation to enforce the provisions of this amendment. So that can easily be undone by this legislation. And H.R. 51 makes clear that it is not an attempt to give the Trump family three electoral college votes. That would be an ironic outcome of statehood for 700,000 disenfranchised people in Washington. Um, but to deactivate that and then to move quickly to pass the constitutional amendment, to repeal the 21st amendment, which would pass in record time, no one would oppose it. But it makes clear that the new state, of course, will be treated on a level of equality. This is the equal footing doctrine with every other state, which is all the people of Washington, D.C. are asking for. My friend, Mr. Heiss, also said that this is a partisan power grab. I mean, I, I'm really a little shocked to hear him say that. I'm disappointed to hear him say it. It's just about two more Senate seats. I mean, I, I suppose you could denigrate and degrade what every state, all 37 states that have been admitted since the original 13 did. You could denigrate and degrade the people's hunger and ambition for political quality by saying it's just about two Senate seats. Uh, that's not the way it is for us and those who actually feel the pain and the political grievance and the outrageous injustice of the situation for people living in Washington, D.C. But let's put it this way. If you want to reduce it to a partisan power grab, two more Senate seats, um, it's true that the Democratic Party has been siding with statehood for um, Washington, uh, the people of Washington, for many decades, just as the Republican Party has been standing for statehood for people in Puerto Rico. Although I never hear anyone mention it, but it's in the Republican platform. Uh, why don't you advance and propose statehood for people in Puerto Rico? I would gladly support that, and I would not look at it as a Republican power grab, because I think the Republicans are standing there on principle, which is that everybody should have voting rights and everybody should be able to participate on a level of equality. Mr. Chairman, you know, our social contract is broken today. And we're in danger of becoming a failed state because of the lethally incompetent administration of Donald Trump. We cannot deliver basic goods to our population. We can't deliver public health and safety in the middle of a pandemic, which is now spiraling out of control again in Texas and Arizona and Florida and South Carolina. Um, we can't deliver it. The rest of the world looks at America aghast they used to look up to us, and now what they see is America can't provide even a nationwide plan for testing and contact tracing, the only solution we have to deal with this public health nightmare. We can't deliver any progress on climate change because they don't believe in the scientists there either, just like they don't believe in the scientists and won't listen to the medical health authorities, the public health authorities about COVID-19. They won't listen to the scientists about climate change, and they say it's all a hoax, it's a democratic hoax, hoax it's been made up. And the nation cannot provide equal justice and equal enforcement of the laws for the African-American population. That's a basic commitment of a civilized democratic nation, equal administration, equal enforcement of the laws, and we can't do it. But I raise this because John Dewey said that the only solution to the ills of democracy is more democracy. And we got millions of people left out of our democracy. And so it should not be a point of partisan intrigue and petulance that we have 700,000 American citizens asking for their statehood. We should be proud of that. We should celebrate that. 
That's a moment we should all exult in. So I think that this is something that we've all got to get behind. I close with, uh, I, I, find it, I find it amazing that, that some of the opponents of statehood for DC raised the police riot that paramilitary unidentified federal officer squad riot unleashed by Attorney General Barr and Donald Trump on innocent protesters exercising rights under the First Amendment. You know, we got six rights under the First Amendment, and arguably they violated every single one of them with that police riot. One, the right to peacefully assemble. Two, the right to petition government for a redress of grievances. Three, the right of freedom of speech. Four, the right of free press as reporters got trampled and their cameras knocked out of their hands. Five, the free exercise of religion as they cleared a path for the president to cross the street to go to the St. John's Church where he was an uninvited guest, or I should say non-guest, and he crashed it for the purposes of conducting the worst photo op in the history of the United States. And six, then he decides to essentially wave off the Establishment Clause, which prevents the establishment of religion by taking someone else's Bible, turning it upside down and waving it over his head, thereby attempting to destroy the distinction between the government and the church. And that's his best understanding of religion, essentially turning himself into a false idol above the Lord of the Bible. You could say he used his paramilitary force to clear a path violating the First Amendment. Also, he could cross the street so he could violate the First Commandment and to deem himself somehow above the Lord of the Bible. Well, I don't know why they're bringing that up, but I will say this, that when statehood comes to the 700,000 people who live right now in Washington, that Congress will have all of the police powers and the federal government will have all the police powers that we have now that rightfully belong to us. We will be able to keep the Capitol safe, the Supreme Court safe, the White House safe, all the federal buildings. And so Mr. Heiss is correct that that was the theory of having a federal district. And that theory is vindicated because we will still exercise exclusive legislation, total police power over this jurisdiction at the same time that 700,000 American citizens finally, triumphantly, victoriously will get their political equality and get to have political self-government so you don't have other people's representatives constantly monkeying around in their internal affairs. We had a revolution to destroy the idea of virtual representation. Because, you know, that's what the Crown said. Um, King George said, you don't need to be represented in Parliament because your cousins are represented in Parliament. There are other people like you represented in Parliament. And that's essentially what you're saying to the people of Washington, D.C. They don't need to be represented because there's other Americans who can govern for them. That's not how we do it in America. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence that we are based on the consent of the governed. All of the governed, let's make that real. I yield Thank back you. to you, Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, I yield to Ms. Shalala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be brief um, following the eloquence of uh, my colleague. Uh, this representation matters. Uh, this is about taxation without representation. And uh, that's my first point. But uh, my second point is, if we want to talk about density, the most dense state in this union is New Jersey. And um, uh, and we've never chosen who becomes a state based on sparsity or density. Um, I want to uh, congratulate my long-term friend, um, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, on her advocacy uh, for this. And, and uh, my final point, really, uh, I hope when the president sent over his message, he consulted with the vice president. Let me call... Let me quote Vice President Pence in 2007. The fact, quote, the fact that more than half a million Americans living in the District of Columbia are denied even a single voting representative in Congress is clearly a historic wrong. The single overarching principle of the American founding was that the law should be based upon the consent of the governed. The first generation of Americans threw a T through tea in Boston Harbor because they were denied a voting represent 
voting representation in the national legislature in England. Given their commitment to representative democracy, it is inconceivable to me that our founders will have been willing to accept the denial of representation to so great a throng of Americans in perpetuity. End of quote, I yield back. I yield to Ms. Matsui. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I will also be very short. I really especially wanna hail um, Eleanor Holmes Norton, my good friend, for her passionate advocacy all these years. And uh, we appreciate everything that you're doing, Eleanor. And also um, speak, I, I, you know, I can't be more eloquent than my colleagues on this. And I think the fact is, is that for so many years, all of us knew that Washington DC did not have uh, the type of representation it deserves. And when you consider the fact that it pays federal taxes. And with this committee's consideration of HR 51, we're one step closer to something that has never occurred in our nation's history, either House of Congress passing legislation, granting, um, uh, granting full statehood and congressional representation to DC's more than 700,000 residents. As a co-sponsor of the Washington DC Emission Act, I believe strongly the United States should end the unconscionable practice of denying a vote in Congress to Americans that pay federal taxes. For too long, the residents of DC have lacked the autonomy and self-governance enjoyed by the rest of the country. The American citizens living in the District of Columbia deserve better. And I am glad that this committee is taking action on legislation that will provide the basic privileges of representative democracy to them all. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question uh, of these witnesses? Seeing none, I would like to thank our witnesses for their testimony and you are now excused. I think we have one additional uh, person who wants to testify um, on this legislation, uh, Mr. Gosar. Uh, and we, will, we welcome you to the Rules Committee um, and we appreciate your being here to testify in HR 51, and the, the floor is yours. I think you get a please turn your video on. Or just so. <clears throat> Mr. Gosar, you need to turn your video on. And volume. And volume, yeah. We're just going to wait while we'll, we're trying to communicate with Mr. Gosar to figure this out. There you go. We got it. Okay. You got it. There you yeah. go. Well, thank you. Welcome. Go ahead. You are thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Founding fathers did not intend for DC to be a state. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the United States Constitution provides Congress with the exclusivity of jurisdiction over the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia was granted limited autonomy in 1973 by Congress, who at the time did not wish to intervene in the day to day governance of the city. This grant of limited autonomy by Congress may be revoked by Congress at any time. The Article 1 Enclave Clause was included. The reluctance of local authorities to police disorderly conduct by protesters in June of 1783, conduct that forced the adjournment of the Congress and the flight of its members to neighboring states. We see a similar situation playing out in the streets today. 
Article one of the Constitution clearly puts Congress in charge of a federal district representing the seat of the federal government. This amendment would replace HR 51 with HR 4445, the DC Home Rule Improvement Act. The legislation makes necessary improvements to the congressional oversight process over the District of Columbia. Specifically, this amendment doubles the time Congress has available to review DC statutes from 30 days to 60 days. It also gives Congress the ability to overturn individual provisions in DC law. This is an important legislative tool when considering larger such as DC's yearly budget support act that can include dozens of distinct modifications to DC's code. The amendment would also allow any member of Congress to make a motion to discharge any resolution from the committees of jurisdiction, which has not been acted upon in 20 days. And lastly, lastly, it would modernize the DC Home Rules Act ex expedited review per procedures with the Congressional Review Act stronger mechanisms for avoiding Senate filibusters. This will help ensure Congress speaks with one voice by passing DC resolutions through both chambers. In summary, Article One of the Constitution explicitly gives Congress the power to exercise exclusive, exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over this federal district, who as the founding fathers understood to be the District of Columbia. Congress should remain focused on fulfilling our constitutional duty to oversee the District of Columbia, and this amendment modernizes our legislative tools to do so. I would urge all the members to support this amendment. And I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Gosar. Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have to uh, thank my friend for the amendment. I have no questions. Mr. Hastings? No question. Mr. Woodall? Are we key? Okay, okay. All right. Um, uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Mrs. Torres? No questions. Ms. Lesko? No questions, Mr. Chair, and I support Mr. Gosar's comments. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter? No questions. Don't agree with him, but appreciate his testimony. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Raskin. Um, no, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Shalala. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Matsui. No questions. Uh, any any other members wishing to ask uh, any questions of Mr. Gosar? If not, Mr. Gosar, I thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate, uh, as always, your appearance before the Rules Committee and. Uh, and uh, uh, again, thank you so much, and uh, you are free to go. Uh, are there any other members who wish to testify in HR 51? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on this measure. I would now uh, like to call up our next panel to testify in HR 7120, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. Uh, Congresswoman Vass uh, and Mr. Armstrong, we are delighted that you are here. Without objection, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. Um, I would now uh, like to recognize the gentlewoman from California, uh, Congresswoman Bass. Ms. Bass, uh, please turn your video on. Can you hear me, Ms. Bo? We yeah, we we yeah, uh, we can, and we're let me see, I can I can hear you, but we're, there you are. I see you. Okay. I think you you have, you're, you you need to unmute. Okay. There you All go. Right. Thank you, right. Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify today. The tragic death of George Floyd has awakened this nation and the world to the gross injustice that too many African-Americans face on a daily basis. It's not a new story, but the sad truth is when people told their stories of police abuse, of murder at the hands of police officers, they simply weren't believed. It has taken technology, cell phone cameras, and active citizen involvement to document and expose this ugly reality in our country. But even when incidents of excessive force or even death at the hands of law enforcement have been on display for the world to see time and again, Congress has failed to deliver the sort of meaningful change that is necessary to meet the moment. It is up to all of us to not let this moment pass by. 
That is what. Is there a way? Would you which reimagines policing for the 21st century, creates the highest standards for the profession, and holds those officers accountable who fail to uphold the ethic of protecting and serving their communities. This bold, transformative legislation effectively bans chokeholds, prohibits racial and religious profiling, ends no-knock warrants in drug cases, stops the militarization of law enforcement, and requires the use of body cameras. It also collects data on use of force and creates a national registry of police misconduct to ensure that officers who are unfit to serve are not able to move from department to department. Now, I know the change is difficult, but I am certain that police officers who risk their lives every day are concerned about their profession and they don't want to work in an environment where they are chastised for intervening when they see a fellow officer abuse a citizen or use deadly force when it is not necessary. And I am certain that police officers want to make sure they are trained in the best practices in policing. To help support officers, this legislation will create the first ever national accreditation standards for the operation of police departments, set national standards for officer conduct, and establish best practices in training, hiring, de-escalation strategies, and bystander duty. But despite our best intentions, there will be some officers who cross over the line. That is why the bill also includes strong accountability measures, both as a matter of simple justice and to keep unfit officers off the street. A profession where you have the power to kill should be a profession that requires highly trained officers who are accountable to the public, and that's what the bill accomplishes. We all want to be safe in our communities. We all want the police to come to our rescue when we're in trouble. We all want to support the brave men and women who put their lives on the line every day for us. And when we interact with the police, we all want to be treated with respect, not suspicion. Nobody should, should be subjected to harassment or excessive force just because of the color of their skin. Nobody should suffer the indignities of racial profiling or be on the receiving end of a deadly chokehold. We all should want that for ourselves, our children, and for our neighbors. But too often today, that is not the reality lived by African Americans. Right now, the world is witnessing the birth of a new movement in our country, with thousands marching to register their horror at hearing the cry, I can't breathe. People are marching to demand not just change, but transformative change. Change that ends police brutality, that ends racial profiling, that raises the standard of the profession, and that holds accountable officers who fail to meet those standards. The voices we hear on the street are calling out for meaningful and substantive change, not a fig leaf. They will not accept reform light, and neither should this Congress. That is why we must support the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. If this legislation had been the law of the land several years ago, Eric Garner and George Floyd would be alive today because the bill bans chokeholds. If the bill had been law last year, Breonna Taylor would have not been shot to death in her sleep because no-knock warrants for drug offenses would have been illegal. And if a national registry had been in effect, it would have been revealed that the officer who killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice had been fired from another department and had a propensity for violence. He never would have been rehired by another department. And this made Tamir Rice would have turned 18 and graduated high school. We have an opportunity with this legislation to reimagine public safety so that it is a just and equitable system for all Americans. I urge all of my colleagues to seize this opportunity and to support the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much uh, for your eloquent testimony. I'm now happy to yield to the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for any opening remarks he may have. He may have, he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Congresswoman Bass. Her passion for this issue has uh, been noticed both not only here, but in committee. Um, and with that, I thank you for having me here to testify on H.R. 7120, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. Last month, we as a nation were horrified when we saw the gruesome video of George Floyd being murdered by a police officer in Minneapolis while his colleagues stood by and did nothing. George Floyd's life was precious, his murder was wrong, his family deserves justice. Subsequently, we saw David Patrick Underwood, who was a federal law enforcement officer, killed during the protests in response to George Floyd's murder. 
Pat's life was precious, his murder was wrong, and his family deserves justice. And the American people are demanding reform. We owe it to George Floyd's memory and Pat Underwood's memory to approach reform in a serious and collaborative man manner. Almost all of our colleagues in the House su support some form of reform. In fact, more than 350 members of Congress have committed to working on reforming our nation's police department by co-sponsoring legislation to do just that. Unfortunately, the legislation before you today is not the bipartisan solution that this moment in history demands. While Americans are demanding reform, the Speaker and the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee have chosen to go their own way, to ignore the voices and reject the ideas of nearly half the House. Democratic leadership could have made serious attempts at crafting legislation that could pass both chambers and be signed into the law by the President. But rather than seek to, uh, rather to seek and better our nation, Democrats have shut out Republicans every step of the way. And I should note, it's not just in the House. This morning, the Democrats in the Senate voted to block debate on Senator Tim Scott's bill as well. So from the introduction of Chairwoman Bass to the drafting of the amendments in the nature of a substitute by Chair Chairman Nadler, H.R. 7120 has been a purely partisan undertaking, despite Republicans loudly and consistently expressing a desire to work across the aisle. Even during committee consideration of the bill, Democrats showed no inclination to reach a bipartisan consensus on any, of the, on any issue. We were told that our proposed changes to the bill would be considered before it heads to the floor, but Mr. Chairman, here we are, headed to the floor with a bill that will almost certainly be taken up under closed rule. The American people understand we can do better, and so does President Trump. He wants to see a bill come to his desk. It is the actions of the Democrats who are preventing progress on this legislation. Last week, the, the president signed an executive order that encourages law enforcement agencies to implement best practices, provide, de provide for department and officer accountability, and prioritizing training for responding to insult, in, incidents involving mentally Ill, the, the mentally ill, addicted, and homeless. And before anybody can, says that we don't go far enough or the executive order doesn't go far enough, I would I, I would I would be care I would I would wager quite a sum of money that in three weeks that will be the only thing that has been done in this body and passed into law on police reform. To be clear, there are some, if not many, issues addressed in HR 7120 where Republicans agree with our Democratic colleagues. But as drafted, the bill has serious flaws that would unnecessarily encumber the men and women who serve and protect our communities, and that will make us less sa safe. Because of these flaws, I oppose the bill. This leg legislation would lower the standard when charging an officer with criminal misconduct in federal civil rights prosecutions from willfulness to knowingly or reckless. In order to be convicted under current law in federal court, an officer must specifically intend to deprive a person of a federal right made definite by a decision or other law. By lowering the standard to knowingly or recklessly, an officer can be convicted without having the specific intent that is typically found in civil rights violations. And this is probably a this is a good example of where we there actually could be some consensus. I don't think anybody would disagree with having two, three, four reckless, recklessly in, in, reckless incidents on your record could get to the level of a civil rights violation. But that's very different than having a rookie officer who's been on the job for six weeks being hit on this immediately. Police officers are frequently required to make split second, split second decisions under considerable stress. In those situations, hesitation can be deadly for the officers and the public. Likewise, the bill removes qualified immunity, which will result in ineffectual police force leaving our communities vulnerable to crime. The Supreme Court has noted that qualified immunity gives government officials breathing room to make reasonable but mistaken judgments about open legal questions. Without that breathing room, officers will hesitate to act, and that hesitation could be costly. Essentially, what we are, we are working towards is it will end up keeping the cops in the car. On this issue, I believe, again, I believe there's room for compromise. In fact, there's not even agreement on qualified immunity in our own caucus, in our own conference. But, current, but the approach currently in the legislation is short-sighted and not ready for prime time. The bill also seeks to severely limit the Department of Defense's 1033 program, which allows law enforcement agencies at all levels of government to receive surplus equipment from the DOD. The equipment protects law enforcement officers in the communities they serve during dangerous situations and is used to rescue victims in emergency situations such as natural disasters. 
We've seen this in Hurricane Harvey, and we have seen this numerous times in North Dakota, either through floods, tornadoes, floods and tornadoes, or blizzards. Not only were these issues ignored by the majority in the drafting and consideration of this bill, during committee, committee's business meeting to consider H.R. 7120, Republicans offered dozens of amendments to improve the bill. And the chairman declined to accept or even consider a single amendment offered by Republicans. Republican amendments would have improved police accountability, strengthened the penalties for lynching, lynching and ensured adequate border security. In closing, Mr. Chairman, this bill does nothing to stop dangerous and irresponsible calls to defund, dismantle, disband our police. The idea of defunding or dismantling our police forces is um, one of the craziest things I've ever heard in politics. We should be clear as a body that while we support reforming police accountability and transparency, we do not support eliminating all law enforcement together. And just, I would, I'll just finish with this. If there's ever been something that has demanded a nuanced and thoughtful approach, I'm not sure that the police reform isn't it. 2 million out of 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States are incarcerated in state or local prisons where we have no direct um, authority. In our, in our quest to deal with what are often large city issues and medium city issues when it comes to police enforcement and accountability, we forget about the negative impacts this will have on rural law enforcement, where we measure back up in hours and not minutes. Um, I'm, I'm personally a huge fan of reform and qualified immunity, but I don't know how we get rid of it without replacing it with something. Because I think when you do that, you also run, you run the risk of doing what will actually happen. And that is where departments and municipalities will have to carry liability insurance. You will see small rural departments cease to exist the minute this becomes law. Um, all civil rights cases, all excessive force cases are civil rights cases. It doesn't matter how they occur. And when you deal with issues like this, they all become a reasonableness standard. I said this in committee and I'll say it here again. That means they will all end up as a fact question for a jury. And without, without qualified guardrails to do this and to protect all departments, but particularly rural departments, you will see a sue and settle business that exists that will essentially make it impossible and um, unaffordable for local, for small rural communities to conduct law enforcement. We offered amendments to deal with one of the root issues to having uh, bad cops bounce from department to department. And that was with co collective bar bargaining reform. And with regards to getting rid of no-knock norms, I don't think there was ever any attempt to look at if there was a, a reason to keep them or if some jurisdictions do them differently. I know this because my home state has a dual probable cause standard where you only have to get probably not only have to get probable cause for the warrant, but you have to get probable cause as to why the no-knock warrant is applied and it has to have specific findings by the judge. We require federal law enforcement to wear body cameras when they are detaining somebody, yet we refuse to require them to record the interview. So while you're detaining a protester, you may you are required to required to record them. But if you want to coerce a confession out of them, feel free to turn it off in the meantime. Um, this, the, these, these bills need serious work. In fact, I think every single section of this bill deserved its own hearing. And we could have done that. We're the Judiciary Committee. We're used to being in D.C. when nobody else is. We're used to working hard. We could have had a hearing on every single one of these issues between the original hearing and the markup. And it's important because they affect different communities differently and they affect rural law enforcement. And they, for all the great intentions that exist with a lot of these provisions, they will actually have a chilling effect not only on law enforcement, but on the safety of our community. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank both of you. Um, uh, uh, Congresswoman Bass, w was there a hearing on this bill and a markup? Yes, there was a hearing on the bill that lasted. You have to turn your camera on, too. Yes, yes, there was a hearing. My camera on. There was a yeah. hearing on the bill. Your, hearing, your camera's not on. Yeah. There was a hearing on the bill. That lasted all day. There was a markup that lasted all day and into the night. Yeah. And unfortunately, my my colleagues, I'm I'm very glad to know that uh, Mr. Armstrong is interested. I I did know he was, and I look forward to working with him in the future. Uh, but unfortunately, the character of both the hearing and the markup was my Republican colleagues expressed interest in the issue, 
but spent an awful lot of time talking about extraneous issues that really didn't have anything to do with the bill, um, such as Antifa and just everything under the sun. So I look forward to working with him in the future. Well, thank you. And let me let me just let me thank you and let me thank the Congressional Black Caucus in particular for your leadership in, in crafting this bill. Um, you know, some of my colleagues talk about this issue as, 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 as if this is something new. Uh, you know, the murder of George Floyd, um, you know, is not unique. Um, we can point to countless murders by law enforcement, uh, not only uh, this past year, uh, but as we go back, uh, you know, year after year after year. Um, and, I, you know, I think, you know, meaningful structural change uh, can't wait uh, anymore, um, and our and the American people are demanding that we do something. And you know the problem with some of the solutions that have been proposed, in particular by the president, is you know is that they amount to being a press release, uh, but nothing really changes. And I think I think people, you know, are at a at a, at a point where enough is enough. Um, they don't want members of Congress. They certainly don't want the the White House. In the aftermath of these terrible tragedies, simply to say, "Oh, it's, isn't this awful?" You know, or that we pray for the families. Um, they want something to. They want something to change. Um, you know, ninety-nine percent of killings by police from twenty thirteen to twenty nineteen did not result in officers being charged with a crime. Um, and so, the bill that um, that you have brought forward here removes some of the barriers to prosecuting police misconduct. Uh, and enables individuals to recover damages when law enforcement officers violate their constitutional rights. Um, look, we, we all have to do better here. The fact of the matter is, in the case of George Floyd, um, if a young girl did not videotape that, right. I'm not even sure we would even be having this discussion, I'm sad to say. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I also believe that if George Floyd looked like me, he would still be alive today, uh, because in, in addition to the reforms we're talking about, uh, we're at a point where we're going to have to have a meaningful and, yes, uncomfortable discussion about systemic racism in this country. And what we're talking about today is uh, reforming uh, our policing. But this discussion has to continue beyond just policing. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we see communities of color disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because of some of the flaws in our healthcare system. There are issues of housing. There are issues of where we invest federal resources, of, you know, of the availability of capital to minority-owned businesses, to fairness in our education system. You know, we're having this discussion about, you know, uh, statues and the names of our military bases. Um, you know, we, we have to come to grips with our history. Um, and, uh, and so these are these are all difficult conversations. This is a this is the first step. Um, and again, I um, you know I, I I think this is a good bill. Um, obviously, uh, we will send it over to the Senate. I mean, I'm sure that there will be you know some exchanges, and there may have to be some you know give and take. Uh, but I hope we can get a bipartisan bill, and I hope we can get something to the to the to the president, and I hope that he will sign it. Um, I, I, I worry, you know, that he's engaged in sloganeering all the time and trying to polarize this country. And, um, you know, he can't seem to bring himself to, to trying to unite us or to heal uh, the, the divisions in this country, which makes me believe that really the burden falls on Congress uh, to take the leadership. And I, I respect colleagues on both sides of the aisle, um, you know, to be able to act in a way that hopefully we can make some progress. But um, I just want to say, uh, uh, Congressman Bass, that I am um, proud of the work that you and the Congressional Black Caucus have done. Um, and I look forward to bringing this to the floor and to being able to, uh, to cast an eye vote on this. I now would like to yield to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your remarks and your passion on the issue. And certainly I extend the same appreciation to uh, both our colleagues here to, here to testify. They're both uh, excellent legislators and uh, have a high regard for them. Mr. Chairman, before I get to my questions, I have just a couple of uh, parliamentary things real quickly. 
first, just uh, I need to ask for unan unanimous consent to insert the following items in the record, if I may. A letter from the National Association of Police Organizations outlining their opposition to H.R. 7120, a statement of administration policy in support of the Justice Act, and a third, a statement of administration policy recommending a veto for H.R. 7120, and finally, a statement from Dr. Rowe in support of his amendment. May I submit those? To yeah, without, without objection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And just one other item, and this really arose from the judiciary hearings. Please uh, understand as I bring this up, I bring it up simply for the purposes of clarification. Certainly no, uh, nothing um, uh, untoward implied either in judiciary, but certainly not in this committee. But I think we have a special uh, responsibility. It's my understanding, I've been informed several times in the judiciary committee, I'd like your perspective uh, on a question that rose on several occasions. Uh, Regulation A2 states that members participating remotely in a committee proceeding must continue to use the software platform's video function for the remainder of the time that they are attending the proceeding unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render uh, the member unable to fully participate. I read this amendment to mean exactly what it says. So you're free to get up and walk around. I've certainly done that in this hearing, went out to to grab uh, a piece of pizza and something to, to drink. So, but my platform stayed on, and you knew that I was here and participating. Uh, evidently, that did not occur, and we had some members turning platforms off. Do you understand this the same way I do, that if you're participating, you should your platform should stay on? That is my my understanding, but um, many of the uh, ranking members have um, um, submitted a uh, have, have sent me a letter with a with a series of questions um, that I'm in the process of drafting some answers to. Uh, but they su sent it to me and a, and a number of other people. So um, if they just sent it to me, I could have responded more quickly. But I need to uh, clear it with everybody else here. Well, again, Mr. Chairman, I recognize this is a work in progress. Nobody's worked harder at it than you. We just wanted clarification on that point. And and if somebody did turn off their their platform and then reactivate it, I mean, is there any recourse from the minority, or is that still something to be worked? On? Uh, I, I let me get back to the gentleman with an answer on that uh, at the end of the hearing. Okay. I just need to establish it for the record. I appreciate that. Uh, let me turn now, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, to our two witnesses. Again, both of them I have enormous respect for as legislators because I think they're very serious. But uh, let me start uh, with Mr. Armstrong. Can you please describe the process by which this legislation was written and reported out of committee? And uh, at any point, were Republican members engaged in this uh, other than the pro forma votes in the markup? Ask what your ideas were, or uh, you know, yeah, that back and forth. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Cole. No, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I will say that I personally have had relationships with many Democrats on the committee about the overall conversation of criminal justice reform um, from the time I have gotten here. But so specifically on this bill, no, and absolutely. I mean, and. Listen, I mean, we offered 12 amendments. I didn't even vote for all 12 of our amendments. I get the process. I understand the process. But we had, I mean, we, I mean, it became abundantly clear very quickly on that this bill was going to come in and come out the exact same way. Well, and I'm impressed. I'd like to understand why. If the end is that, let's just talk about political law. I'm sure I'm very proud of you, one of the first sponsors of the. Justice Act, the uh, need to take it down from Mount Sinai on Stone Town. Uh, might be other things that be incorporated. But I will say this uh, if there's not a bipartisan problem coming out of the House, it's very unlikely to be uh, accepted by the United States Senate and accepted by the party. If it's a totally partisan driven bill, uh, yeah, then you're making a point. Maybe let's put the most favorable uh, uh, interpretation. You're laying out a negotiated position for the Senate. Although what we saw today in the Senate suggests that they don't want to get to negotiation at all. 
uh, or you're trying to play political hard on well, an issue that we could come together. But uh, if it stays partisan, uh, then we're not going to end up with a lot of it. And I think the point you made in your remarks, Mr. Armstrong, which we made left the president's executive order is the only thing meaningful that comes out of the United States in later years, which I would regard as a tragedy for the institution. Uh, may well be on point. So, do you see any evidence that we have some bipartisan engagement? Hey, Mr. Mr. Cole, before uh, before the witnesses answer that question, may I make a request of everybody, especially those who are in the Rules Committee hearing room, um, uh, please uh, mute your line when somebody is speaking, because otherwise it echoes and it's hard to hear what you're saying. So. Um, I, I apologize for interfering and you proceed. Oh, that was probably my fault, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. Uh, I, on this bill, no, unfortunately, I don't. And I think I, I, I think you can't escape the political reality of not only what happens on our side, but what happened this morning uh, on the other side of the Capitol. I don't. I, I mean, you can't. We're in divided government right now, and if there was, I, I'll stand by what I said. And I just for the committees. Um, knowledge. Uh, this is what I used to do. Uh, I have represented a client in a excessive force case. That was my first interaction with qualified immunity. And I was appalled by the uh, <laughs> the lack of recourse to say my client had. I've also represented three officers in justifiable shootings and understand what they go through on a daily basis and in really intense situations. But no, I don't. I mean, I think I, I, I think the writings on the wall where this is going to end up and that really is unfortunate because i think there is really broad bipartisan support for significant reform but there's you're going to have guy i mean i will tell you the same thing i told the judiciary committee in the hearing not the markup my number one concern is how this works on the side of the road when backup is issued or backup is measured in hours and not minutes and i don't think we are having near enough of the consequences or conversations about what some of the unintended consequences of this legislation is for communities like mine let me give my friend Mr. Allison sort of an opportunity to take any more speech here today, but I would quickly like your thoughts on whether or not you think this uh, process has been handled that it will actually get us to where I think it all went out real long. Mr. Allison. I'm not hearing this as bad. Uh, well, Representative Cole, were you talking oh, to me? Sorry, you. I did yes, not. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just want to give you a chance to respond to that because the point obviously has been you made. Were wondering what? I think give you an opportunity to respond. We were making the point, or I was oh, making sure. the question to Mr. Armstrong, that it seems to have gotten off to a pretty partisan start, which doesn't make me very optimistic about where we're going to end up. It's passed something to the House. But sure. It won't get through the Senate or be signed by the President. Yeah, well, let, let me just tell you that we have been dealing with police issues and judiciary for a long time. And I, I think um, the representative is a new member, so he wasn't here in the last Congress when a lot of these discussions started taking place. And there were certainly individual discussions that took place leading up to our, uh, our hearing and our markup. Uh, so uh, although we might be partisan today, uh, I'm not convinced that we won't be we won't garner some votes uh, tomorrow. Well, you may get some votes, but if, if there's not a movement through the United States Senate, I don't have any doubt you can pass whatever legislation you want to across the House floor. Well, uh, I, I think there will be. I mean, I've had discussions over the weekend with Senator Scott. So I think we're that's going promising. to- I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I said oh, that's yes. promising. I'm glad, very glad to hear that. Uh, not only have I had discussions with Senator Scott, I've also had discussions with uh, Leader McCarthy. Good. Well, I, I take that as a promising Keep beginning. Hope alive. Pardon? Keep hope alive. <laughs> as long as you're in Congress and Mr. Armstrong's in Congress, I have a considerable amount of hope. I respect <laughs> anybody that was the Speaker of uh, the cha Legislative Chamber of the largest state in the Union. I know to get a job like that, pretty practical politician, you know how to get things done. So uh, I look forward to that. Let me just end with this, though, because, look, I, I have enormous respect for you as a lawmaker, for Mr. Armstrong as a lawmaker, 
Um, I know there's goodwill on both sides here. I've, I, you know, like like uh, you, certainly not my friend, Mr. Armstrong. I had served chance or chance to serve with Tim Scott. I like him a lot. I think he's a serious lawmaker, and I think he wants to get something done. So I think we've got a lot of good people in a lot of critical positions here. But I would just urge this: let's not let the moment pass. It's, Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, there is enough overlap between these two bills. I've had yes. enough discussion with my police officers in my district. I would tell you they probably have a very different view on qualified immunity than right. I've heard expressed here. I want to be honest about that. They certainly believe in a registry. They certainly have concerns about chokeholds. They certainly wonder why lynching wasn't always a federal crime. I can go down a whole list of things that we would all agree on that they would like to see happen. So I just uh, I will go through this, but at some point uh, the partisan logjam has to break, and people of goodwill have to negotiate something. I think the country needs that. I think the country wants that. I think it expects that of us. And uh, uh, woe be to us if we don't rise to that occasion and actually get that done. So I would just urge you, because you're going to be at the center of this debate. My friend Mr. Armstrong is, is one of the leading players on our side in this debate. I hope you guys keep talking, keep talking, but I'm worried. I'd be less than honest with you, but it's, I wasn't worried. When I see us head toward a tar partisan vote, I see a bill that my friend, uh, Mr. Scott, and the other side of the rotunda crafted in good faith block from coming for a hearing, then I start worrying that we could end up in a partisan gridlock. And I don't think that's good for the country. I don't think that's, I know that's not what you want to do. I think it's not what the legislative person. Uh, to know if you want something different, I uh, I pledge to work with you on that. I think Great. my colleagues want to do with it, do the same. Uh, but it's not going to be exactly the bill that was produced because that bill, in and of itself, as it is, will not pass the Senate, will not be signed. In the Senate. So, with that, uh, thank you both for your hard work. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this important hearing and uh, setting the right tone from the very beginning. I look forward to continuing to work with this. Uh, and you know, work with you on this as we go forward. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I would now yield to uh, the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Judge Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was unmuting. It's very difficult for me to speak on this particular issue, Mr. Chairman. At 83 years of age, the oldest person participating uh, today uh, in the Rules Committee, and knowing the awesome and marvelous work that the chairwoman of the Congressional uh, Black Caucus uh, uh, put into this bill, as well as my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus and our and members of, of the Democratic Caucus and none um, uh, uh, more important than the Speaker of the House of Representatives who uh, supports this measure of, of vigorously. All of this comes about, in my judgment, because of repeated instances of Black people being brutalized by the police. Now, like our, our, our friend Mr. Armstrong, I too have represented police officers um, after being removed from the uh, federal judiciary and returning to the practice of law, I represented um, a police officers association. Um, it serves no particular purpose, um, but I do hurry to say that Two of my best friends are uh, chiefs of police, uh, 
and one of our um, heralded uh, persons that worked on this measure uh, is Val Demons, who was the chief of police um, in Orlando, Florida. When my really, really good friend, Mr. Cole, speaks about us ending in gridlock, which leads to something none of us want. And I know ignoring the dog whistle of this president, who Saturday night in Mr. Cole's home state reiterated that he was the law and order president. I've seen and heard that phrase for mm -hmm. all of my cognizant years, uh, either by local officials, state officials, and federal officials, including former presidents of the United States and countless candidates who ran uh, for national office. But you need to understand that many of us have experienced, and I speak for myself, I've seen Klan burnings in my home town of Altamont Springs, Florida. I've seen a man hanging from a tree, black man, that I knew outside of my home city. I've seen countless men, we even told stories about men who went to pick oranges in Imperial Polk County, Florida, three of them, and they all disappeared. I lived the era of Harry T. Moore and Harriet Moore's Christmas Day bombing no further than 40 miles from my home and the terror that that wreaked all throughout that era. I witnessed the humiliation of my mother and my father going to the back of a car to relieve themselves because they couldn't relieve themselves at a filling station, and then finding themselves at the behest of the police arrested in North Carolina, all of my daddy's money all taken from me. Me left in the car at age 11, waiting, not knowing if they were going to be returned um, uh, on that particular day. I've been slapped twice, once in a grocery store by a white man, they called me nigger. And I was slapped in a filling station because my father and I were driving his boss's car home and we were outside Savannah and went to the filling station and I didn't see the colored sign. The man slapped me and urine went all down my little jeans. But I had sense enough not to tell my dad because I knew that both of us would have died uh, uh, right there. I've ridden in the back of countless buses, going to school on the train, being humiliated. And I could go on and on and on. But when President Trump, who is 10 years my junior, speaks of, of our heritage, I would ask him to return to 1619 and speak of all of our heritage. And I'd ask all of you here 
those that are going to speak tomorrow, and those that I hope may conference um, uh, once this bill passes and Mr. Scott's bill in the Senate passes and come to their senses about where we are in this nation. Generation Z may very well save us, but I do know this from experience, having enumerated just less than 3% of my life experiences with race. I do know this, we aren't going to go back and you're going to see significant change. And it isn't just centered around uh, the police. The disparities are too great for us to continue as the great country that we are without us being cognizant and mindful of our responsibilities to each other as human beings on this uh, planet. I return to the fact that I told you that I represented police officers. I also have so many experiences where I represented people that were brutalized, killed by police officers. I could go on and on and I won't. And tomorrow I'll try to restrain myself. But Karen, thank you. I thank the members of the Congressional Black Caucus who led in this particular measure. I thank all decent thinking members of the House of Representatives and the United States Senate who know our history and some could tell even more um, morose stories uh, during um, uh, this particular period. We made incredible progress, but we've left so many people behind and we cannot continue that way. We're on the verge of losing our democracy. And the person more responsible for that than anybody is Donald John Trump. The speeches that he makes are divisive. And he talks to children as he did yesterday in Arizona. And why was he in Arizona in a crowded place when we are experiencing a pandemic and he had to know it didn't take Mr. Fauci or Ms. Berkman to tell him that you put crowd people in a room like that and you're gonna have somebody that's gonna leave out of there sick and doubtless somebody that's going to die. That's not necessary any more than it wasn't necessary for Willis B. McCall to shoot people in Lake County, um, uh, one of whom I happen um, uh, to have known. It wasn't enough that my grandmama, who is as white as anybody white listening, um, uh, had um, um, uh, to have a, a white man brutalized. And when people tell me to go back to Africa, I want to know, am I supposed to stop off in Europe and get the rest of my ancestors? Uh, with all of the confusion that we have sown in this nation, we owe it more to ourselves not just as members of the Rules Committee, not just members of the United States Congress, but as members of God's green earth, we owe it to ourselves to be better people. We owe it to ourselves. I yield back. I thank my colleague for his powerful statement. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. The Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is is uh, Ms. Bass still with us? Yeah. She's, she's there, yeah. The, Ms. Bass, you may not uh, remember it. Seems like the time has flown uh, uh, by. It was 10 years ago uh, uh, this year that you and I first uh, met. Uh, we were at the Harvard uh, 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 seminar trying to get new members of Congress uh, with their feet wet. And I remember all of the high hopes that we had there, Republicans and Democrats, of, of all the different things we were going to do. Now, you represented about 10% of the Democratic class that, uh, that year. I represented about 1% of the Republican uh, class that year. But we had, uh, we had such big uh, uh, 
hopes and, and expectations of what our service would be. And, and I have no doubt that as you sit in that chair today, uh, even though it has been 10 years in the making, uh, that you feel uh, that uh, for a time such as this, uh, you have been placed in a position uh, such as this. And I, I'm, I'm grateful to you for, for, uh, for putting yourself in that position. Thank you. Um, I was listening uh, to my friend, Mr. Hastings, uh, thanking people for all of their work because you don't put together something like this uh, overnight. You put it together with a lot of, uh, a lot of hands and a lot of uh, effort. Uh, a lot of hand wringing, no doubt, because uh, something uh, everyone who talks about this talks about the the very difficult conversations that have to be have to be had. Um, and and he put uh, credit exactly where I would put uh, credit uh, with your leadership on the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, uh, with uh, folks on the Judiciary Committee, all the way up to the to the Speaker of the House herself, in, in terms of of that work. But he didn't mention a single Republican in that entire list. He did recognize that that uh, that he hoped that thoughtful and decent people across the House would be able to participate. And I have no doubt that that he considers me in that uh, category. That's a fairly low bar, and I, so I know I'm, I know I'm going to get in on that uh, on that bar. Uh, but Mr. McGovern said meaningful and structural change can't. Wait. The thing I've gotten, uh, I, I get excited about as a as a Republican with a Republican in the White House, is voting to override vetoes, right? Because that's where we demonstrate that it's about Article One. It's not about who's in the White House. It's about us and the people we represent. And so, anytime we've got an opportunity to override a veto, as we did uh, with uh, uh, Russia just a few years uh, ago, I get excited about that. If we recognize, as I think Mr. Hastings very uh, eloquently laid out, that he did not believe that he could count on the president's support at this juncture for this legislation. Are we being short-sighted by not building the bipartisan coalition today? If we've got to get two-thirds of the House on board to override a veto, aren't we uh, at risk of getting to a point where it's too late to reach out to folks like Mr. Armstrong, who agree with you that qualified immunity needs uh, instruction, uh, needs a, a, a consideration, isn't it going to? Uh, it, are you worried that that moving this product in the complete absence of that partnership, not accepting a single Republican ID, even some of the low hanging fruit, uh, 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 threatens that? Because again, I, McGovern said meaningful structural change can't wait. I know you agree with that. I know so many of us agree with that, your leadership is essential to making this happen. I'd like to, to view it through your through your lens. Sure, well, let me just say that uh, we are in the process now. I have faith we will have bipartisan support. I know it will pass out of the House on Thursday, but I don't view that as the end of the process at all. As I mentioned to you, I've been in conversation with my Republican colleagues and I look forward to getting to know Mr. Armstrong. I don't know him, he's a new member. I listened to his presentation today and I know I'm gonna make certain that I reach out to him right away. In the best of all worlds, it would have been wonderful if it started this way, but it didn't. And you know, I, I think that we have been very, very quick in the house to respond to an emergency, a crisis that is taking place in our country people who are protesting in 50 states. How embarrassing is it that people are protesting for the human rights in the United States around the world? I listened to my colleague, he's so eloquent, Mr. Hastings, the judge. I listened to him talk about the story of his life. I think, you know, for me, I started, in, I was involved in this issue. My involvement began 47 years ago. <laughs> 47 years ago, I started working on this issue, and I know that people, African Americans and others, have worked on this issue for generations before me. So we're in an a inflection moment in our country right now, but I don't think it all ends and rides on today and tomorrow. I want to continue this process, and I believe that we will eventually get there. And if we had two-thirds support, that would be wonderful. But I believe that we're going to eventually put a bill on the president's desk that we won't have to worry about a veto override, because I know my Republican colleagues are going to make sure 
that when we do reach that bipartisan consensus, that they will ensure that we will get a signature when we put it on the president's desk. Well, certainly, as I've been looking at uh, at Tim Scott's leadership on uh, on our side of the aisle, and, and we think of Mr. Armstrong as one of the one of the leaders. If there's anybody in the Republican conference who knows more about rural law enforcement uh, than Mr. Armstrong, I don't know who it uh, is. Whenever we have uh, need a subject matter expert, we will go and and knock on his uh, door, as uh, as uh, uh, Senator Scott has done uh, as well. Um, I believe we can get to that. Uh, I believe we can get to that place uh, too. Uh, I. I know that that when one is responding to crisis, one must be quick, uh, and uh, and I recognize uh, those uh, those needs. I I also recognize that what you and I have seen in uh, many too many times in our ten years together here, uh, which is that sometimes things move beyond that policy level that we came here to be a part of, of fixing and move to that political uh, level, and and nothing could be more destructive to uh, our nation at this time, I don't believe, uh, than having this uh, become a, the uh, the political issue that some people benefit from as opposed to the policy issue that everyone uh, can benefit uh, uh, from. And, and I know you I know you share that. Um, I wanted to ask one uh, well, question. Well, my friend, Mr. Woodall, yield for judge. I'd be happy to yield to, to the judge. Yeah, very quickly, um, you, you uh, uh, were not listening um, uh, when I spoke, um, and not to mention uh, just the one individual. It is that Mr. Scott on the Senate side, um, I did um, I mention the fact that his legislation um, uh, will doubtless uh, in conference uh, along uh, uh, with the legislation led by the distinguished chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, and I agree with her um, uh, that some good um, uh, uh, will come of it. Um, but I, uh, I did mention, uh, Mr. Scott, and I did mention uh, his legislation that I'm hopeful when uh, they do have a conference, when I'm we here. ever get back to regular order in this place, uh, that we would be able to come up with uh, a bill that even this president could sign. The, I will stipulate that I unintentionally uh, mischaracterized the gentleman's remarks if he will stipulate that I am always listening uh, when Alcy Hastings is speaking uh, in the Rules Committee. We all are. <laughs> but thank you for that, Ms. Bass. Um, the, the chairman mentioned, uh, Ms. Bass, in one of his uh, comments that 99% of killings by police don't result in a charge. Yes. I recognize that statement made in the negative. When I think about your bill to end brutality, to end profiling, to bring accountability, I suppose I want to aspire to that statistic. Um, it, it is, is that statistic in and of itself a failure or is it, uh, it's a, is it a failure of the way we're holding people accountable today that makes it a failure? And you would hope that in the future we can also have 99 percent of of, uh, of of killings uh, not have to result in a charge but because uh while we didn't want them to happen they happened uh, uh by the book and within the bounds of our of, of the rule of law not outside of it well you know one of the things that i'm excited about about the bill is that when when we are able to get there i believe that the bill will significantly reduce killings because if you look at the reason why a lot of killings happen, I mean, one of the problems that we've faced in our country is that we've pulled so many resources away from cities and counties. And you know, you hear this from police officers every day. I didn't join the police force to be a social worker. Why am I dealing with marital problems? Why am I dealing with homelessness and poverty? And so one of the things that the bill does do is that it provides grants to communities so that they can begin to look at some of these issues. I'm sure that some of the reasons why people died at the hands of law enforcement was legitimate. But anytime you have a 99% of anything, that's certainly suspect. And we know because of certain things in the law that it makes it virtually impossible to even, number one, bring charges, and then number two, successfully prosecute. I thought the world was going to change in 1992 when there was a video camera there for Rodney King's beating. 
I thought the world was going to change when cell phone cameras were invented and it was documented because the 20 years before Rodney King that I worked on this issue, we didn't have any videotape and no one ever believed us. It was always the same answer. But why does it always happen in certain communities and in other communities it doesn't? And so I think that one, the bill goes a long way to prevent the fact that there would be dangerous encounters with law enforcement. And then two, when there are, that the officers will be held accountable. One of the other things that I think is so important about the bill is that you would think that law enforcement, and I know from talking to the chiefs and the other union, the Fraternal Order of Police, that they support the idea of national standards and accreditation. I think that the majority of police officers are professional. They don't want to work with corrupt people. They don't want to work with violent folks. They want their profession reject, uh, accepted, respected, and uplifted. And I believe that this bill lifts the profession up. If you have to have accreditation to have your hair cut, shouldn't you have to have accreditation and standards to carry a gun and to have the power to enforce the law? Well, you mentioned uh, uh, the the desire that folks be viewed with respect instead of uh, suspicion uh, in your opening statement. And you were referring to, to you and me as, as citizens. I believe our police officers want that very same thing uh, to be viewed with respect instead of uh, suspicion. And yes, uh, when you have a bad ankle in your, in your ranks. I respect the police officers, but I'm afraid of them. I'm afraid of them because I don't know if my encounter with the police officer, if I'm gonna survive. What kind of way is that to feel? It's better now that I'm a little older, I'm a member of Congress, but you know what? Trauma holds with you. <laughs> you carry that trauma around. Yeah. Mr. Armstrong, one thing that you kept uh, mentioning is that, uh, that there is a difference uh, when, when backup is hours away instead of, of, of minutes uh, away. Uh, uh, that's something that doesn't speak to any of us who live in uh, suburban or urban uh, environments. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you meant by that? Yeah, and thank you for the question. And by the way, there's a difference in how you train use of force. If you're a 250 pound ex college football linebacker who's a highway patrolman and you're stopping a 115 pound defendant versus being a 115 pound highway patrol woman stopping a 250 pound former linebacker who's a defendant. And I mean, just we deal with this, and it's particularly our rural sheriffs and our rural highway patrols. And you will deal with situations where when you make a stop on the side of the road, you have your closest backup is a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour away. And that is just the reality of those situations. And I think when we start talking about how we do these things, it would behoove us to actually have a conversation of how we, how, when we are, I mean, and, and Ms. Bass just said, why does this happen in some communities and not other communities? I can tell you one of the reasons we don't use a lot of no-knock warrants in North Dakota is because everybody pheasant hunts and goose hunts. Uh, I mean, it, it's no real like serious issue in policing. It's that cops understand that if they walk into a house and don't announce themselves in North Dakota, there's a real decent shot, chance they're going to have T shot coming through the door back at them. But we have a very strict standard now. I wish it would be a little more standard on no-knock warrants in North Dakota, but we have a dual standard. But when you deal with these issues and you try and deal with them at, 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 at a national level, you need to recognize that there are departments, even as far as national accreditation, how those rules get written are very important. Uh, we have open police departments, or open, open deputy positions, open law enforcement positions in just about every department in North Dakota. They're very small. They're very deal, I mean, dealing with it. What we do is we co-op with other departments to you know, deal with training, deal with those issues. How are we going to implement those things? Are we going to allow those people to serve prior to their accreditation? Or are they going to have to wait until there's eight people across the western part of North Dakota that can go to the class together? So it's cost effective. We don't have these are real important conversations to have. And it's not that I am disparaging anything that is going on in the bill at all, because I, there are, like I said, I mean, there are real issues. Um, one thing to think about here is, I mean, if you have 19 different violations and you finally wash out of a police department there i mean you could end up in one of my communities and we don't want that to happen either 
we don't want a bad cop in North Dakota because they finally washed out after however many different chances they had in a different police department. We recognize those things. So they're real good things to work on, but we need to recognize how this is going to affect areas that come from all over the country. I don't have those personal experiences. I would never pretend to have the experiences Ms. Baz or the judge have had. Uh, what I do care about and I have a passion for, and it's dispassionate, is real criminal justice reform that works across all jurisdictions at every level of these places. And there, and we are going to continue these other conversations. But I, I may be new, but I'm, I guess maybe, maybe, maybe it's been 10 years in a criminal courtroom representing defendants, but I'm a little more skeptical as to where this ends up in, in the near future, which I find unfortunate because I think there's more consensus here than people think. And I really do, so. When you suggested in your testimony that, that uh, three weeks from now, we might find ourselves at the executive order is the only thing that has, has changed the, uh, the law of the land. I think that struck a chord with, uh, with so many people at the dais because nobody wants that to be the, to be the outcome. And, and candidly, uh, uh, we are where we are uh, today in terms of what process has brought us here. Uh, but seeing uh, you with your experience uh, wanting to achieve as much as you can for criminal justice of re reform, seeing Ms. Bass and her leadership having already produced uh, so much in this bill, uh, it uh, uh, we use the word hope uh, flippantly sometimes, uh, Ms. Bass, but it really does uh, give me uh, give me hope. And I thank you both. Uh, occasionally, we have two witnesses at the, the Rules Committee witness table that sucked the hope right out of me, uh, but that is not the case uh, today, and I'm grateful. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Torres. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and uh, thank you, Congresswoman, um, Chairwoman, Karen Bass uh, for bringing um, this bill before us. Um, some of you know that I worked as a 911 dispatcher for 17 and a half years. Um, during that time, I answered thousands of calls um, from victims of crime. I was the calming voice at the other end of that line for people during their most vulnerable moments, reassuring them that it would be okay, telling them help is on the way, telling them the police would be there soon to help them, to protect them. So you can imagine the disgust that I felt at seeing someone in that same position of trust that I dispatch thousands of times before, time and time again, an officer of the peace who would use their authority to target to maim, to murder the very people that they swore to protect. It's unconceivable. Yet, there is, there it is in plain view, captured on video. And we have to, we have, we have to re relive those very painful moments, those incidents over and over again on social media and in the news. I had to force myself to watch that video. When Mr. Floyd died for his mom, he didn't call his mom. He was calling me because I'm a mom too. He activated every woman across America to look in the mirror and to ask the question, is this the best that we could do? Is this the definition of protect and serve? Anyone who thinks that George Floyd's death was an isolated incident is ignoring the fact that before George Floyd, it was Breonna Taylor. And before Breonna, there was Amelie Arbery. And before him, it was some other mourning mother's child in plain view for all of us to witness over and over and over again. Anyone who claims that this is just a few bad apples is ignoring the root cause of the problem. The fact 
that in the short time since George Floyd's murder, Rayshard Brooks, another unarmed black man, was killed by an officer sworn to protect us. To say that this is completely unacceptable falls short of just how egregious and dire the situation is. Police officers must be held accountable to the same laws, the same laws that they enforce, period. Black Americans, brown Americans must feel safe from discriminatory policing. They need to be safe from this horrible behavior. So the bill that we are discussing today, the Justice in Policing Act, is long overdue and urgently needed to start addressing systemic racism in law enforcement. It reforms qualified immunity so anyone who faces discriminatory policing or excessive force has an avenue for recourse. It has to be skin in the game for everyone. And officers are victims of crime too. I can share with you many stories of officers, one man units, stopping a carload of gang members and holding them at gunpoint while backup was long ways away. This bill ensures that everyone is thinking about human life and the value of human life. It creates a national police misconduct registry to track officer misconduct. This is something that I had requested of the committee and it improves training and practices to make sure officers are properly prepared for the situations we ask them to address and much more. Justice for the black and brown communities who face discrimination and racism since this nation's founding starts with the, syst the systemic reforms in this bill. It's not going to end there. We know that. We need to be clear eyed about the extent of this threat, which is why I'm asking for the 2006 FBI report on white supremacists infiltrating law enforcement. That report needs to be made public and brought up to date. If the FBI was learning about white supremacist infiltration 14 years ago, those individuals could hold top ranking positions now. <laughs> they are the supervisors now. They are the trainers, oh, sure. the captains. They are the chiefs of police. We need to know that. Just this past Monday, the Department of Justice announced charges against a US Army soldier accused of planning an attack on his own US Army unit by sending sensitive details about their location and security to a neo-Nazi and radically motivated violent extremist group. So this threat is real and it must be rooted out. And we can't forget to address a wound that cuts back for generations. We must invest in programs that help communities of color advance right now. You know, in 2000, when I was first elected to the local city council in my city, I began to address those issues for our young people. When I learned that the Pomona City Council had passed a law banning skateboarding, as an example, from the Civic Center, because it was a liability problem for them, but they gave no other recourse for the youth in our community to skateboard safely. I focus and over two years saved enough money to build a skate park. But that wasn't enough. Our teens needed a teen center, a place where they with a couch and a, maybe a snack that could be utilized after school with computers 
and assistance to help them do their homework and focus on other things. We had a very high teen suicide rate in my home city at the time. And high school graduations were not very, you know, high. It was a pipeline to our prison system. That's why those programs were a priority. I understood that having a man with a gun in uniform in every corner of our city wasn't public safety. And our officers understood that that wasn't public safety and they demanded more too. From equity and education to access to healthcare, to fair housing practices, the true test of this moment is about recognizing that these are all forms of discrimination and violence too. We can't end with, with these injustices and expect to succeed with just one bill. We have to end them all. We have to address all of it. I commend my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee for getting us this far. I look forward to supporting this bill. I do have a question for Representative um, Bass, and that is, um, have you um, or the Black Caucus reached out to FLETSI, the Federal Law Enforcement uh, Training Center, um, to, see, to seek their assistance in helping us train the next generation of police officers. You see, we have a five-year-old at home who wants to be a police officer, but I want him to be the good guy. Absolutely, well, thank you, Representative Torres. And let me assure you that we have absolutely had that outreach. We had that outreach in the development of the bill and I know many of my colleagues have raised concerns that it's great to say you want to have training, but what will the quality be? What will the standards be? And so we have done that. That's also, by the way, a very important issue for the National Association of Police Chiefs, um, in, including the fraternal order of police officers who have said, you know, we have 18,000 police departments around the country and they've been fighting for accreditation and standards on a retail basis. They'll never get around to 18,000 police departments. And so the idea that we could pass this bill and those standards would be in place and accreditation would be in place helps everyone. It ups lift the, per 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 the profession, it helps and protects the community and uh, everyone benefits. So thank you for the question. It is. It is professionalizing the profession, which, exactly. is, which is something that I have also been fighting for, for the 911 dispatchers that are often the first point of contact. And, you know, I, I absolutely agree with many of, of my colleagues that have stated, we, officers should not be responding to certain types of calls. Right. Absolutely not. But when we cut, CDBG, for example, mm -hmm. you know, when I was first elected to local um, city council, we had a dispute resolution center mm -hmm. where we can direct people that were having the arguments with their neighbors, a dispute over property line, over loud music and loud parties. They can go there and, and speak to a counselor should they choose to do that. We don't have those things anymore. And by defunding a lot of the healthcare programs and mental health programs, we have left no other recourse for people who are concerned about quality of life issues, having a homeless person set up camp in front of their home, having a business person having to set up um, having to deal with the security costs associated with that. You know, at, LA, at LAPD, we used to have, and I don't know if they still do, but it was a, a unit that would come in at 5 a.m. Their purpose was to wake up the homeless people from the front of, of the businesses downtown. Yeah. You know, you know, where is the priority 
in, in, in housing policies that could prevent someone from becoming homeless so that the officers don't have to expose themselves to that. You know, there are 13 police officers, by the way, that have been killed um, while serving a no-knock uh, warrant since 1980. 13 officers, their life matter too, you know. And to my colleagues or to anyone, you know, who might be offended by the term Black Lives Matter. And this goes out to, you know, my, my former colleagues at the police department. We're not saying your life doesn't matter. It does matter. We're saying That I'll yield back. Mr. Burgess. Yeah. Great, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, thanks to our witnesses for being here. Mr. Armstrong was referenced that many of the uh, issues that were before the Judiciary Committee had come up previously in previous con Congresses, but this is your first term. So as a new member, and I'm constantly reminded of this, uh, sometimes we do forget. It seems like we've been after something for so long and it's been argued so many different ways and so many different times that uh, all, all it's, all, everything's already been said and we just need to go on with the, uh, with the lawmaking. But I really appreciated what you said, that it's, some of this is new to you. It's the first time that's come across the threshold uh, in your service on the committee. And, you know, it's not lost on me that, okay, there's two proposals in play. Um, there are some overlapping policies and, and, and you alluded to the fact that there might be more consensus than people think. Did, did I hear you correctly when, when you said that? So as a new member, Somebody who's obviously very thoughtful about this and, and worked in this area for a long time. Were you or your, your ranking member, Mr. Jordan, how, how much were you consulted in the drafting of the bill? Committee? None. <laughs> I mean, we weren't. I mean, and that's just the truth. Since then, have there been any conversations about evaluating the uh, perhaps the best policies of the two proposals that are before the House and Senate right now, but the pulling up those things that be put together to actually become law? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, has, has, uh, and you may have done this at Judiciary Committee, but done a side-by-side, -side, enumerating the differences between the two proposals that are before us? Um, I have, like personally in my office, but I haven't seen it anywhere else. Okay. Would, would you share a couple of those with us? Yeah, I mean, I think one just as far as, I mean, obviously the other one doesn't deal with qualified immunity. Um, I think that is mostly out of a context of how we get to reform is uh, difficult. I think you'll get people, a lot of people who will say that qualified immunity even if you get rid of it, you have to replace it with something. I mean, we have to have that conversation. Uh, the distinction on best practices versus very specific towards, you know, no knocks and um, and uh, uh, chokeholds is different. Uh, there is a police accountability in both of them. I think that is an area where, even though they're they're different, it would be very. I, I think that that is an area where we could get to a real easy compromise. You know, we heard people talking about the National Registry, and I was the one who said, I don't want those cops in North Dakota either, right? But, I mean, just very different things as to what actually goes into that and whether it's public or private becomes an important concern. I can tell you that you are going to have, regardless regardless of how you view anything else that goes on, the vast majority of complaints against police officers from one end of this country to the other are completely unfounded. I, I mean, that is just the truth. Uh, and so how you treat that complaint, whether it's adjudicated or not, becomes important. 
But so there are areas where, I mean, I think there's real significant chances to work. And then there's real areas that I think uh, take some serious, serious policy making to make sure that we get past what could be significant unintended consequences. Yeah, and that uh, that last issue on the the database um, in healthcare, going back in the 1980s, uh, the creation of the National Practitioner Data Bank, and when the, that occurred, I will confess I wasn't exactly thrilled about it for exactly the reasons you just mentioned that it becomes pretty easy to accuse and then tie someone up and uh, next thing you know, you, you know your life is altered and you really haven't done anything wrong. On the other hand, you're also exactly right. You don't want the lowest common denominator being the only one that's showing up in jurisdictions in North Dakota. And, and I certainly sympathize with that as well. And one of the ways, of course, that was dealt with at the National Practitioner Data Bank that's administered through HRSA over at the Department of HHS. Um, and I know there was some controversy at the time that not just anyone could query the National Practitioner Data Bank. There had to be a legitimate reason to uh, to, to file that. Um, but I think that over time, it's demonstrated its worth in that <clears throat> you, you prevent someone in a, in a physician's case, someone who's really not doing a good job, you keep them from repeating that performance in community after community looking for a new place to land. So it, yeah, I think it's a, it is a good idea and it's one that does have to be constructed carefully. And I think it's gonna take input from, you know, both House and Senate and, and both Republican and Democratic stakeholders. I, I don't see any other way to arrive at the proper answer there. And yeah, and I think a couple things in both sides in the Senate and the House that are important. Now there's some factors that come into play, but I mean, both agree, I mean, with body cameras, particularly for law enforcement or federal law enforcement, I think most of us would agree if we can figure out a way in which we can pay, help pay for it, the communities pay for it, the more transparency in every law enforcement is better. It's important to recognize that the storage for body or for body cameras costs typically a hundred times more than the actual body camera. But I, I mean, there's real places where we can come together. So it, it's a little unfortunate that we're not. <laughs> well, hope springs eternal that uh, we may in fact do that before this process is ended. I agree with my ranking member, Mr. Cole. Um, I don't think this product in front of us today is gonna to be, become law, but I'm, I'm hopeful that something will. And I thank everyone involved and I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to uh, yield to Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I say to Dr. Burgess and to Mr. Cole, uh, if there's anybody who can uh, craft legislation on a difficult subject like this, it is Karen Bass. Uh, she is one of the best legislators I've ever seen, and I've been doing this a while now. And her willingness to listen to everybody, to work with anybody, to get involved with groups that she may not uh, particularly share a lot of uh, things in common, but a willingness to work with them and listen to them uh, gives me a lot of hope. And I think Tim Scott it does the same kind of thing. And I'm so, you know, to have a, a bill that, that my Republican colleagues might think is perfect today, well, that's not the legislative process. This is going to work out. And I, I just want to, uh, I did do a side by side um, as to the, the House bill, the Senate bill, the executive order, and then Colorado actually passed very uh, substantial legislation uh, just in the last few weeks. And, you know, the, the bill that we have before us addresses prosecution of police misconduct qualified immunity reform, which I think is a very serious subject that has to be addressed. Pattern and practice investigations. Is this something that's gone on for a long time? The heck is going on? Uniform standards, police misconduct, police reporting on use of force. And I would say to Mr. Armstrong, you know, I'm a white male from suburban Denver, so I don't have the experiences of Mr. Hastings, or uh, maybe you, uh, 
Mr. Armstrong up in, uh, you know, Bismarck or Fargo, which are, there are a lot of similarities with what we do in Colorado, but they're certainly not the same. So I respect that. But as somebody just watching headlines and seeing more and more and more officer involved shootings, officer involved deaths of individuals, and then seeing that these are disproportionately affecting people of color and the brown communities and the black communities, uh, you know that something's got to be done and something is wrong. And we had some major discussions in the Colorado area after uh, Eric Garner and uh, some of the um, protests and, and activism that came from there. And you know, again, we then have uh, George Floyd and so many others. It goes on and on and on. This has to be addressed right now. And I'm, I'm very uh, hopeful that uh, uh, Chairwoman Bass can get it done. So bans racial and religious profiling, bans chokeholds and carotid holds, which are just so dangerous. Uh, use, of form, uh, use of force reforms and training, which is what Ms. Torres was talking about stops militarizing law enforcement. I mean, we've seen over the course of the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, just continued escalation of, uh, of uh, lethal power. And on both sides, you know, maybe the, the criminals and then coupled with the law enforcement and it results in a lot of death, body cameras, Bans no-knock warrants, makes lynching a federal crime, which should have been done a long time ago. I just, there is overlap with the Senate bill, Mr. Cole, and I, little overlap on pattern and practice, a little overlap on standards, a little overlap on police misconduct, little overlap on police reporting on use of force, a little overlap on banning racial and religious profiling, a little overlap on banning chokeholds, um, then they're both identical, I think, on lynching should be a federal crime. So there is a lot of overlap, but neither one, and there's going to have to be compromise, obviously. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Bass. Can you tell us, you, you've mentioned you've had some conversations uh, with the Senate and with different organizations. Can you just elaborate on that a touch and then I, after that I'll yield back. Sure, uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, actually in, in many of my conversations, you summed up the overlap and, and I would say for my uh, colleague who asked about the side-by-side, -side, we do have a side-by-side. -side. I have looked at it very carefully and um, I, I feel like several of the categories that you described Mr. Perlmutter are exactly right, but what the problem is, is the details. And I think that what the hundreds of thousands of people in the streets are calling for in 50 states in our union is transformative change, significant change, change that comes with enforcement. It is one thing to say that chokeholds are banned, which is what happens in the Justice and Policing Act, it is another thing to say that you shouldn't use a chokehold unless the officer is in danger of their life, which is the problem because that's what is said every time someone is killed. Even when someone is running away from a police officer and they're shot in the back, the police officer will say they were in danger of their life. And so to pass a bill now and for it not to have substantive change in it I think would be, well, I think it completely misses the mark, but I also think it would be disingenuous at this point in time. And, and I don't mean to say that my colleague in the other house is intentionally that way. We're going to get together. We're going to get together very soon. But we have to, what gets on the president's desk has got to be significant. And so that's just an example of some of the differences. There are overlaps. There are some things that are not addressed in our bill uh, at all because it's actually a different jurisdiction. But, um, but I think that there's enough there for us to begin negotiation. 
but we really needed to respond quickly. We couldn't take months to do this, and that's what we've done. And I'm 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 looking forward to it moving forward. Well, and it isn't as if uh, this hasn't been something that's needed, that's not needed addressing for hundreds of years, actually. And it isn't like it's a new subject. So moving quickly, and you know, I it just I can talk about Colorado. We've had dozens and dozens of peaceful protests, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the streets, um, mostly social distancing, actually, uh, but heartfelt day in day out demands to reduce the violence that we see with law enforcement encounters and to stop the injustice that continues to rear its ugly head again and again and again. So your quick action is appreciated, but these are things that have been uh, discussed for a long time. So Mr. Armstrong, these are not new matters. And as a criminal defense lawyer, you know that. So I would just yield back to the chair. I wanna thank both witnesses uh, for their testimony today. This has to be addressed. It has to be addressed now and it's gotta have teeth. And so I yield back. Thank you, Mrs. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Hastings, you had a very powerful testimony and I feel really badly for what happened to you and what's happened to others. And I hope you know that I am sincere in that. Um, I, I have to oppose um, this particular bill, however. I am on the Judiciary Committee, and as I've said to Representative Bass publicly before, I respect her, I think she works hard, and there are portions of her bill that I can support and other Republicans can support, and I believe that President Trump can support. However, there are other portions of her bill that I cannot support. And it's not just because I think that, it's because I talked to numerous different law enforcement officers and police chiefs in my congressional district. And these law officers I talked to and police chiefs had various backgrounds. Uh, some of them had worked in the DEA, some of them had worked in SWAT. Um, some of them were patrol officers. So they had quite a, a variety of experiences. And they just said that some of these provisions, like getting rid of qualified immunity the way that this bill does, would totally undermine the ability of police to do their job because they said that there are many life and death situations, decisions that law enforcement officers have to make in a very short period of time. And if they have to think that they're going to be personally sued for their behaviors, they really believe that the police will not do it and they will not get engaged and perhaps save someone's life. They also said they're already having problems recruiting police officers. Police officers' morale is low because of all the vilification of police officers across the nation. You've seen it. You've seen some of these um, protesters that are not peaceful. There's some protesters that are not peaceful. They're right in the face of police officers. They're shining flashlights in their eyes. They're throwing bricks at them. They're saying nasty things to them. Um, so that's one of the problems. The other question I asked um, some of the police officers and police chiefs I talked to was about the banning in the bill of no-knock warrants. And they said that in their experience that they want people to know, the public to know, that this is just not something they do. They have to go to a court and get a warrant for no knock. And in some instances, it's needed, especially when they know that there's huge drug cartels that they're trying to bust. And they know that these drug cartels have tons of weapons. So they need the element of surprise for two reasons. 
The first reason is so that the police officers and SWAT teams don't get slaughtered by knocking first and then having tons of gunfire against them. And the second reason is so that the evidence, the drug evidence is not disposed of uh, if you knock on the door and say, hey, police. Um, the third thing that they were concerned about, and the, I'm just bringing up a few of the things they were concerned about, is actually the banning of choke, outright banning of chokeholds and carotid holds. Um, because in Arizona, they have said this is a lethal, like it's a last option, lethal force option. It's considered lethal force. But at least it's an option because if you take away that option, then the police officer, if they are in a situation where they feel they have to shoot someone, that will be the only option left. And it will actually have the opposite effect of what we're trying to do. And um, the other issue that came up was about the military surplus, law enforcement getting military sur surplus. And this is what the police chief said in my district. Now I live in a fairly urban district. Um, now I've heard from rural law enforcement that they really need the surplus military goods because they can't afford to buy these equipment. But from my urban people, they wanted you to know that we have flash floods in Arizona. It happens during the monsoon season, which has started. And it rains and all of a sudden there's these flash floods that happened. And they need some of these military equipment. They called it AMRAP. I don't know what that is, but apparently a big vehicle that they need to go into a flood to rescue people. They also said that one of the police chiefs said they've gotten a bear cat. I assume that means caterpillar, I'm not sure. But they said they need that to open up roadways um, after a flood. And so that this equipment isn't just used like, you know, to go against people in a military fashion, it's actually used for common sense um, things to help people and that they couldn't afford to get this equipment without using the military surplus. So my question for Mr. Armstrong is, Mr. Armstrong, do you have you also heard from law enforcement and from your experience do you believe that some of the portions of this bill including getting rid of limited immunity the way that this bill does um, banning no-knock warrants totally banning chokeholds would actually undermine police's ability to do their job Thank you for the question. And yes, I do. And I think that's kind of part. I mean, the problem isn't that we have no knock warrants. The problem is in some places they're used when they shouldn't be. The problem isn't that we have military equipment. We have bloods, floods and blizzards and all of those different things in North Dakota. The problem is, is when you use that military equipment to serve a warrant on a nonviolent or you use that military equipment. That, that's the point to these conversations. And it's important. The problem isn't that, I mean, this is my personal opinion. There's a very differing, there are varying differing, differing opinions amongst Republicans on qualified immunity uh, that go absolutely, obviously on both ends of the spectrum. I fall somewhere in the middle where I absolutely recognize that it needs reform, but just an outright repeal of it causes it a whole different set of problems. And that's what we're talking about. We need, I mean, these, these things and for rural law enforcement, like you were talking in these equipments and also with how qualified immunity go, works, we, I mean, these things need, I'm not saying we should wait forever and I'm not saying we should do this, but I, I like I said before, we could have had a hearing on every single one of these things in the week leading up to those things, because I think there are real questions that need to be answered. And when you get, once you get to a point, like I said, I don't think, I mean, for the most part, I don't think there's, I mean, people agree that you, you shouldn't drive a tank down the street to serve a warrant if you're civilian law enforcement. I, I, I don't think anybody reasonable disagrees with that. But I think people would also be shocked to know how much we utilize this equipment for real public safety issues for local communities. So, yeah, I agree with what you said. And I think you will see law enforcement. I mean, you I don't know who said it, but one of the things that said that really struck with me because 
Uh, it, and I think it just needs to be said, and it does, is we, we tend to, you know, there's caveats on both sides and all of this, but it, it, it needs to be said that most law enforcement officers are doing hero's work on a daily basis, and they go to a job where they could face unforeseen violence at any single given sense. Every speeding ticket can turn into violence. Every domestic call can turn into violence. And I actually agree with Ms. Bass on, I've heard this a thousand times from cops, they didn't go into being law enforcement to be social service work. And in a lot of communities, particularly in smaller communities that exist, but we shouldn't make it harder for good cops to do their job in our quest to, to weed out bad cops. And I think unfortunately, as well intended as it is, a lot of what's in this bill does exactly that. Well, thank you, Mr. Armstrong. And again, um, Representative Bass, I hope you you can, uh, you, you are um, a hardworking person, I believe that. And I hope we can come up with a compromise bill that will be bipartisan. I co-sponsored the Muir bill to Senator Scott's bill, the House bill here. Um, and, you know, but I do see that situations need to be addressed, that there's problems. Um, and of course, I think that we need more training um, yes. and certainly uh, more ability for local law enforcement to be able to weed out uh, people that have a bad record or have done something bad and it's on their disciplinary record in another uh, department. Um, and I, I and I do believe that folks that do bad things need to be more easily terminated. Um, and so, because that's the problem. You have some people that do bad things with bad intent. Uh, and so um, I hope you come up with a resolution uh, and that we can all agree in something that the president uh, can, can um, uh, sign into law. I also would ask my Democratic colleagues, would you please I, I mean, ask some of these, uh, I don't know, they're violent protesters, they're not peaceful protesters that are throwing bricks at police officers that are, I've seen the videos where they're like shining lights. Maybe you can publicly ask for them to stop because they're not gonna listen to me. Maybe they'll listen to you because we have to respect, you know, police officers too, or we're gonna have total anarchy. And with that, I yield back. Well, yeah, let, me, let me just say, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give Chairwoman Bass an opportunity to respond, but let me just say, this is Lesko, none of us uh, here uh, advocate or favor of violence. Um, and uh, and I would also point out to you that there's growing evidence that a lot of these agitators uh, represent uh, the extreme right wing uh, in this country. We're learning about that. So maybe, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to ask you to, to talk to them because I, I would like to think that you have nothing to do with them. Uh, but all of us uh, believe that uh, in, in, uh, in peaceful protest um, and none of us uh, advocate violence. And by the way, the vast overwhelming majority of Americans who came out to the streets to express their outrage over the murder of George Floyd did so peacefully. They did so peacefully. And I admire them and I applaud them uh, because they are basically t sick and tired of people in power doing nothing, doing nothing in the face of one violent act uh, after another, after another, after another. But I'd like to give Chairwoman Bass an opportunity to respond to anything that she heard. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Ms. Lesko. I considered you, you a friend and a colleague. And let me just follow up on what the chair is saying because I most certainly know absolutely no one who has ever picked up a rock. And I have been very outspoken about my support for peaceful protests and my objection to any violence. I will point out that in our hearing a couple of weeks ago, the that we had a woman who was there, it was, it was awful. Uh, her brother was killed in Oakland uh, and he was near the protest that took place there. And during that hearing, it was assumed that his murderer was a part of the protest. And exactly as the chairman described, the following week after that hearing, 
the person that is alleged to have killed her brother was arrested. And it turns out that he was from an extreme right wing organization who had infiltrated the protesters with the objective to kill police and to make it appear as though the protesters did that. And I believe in many of the protests, they're opportunists from many political persuasions and they descended upon the peaceful protests. And we should not ever believe that the vast majority of people that are protesting are in any way contributing to the violence. And when it happens, I have been very vocal in denouncing it. My colleague, I wanna point out that some of the equipment that you described that are needed, the tanks, I certainly heard that same thing from the National Police Chiefs Association, and they actually gave me the same example that you described. But here's what I would say. I would say that we need to make sure that police departments have appropriate equipment, but I'm not really sure that a Bearcat armored SUV or an armored personnel carrier is what is really needed. So if police departments need vehicles to deal with floods, then that makes a lot of sense and we should provide that. But I don't believe that those are really armed tanks that are needed. And, and I, I spend a lot of time with working in foreign affairs and, and in African countries. And we're very critical of African countries when they have protests and they send out the military to stop the protesters. Well, when the world looks at the protests that are happening in our city, and many times <laughs> they look and they say, well, what's the distinction? This is your police department? These are how your police departments are armed? So if the departments need equipment, that makes a lot of sense and we should provide for that. But I don't think those are armed vehicles. In terms of no-knock, the no-knock that killed Breonna Taylor that was a drug possession. That was not a cartel. And I think that when the police go because they want to arrest members of a cartel, instead of using no knock, or maybe they do, I would think they would bring SWAT. If they know that it's a heavily armed situation, I think it's very doubtful that they would actually just use no knock without very serious reinforcements. That was not the type of no knock that happened that killed Breonna Taylor. In terms of chokeholds, I think that in our bill, we have part of it is the Peace Act, which calls for law enforcement officers to be trained in de-escalation techniques. A lot of times the chokeholds are used with people who suffer from mental illness. The police departments, because again, they shouldn't be charged with dealing with a health issue and mental illness is a health issue. And so de-escalation in the Peace Act, which is a key part of the bill, hopefully would render a situation where that is not needed, that deadly force is not needed. So I think it's very important that we keep those pieces. I uh, look forward to working with both of my Republican colleagues uh, who have spoken. Ms. Lesko and I are working on other pieces of legislation involving criminal justice reform, and I look forward to working with her as this process moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield Thank you. Mr. Raskin. Oh, Mr. Chair, can I just- Oh, Ms. Lesko. Ms. Yeah. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, listen, I think, um, I think we probably all oppose violent protesters and I have spoken out as well. And so no matter who it is, we just need to heal our country. This is, uh, my constituents are very uptight. Gun sales are going through the roofs because they think that the police aren't going to do their jobs anymore, you know, and they see these riots and looting. And, and so hopefully I have faith that Representative Bass uh, we'll work um, it together and we can get something done. I'm very hopeful so that we can help try to heal our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Rask Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me pick up on that because uh, Ms. Lesko challenged us all to call upon the forces responsible for violence across the country to stop doing it. And I think we should. And I call on Boogaloo and the Ku Klux Klan and all of the extremist right wing groups that are on their websites urging people to go into peaceful protests in order to instigate violence to stop it. 
And I hope that Ms. Leska will be explicit in her denunciation of these groups. And um, if, if they're going to listen to anybody, I don't think it's going to be to us. I think if you could convince them that it is extremely uh, damaging to the political fortunes of your political party, as President Trump's numbers sink below 10, 12 points behind his opponent, then maybe uh, they would listen to you. But in any event, that is where the violence is coming from. And if you look at the history of the civil rights movement in America, if you look at SCLC with Dr. King, you look at the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with our colleague, John Lewis, with Bob Moses, the civil rights movement has always been a movement of nonviolence and yet uh, have been victimized by um, people who've come out with guns to shoot them down, like Dr. King, uh, who was assassinated, like Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, who were assassinated, like Dr. Medgar Evers, who was assassinated, like uh, uh, Viola Luisa, who was assassinated. I encourage you and all of our colleagues to go on the civil rights tour um, with uh, our colleagues, with John Lewis and with Terry Sewell, down to Alabama and Mississippi to see what really happened there and to see that the civil rights movement has always thrived on nonviolence against both official and unofficial vigilante violence. Now, I want to salute Kieran Bass for the remarkable job that she's done in putting together this comprehensive package of reforms, which give us an historic chance uh, to pass the most sweeping reform of policing in America in the history of our country. And it is long overdue. Um, and we actually have an opportunity to get this done if we can. Uh, tune out all of the propaganda and disinformation. The whole premise of civil government, Mr. Chairman, is that we will all be safer inside of the social contract than we will be outside of it in the state of nature, which Thomas Hobbes told us was a state of war, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And yet the social contract has never been safe for African Americans in the United States of America. It certainly was not safe during the period of slavery, and it has been mostly unsafe also even since the abolition of slavery and since the Civil War. And so the idea of the social contract is right. We exchange the habits of violent self-help and mutual revenge and recrimination and tribal justice for trust in the rule of law and the impartial administration of justice. But then we need an impartial administration of justice. And it just hasn't been like that for the first century of our history. Everyone knows the Supreme Court in the infamous Dred Scott decision said that African Americans have no rights that the white man is bound to respect. Our Supreme Court said that. It took a civil war and a reconstruction to sweep that away, to begin to sweep it away. And that lasted only 12 years before white, violent white supremacy was reinstated throughout the South in a period that Wall Street Journal reporter Douglas Blackman has called in his fantastic book, uh, Slavery by Another Name, um, where the combined assault of police forces on the African-American population and the Ku Klux Klan and the Knight Riders, and then the imposition of literacy tests, grandfather clauses, poll taxes, white primaries, and so on, simply extinguished black political power for a century. And then in the civil rights movement um, in the 1960s, uh, through the blood sacrifice of so many uh, great Americans, we were able to get the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And they too have been subject to massive rollback by the Supreme Court and by right-wing politicians who equate people marching against racism with Ku Klux Klansmen and neo-Nazis and white supremacists. So Americans, after the George Floyd murder, have looked up and they have said, where is the social contract for George Floyd? As a police officer, an agent of our government presses the life out of him with a knee to the neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Where was the social contract for him? And where was the social contract for Michael Brown and Eric Garner and Rayshard Brooks? Where's the social contract for Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old EMT shot eight times in her own bedroom by police executing a no-knock warrant, uh, never having been accused of any crime at all. Where is the social contract for millions of African-American citizens of the United States who paid the salaries of police officers, but way too often have to tell their children 
to be afraid of the police um, and to give them the, the famous or the infamous talk. Um, Mr. Chairman, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is the beginning of our repairing the broken social contract in America. And it offers precisely what all of us would come up with um, if we were creating a new social contract, if we were in the Rawlsian original position of a veil of ignorance and we didn't know whether it would be us or our families having the police officer with a knee to our neck or a SWAT team in our bedroom in the middle of the night not understanding what's going on. It bans strangleholds, chokeholds, carotid holds. It bans racial, ethnic, and religious profiling in America. It requires that deadly force be used only as a last resort in order to save life or pre prevent the imminent loss of life or serious injury. It stops the militarizing of law enforcement uh, in a way that is so important, as Ms. Bass pointed out, because the purpose of the police is to protect and defend our people, and the purpose of the military is to go and kill the enemy. And they're trained for two completely different purposes. This legislation will mandate body cameras and dashboard cameras, which still are not used by a majority of officers around uh, the country. It ends the completely perverse and corrupted doctrine of qualified immunity which says that officers who have been found to violate the constitutional rights of US citizens cannot be held responsible if the exact same sequence of events had not taken place before. I mean, if you flip that doctrine over and say it applied to criminal suspects, it would say, it would say somebody can rob a bank if they use a red getaway van instead of a blue getaway van, if nobody had ever been convicted before for a red getaway van. It's an absolutely absurd judge-made doctrine and we should sweep it away. Um, the gentleman from North Dakota says, well, what will we replace it with? We will replace it with the law, Section 1983, which is you cannot violate the constitutional and civil rights of the people. So these are serious, meaningful changes that are the minimum that any of us should expect in a civilized democratic society. And you know what? The founding fathers of our country would be extremely proud of what we are doing in passing this legislation. The vast majority of the rights contained in the, Bill of, in the Bill of Rights are efforts to control the police power of the state. The Third Amendment says no quartering of troops in the homes of the people. The Fourth Amendment says no unreasonable searches and seizures, no warrants can be issued but upon probable cause. The Fifth Amendment says no privilege against, uh, it says uh, you cannot compel people to violate their own privilege against self-incrimination. The Sixth Amendment, the jury trial, um, the Eighth Amendment, no cruel and unusual punishment, ban on double jeopardy, and on and on. The founders understood that the, tier, the, the, the founders understood that tyranny begins with the abuse of the police power, and they understood that the social contract begins with protecting the dignity, the safety, the security, and the rights of every citizen and of every family. So a, an officer who arrogates to himself the power to kill a handcuffed suspect is not only just a cop, but is appointed himself legislator, judge, jury, executioner. And from the standpoint of the victim, that cop is appointed himself God. He controls the power of life and death. That's not just unconstitutional. That's sacrilegious for those people who take their religion seriously. So I don't want us to lose this moment. I don't want it to be frittered away with people saying, well, let's have months of hearings on this or that, and let's you know, see where it all goes. No, the young people of America, Black Lives Matter, have put this on the agenda, and the public opinion polls show that 65 or 70% of American people are with the protests, despite all the propaganda and disinformation of the Fox Corporation which I'm afraid some of our colleagues have fallen into today. Despite all of that, the vast majority of the American people want reform now. There have been two other chances we've had in our history to get it right. And one was the Reconstruction right after the Civil War, and it was washed away by the violence in the Ku Klux Klan and by a reactionary Supreme Court. And the other was during the second Reconstruction during the Civil Rights Movement, and that too has been washed away as we've returned to this baseline of allowing official violence against our African-American 
population. We need a new social contract, and this is the way to begin it. And I'm very proud to be supporting the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morelli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate so much the uh, seriousness of uh, this conversation and the thoughtfulness which this committee and its members uh, continue to take up on so many uh, different topics. It's, a, it's really a privilege to serve on this committee, and I think there are a few topics that I would consider more critical than the one we're discussing today. And I particularly appreciate all the comments um, by my colleagues and would like to associate myself with, uh, with many of them, particularly those by uh, uh, Judge Hastings. Uh, and Professor Raskin, who I, I think just did a, uh, an amazing job of covering the constitutional issues. Um, these are extraordinary times. I was thinking back uh, just a couple of weeks ago to um, my youth. I was 10 years old when Dr. King was murdered. Um, and I remember uh, so clearly and vividly uh, the reaction by so many Americans. And you would think at that time, and that was many, many years ago, sadly, uh, half a century ago, uh, that that would have spurred um, activity and, and more movement in this country for racial justice and equity, uh, but sadly it did not. Um, and I think this is an extraordinary moment as well, but I do feel um, heartened by the fact that with millions of Americans uh, out uh, in protests, black, white, brown, uh, that there is new energy and there is an opportunity to seize this moment. But um, But moments don't just happen. Progress doesn't just happen. Uh, and we've seen that uh, years and years in the past. And they only happen when someone or a group of people decide to make it happen. And that's happening uh, all across America. But I do want to, and I don't have a question, but I've been on a number of calls uh, with uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Bass in the last several weeks, um, in different forums, and I haven't had a chance to formally thank her for what I consider extraordinary leadership in this moment. Uh, progress doesn't happen unless people choose to make it happen and she is choosing to make it happen. And I have just been so incredibly um, impressed by her leadership, by her work on this. Um, she has been a persuasive uh, voice and has, uh, I think, led uh, this discussion with such extraordinary um, uh, you know, uh, uh, passion uh, and uh, thoughtfulness, and I, I'm just very grateful, and I wanted to express to her personally uh, my gratitude for that, um, and uh, thank all of my colleagues. I'm not only prepared to vote for this, I'm a proud uh, co-sponsor of this bill, and I certainly hope that our colleagues um, in the United States Senate and the White House uh, decide to take this moment, to seize this moment, and to bring real and lasting change for millions of Americans who have been denied uh, equity and justice over the years, and let's uh, hope this uh, helps us uh, a, uh, and really uh, realize the promise of a more perfect union at AU Act. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Shalala. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to uh, thank Chairman uh, Bass for her eloquent and thoughtful leadership um, to put together this extraordinary package. Um, I don't know about the founding fathers, but I'm going to vote for HR 7120 for the parents um, who have black sons in Richmond Heights and the West Grove in my district who are constantly warning their sons about their contacts uh, with the police. And I'm going to vote for HR 7120 to keep a promise to the black and the brown and the white high school students who march every weekend in my district against racism. And I'm going to vote for HR 7120 for the decent, hardworking police officers and their chiefs who knelt with the protesters in my district and who do embrace change. And finally, I remember Martin Luther King once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Indeed, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Matsui. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I especially want to thank my good friend, Karen Bass, Bella Californian, who has always shown grace, leadership, and guts moving forward, but also somebody who also had this heartfelt understanding 
about what it means to be an American and what we all like to be as Americans. And you stand up, Karen, in the most beautiful way. Thank you. You know, the events of the last few weeks have really shaken us all to our core and sent a shockwave through our nation. And we've always believed in the past things like that have happened. But this time, I believe, is different. I have looked at the protest movements. I've seen my friends up there. I've seen people of all backgrounds, all colors, all walks of life, wanting to see the best in our country, wanting to understand why. Let's do it now. The disturbing fact is, is that the murders of George Floyd and Brown Taylor are only two instances of, of a march, much larger systemic issue of racial discrimination and injustice. And they're just on the latest. I mean, we've had them in my district also. A couple of years ago, a wonderful man named Stephon Clark died in his grandmother's backyard um, innocently. So today I do stand with my colleagues and I really thank them for their eloquence. Um, it's heartfelt. And I support this legislation that really fundamentally changes our nation's approach to policing, creating new thresholds of transparency and accountability, while also investing in transformative community-based programs. You know, we must always acknowledge the repeated failures of our current system. Um, thoughts and prayers are not enough. Weak legislative proposals are not enough. Pledges to study the problem are not enough. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is a step toward building trust between law enforcement and our communities. Through this legislation, we will ban the use of chokeholds and no-knock warrants and the Pentagon program giving local police departments military-grade weapons, streamline federal law to prosecute excessive force and establish independent prosecutors for police investigations. We'll also end qualified immunity that has prevented meaningful accountability in police departments throughout the nation. You know, our country can heal. And we know people want to be safe. Public safety is very important. We also know that our public safety people also want to be in the right place also with the community working together. And this legislation is a step toward a safer, more equitable, and just America. And I do look forward to the passage of this bill on the House floor tomorrow. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, are there any further questions for this panel? Hearing none, our witnesses are excused. And I want to thank them both for their uh, very uh, important testimony here today. Um, uh, I now want to welcome our next panel. Uh, which includes, uh, again, Representative Armstrong of North Dakota, Representative Danny Davis, uh, Representative Klein, uh, Representative Starber, uh, Representative Schweikert, and Representative Jackson Lee. Uh, without any objection, uh, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. Um, I would appreciate uh, if you could uh, keep your uh, statements uh, concise, and I now recognize uh, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk, and just before I do, I always enjoy my constitutional conversations that occur with my friends, but uh, I think my friend, Mr. Raskin, forgot. I don't know how you talk about the tyranny of the government and not talk about the Second Amendment. And we seem to always forget the Tenth Amendment. And what I mean by that is just quite, we talk about police, police departments like they're these anonymous things that just run around everywhere out in the country and forget that they are controlled by both, both local, county, and state governments as well. So um, I think it's important, particularly, again, when 2 million out of the 2.3 million people incarcerated in this country are incarcerated in state local prisons. But with that, I have an amendment. I offer this amendment in judiciary. I'm going to offer it again in rules uh, because I find the current bill without this amendment to create a very perverse incentive that I don't think makes any sense. One of the provisions in Ms. Bass bill that I wholeheartedly support is requiring all federal law enforcement to use dash cams, uniform federal law enforcement to use dash cameras and body cameras. I think outside of any other policy we have, 
that shining more sunlight on these types of things. And indeed, she even said in her opening statement, um, we may not know about some of these things if we didn't have the technology of cell phones and cell phone cameras and that. And so with that, I would also request that federal law enforcement at least come to, as my friend, uh, one of my friends says, into the 20th century. And this amendment would require the DOJ law enforcement to record audibly just audio all interviews that are conducted whether they are in custody or non-custodial and essentially what this amendment will do will require you to keep the uh, camera on after you detain somebody we do it indeed, no, indeed nobody nobody can understand how it would be i mean it doesn't make any law enforcement sense to have to record the detention but to be able to turn it off while you conduct the interrogation there are some narrow exceptions in the bill for confidential informants and there are retention requirements for 10 years or in the cases of capital cases until the case is disposed of legally. This is important a goal. This is an important amendment if our goal is to hold law enforcement accountable and improve transparency. And indeed we do because in subtitle, subtitle C, we require federal uniform law enforcement to have body cameras. Um, I think I, it, uh, all the prior reasons for this not occurring simply do not make sense. It was often held that it was too expensive, it was too cumbersome, it doesn't allow for the free flow of conversation. We all know that's not the case in this era of smartphones. We know that every law enforcement agent with the DOJ could carry one. And we know that, I mean, and we know the DOJ and the FBI at least ostensibly agree with this. In 2004, the FBI had a memo, and in 2014, the DOJ had a memo. The problem with those were only for in custody interviews. The problem with in custody becomes an interesting term of art when we are dealing with our friends in federal law enforcement. The FBI and DOJ in custody only applies following arrest and prior to the initial appearance when the defendant is in a place of detention with suitable recording equipment. Uh, this, uh, this, you can imagine this actually, this is an exception that swallows the rule. The vast majority of the, of the interviews conducted by federal investigators simply aren't, reco aren't recorded. And as some recent high profile cases have taught us more than we would ever know about 302s, I think it's important to understand what a 302 is. A 302 is simply an officer's view of an interview and it's, a and it's his notes taking, it, uh, taking them down. Um, this is important for a lot of reasons. Often these interrogations can last for hours and often trials don't occur for many months, if not years after the time. Why we would not why we would not require the premier law enforcement agency in the world to require to record these interviews does not simply make any sense. This bill, this amendment will help. This bill will make the uh, transparency part of this bill better. And it's long past time that we ask the premier federal law enforcement agency to do what almost every state and municipal um, police agency across the country already, already does. And with uh, I, I would just say one of the questions we got in um, offline during the hearing was about notice and consent. And I think in order to deal with both of those issues, I can be very quick. Uh, the federal government is a one party consent um, an entity, which means if the law enforcement consents to recording the interview, then the interview is recorded. With regards to notice, it is understood that all conversations with law enforcement are on the record. So notice doesn't really exist. Um, however, if those, I mean, and so those, those issues really don't account for what this bill does. Uh, I think after years and years and years of not of the federal law enforcement finding ways to not have to record interviews, they've lost the benefit of the doubt with regard to custodial and in custodial, especially considering the advances in technology that exists now. And so with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Armstrong. Um, I know that you requested uh, uh, to be able to leave right now. Um, I have no I have no questions. I Does anybody have any objection if Mr. Armstrong uh, uh, leaves the uh, the hearing right now. I hear none, so you are free to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'm now I will now uh, I yield to Representative Danny Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. I also want to commend uh, both Representative Bass and Nadler for the outstanding leadership they've shown in bringing us to this point. Because of the work that I do with reentry, my office is often deluged with reports of bad acts and bad actors who work for federal law enforcement agencies. And there seem to be some questions regarding which ones are covered, which ones are not, who is covered by some of the provisions and who is not. 
Therefore, I have an amendment, and the purpose of my amendment is to make it clear that federal law enforcement officials, especially correction officers in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, are held to the same standards as local and state law enforcement personnel. Therefore, my amendment is very simple, and it reads that on page 11, line 25, insert before the comma the following, or a federal corrections officer. Therefore, I am requesting that this amendment be made in order a part of a manager's amendment. I thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm a firm supporter of the bill, H.R. 7120. Look forward to its passage and appreciate the tremendous work that's been done to bring us to this point. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I now turn to Representative Klein of Virginia. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I coming? All right. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, this amendment I'm introducing along with my friend, uh, Mr. Hudson in North Carolina, because uh, we're tired of uh, hardworking men and women in law enforcement being given a bad rap by the actions of a uh, few racist and violent officers that may be in their force. Uh, the vast majority of law enforcement officers serve their communities with distinction and honor across our nation every day. Unfortunately, in some states, bad officers have been shielded from transparency and accountability by police union collective bargaining agreements that make it nearly impossible for a department to remove officers with extensive complaint histories, like Officer Derek Chauvin, the officer charged with murder and George Floyd's death. The amendment would ensure that Department of Justice and the Attorney General is not hindered uh, by overly restrictive collective bargaining agreements when working with law enforcement to resolve patterns or practices of misconduct. That uh, provision is in the manager's amendment. I, I uh, uh, commend uh, the gentlelady, uh, Ms. Bass, uh, the sponsor of the bill for agreeing to include it, but it leaves out an important part of the amendment that I offered in committee uh, that would ensure that important federal resources go to state and local law enforcement agencies that avoid provisions occasionally found in collective bargaining agreements that prevent transparency and avoid accountability. Nobody wants provisions or policies in their local police department that would delay officer interviews after alleged misconduct, provide access to evidence to officers before interviews or interrogations about alleged wrongdoing, mandate the destruction of disciplinary records, prohibit the investigation of misconduct after a set length of time, prohibit the investigation of anonymous complaints or require mandatory arbitration after being disciplined or terminated. These are all policies that we don't wanna see in collective bargaining agreements. So my amendment would condition federal aid on ensuring that any collective bargaining agreement uh, expressly prohibit that. You know, this is, uh, the data supports uh, keeping this kind of policy out of local police departments. Uh, Duke Law Journal analyzed 178 police union collective bargaining agreements and found that they played a key role in shielding bad police officers from the consequences of misconduct. Um, approximately 88% contained at least one provision that could prevent holding officers who engage in misconduct accountable. Um, between 2006 and 2017, according to the Washington Post, the nation's largest police departments fired nearly 1,900 officers for misconduct but were forced to reinstate more than 450 officers after appeals required by union collective bargaining agreements ran their course. And collective bargaining agreements have been linked to an increase in violent incidents involving law enforcement officers. One study found a 40% increase of violent incidents in Florida after a change in collective bargaining laws there. Um, I can go on and on. Uh, the attorney general has the authority to investigate and reform departments through consent decrees, but uh, DOJ is often unable to compel changes that could be construed as altering these collective bargaining agreements negotiated by local unions. We need to correct that policy. But really, just like in other parts of the bill where you condition the federal funding uh, for COPS programs on things, um, on, on policies within each local uh, department, uh, 
uh, we need to do this with union contracts. Police departments can make hiring and firing decisions based on performance. Um, it's, hope, it's my hope that by making this amendment in order, we can prevent future tragedies like the one that took George Floyd's life. And uh, with that, I yield back. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Starber. Uh, you can testify now on, your, on behalf of your amendment. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member Cole. I'm offering my amendment in the nature of a substitute here. So a little bit about me, 23-year um, law enforcement officer in the city of Duluth, Minnesota. And I worked with Senator Scott on drafting this. And there's so much uh, in common we have in this bill. But let, let's, let's talk about some of the differences uh, you know, we want transparency and accountability and performance measures. And, you know, in the transparency part in our bill, we talk about the data reporting on the use of force. We can all agree with that. Only 40% of the departments across the nation uh, uh, put their data into the FBI. This can give them this in, uh, gives them uh, the opportunity to participate so you can grab best practices then. And also uh, the no knock uh, search warrants. Um, you know, so th for those of us who have been in a situation in no-knock search warrants, such as myself on the tactical response team, as Representative Bass so eloquently said, it should be done with the tactical response team. And no-knock warrants, when they're done right, they, <clears throat> there's a less of an opportunity for the subject or subjects or the officers to get hurt. I have been involved in them. The, you don't go on their haphazard. You have confidential, reliable informants to give you the out, out uh, the layout of the uh, the building, uh, where the potential uh, weapons are going to be, uh, who has the weapons, what kind of weapons, where are the drugs stored. These things, when you do them right, you can execute them very well with a high high probability of nobody uh, getting hurt. And then let's talk about the body cam usage. You know, um, this should have been brought up before this incident. And uh, departments across the nation that use body cams, as my friend Kelly uh, Armstrong talked about, it's the funding for the usage of the, the, the data storage that's critically important. And this bill appropriates funding for the storage of the data. Body cameras are used uh, for um, uh, to help uh, train police officers, uh, uh, exonerate, help convict, and also are used for training purposes. We there. That's one of the best one-dimensional pieces of evidence we have. And uh, by the way, before I before I go on, I've said this publicly. Nobody dislikes a bad cop more than a good cop, and this is why these things are so important. Um, body camera uses, and then the disciplinary records, that I think we all can agree on that. But what we don't agree on is substantiated claims. Uh, you have no idea how many officers get complained on them when they do, when they follow the proper uh, policies and procedures and are responsible. Uh, I've looked at body cam footage from complaints where the officer uh, followed the rules and the law to a T and our policies to a T. Now, you don't want that to follow that officer, do you? We want substantiated claims for officer abuse. That's where we don't want officers to go from department to department to department. Um, and then uh, the hiring, comprehensive hiring is in the community policing bill that we're offering. Uh, a complete psychological evaluation of, of, of uh, bringing somebody into your police department that, that will serve the public uh, for 25 or 30 years. And then the performance on the best practices of de-escalation and mental health calls for service and community policing. Our bill, Senator Scott's bill and my bill puts $5 billion um, uh, $5 billion for community policing implementation, which builds the best trust between the community uh, and, and the police officers. When you properly implement community policing, Mr. Chair, you don't police your community, you police with your community. Um, as many of you are aware, 80% of these policies uh, in the Justice Act, we can agree on. Um, it, it, this legislation, in my mind, is already bar bipartisan. And uh, it would be an absolute shame if we don't take this extraordinary opportunity and put something forward that makes a difference to the, the communities that we serve. They're, they're, they're asking, they're telling us we need these changes. Uh, the American people are sick and tired of bipart our, our partisanship. 
We come here to get something done. I'm a freshman member of Congress and it's so disappointing to see the divisiveness. And you know what? I understand it didn't start overnight, but we have an opportunity. I lend my hand out to have the opportunity to be in the same room with you and talk about these, uh, uh, these best practices in law enforcement. Uh, you know, in the coming days, I hope both sides can come together because our nation, our communities need this. The Justice Act is a big step forward, more than where it is today. The Justice Act is a big step forward. And I'm afraid that partisanship, uh, the elephants in the room, the partisanship reference, the qualified immunity and the no-knock warrants. Remember, qualified immunity is this. If I take my baton and strike somebody over the head because they're gonna throw a water balloon at me, my department, the city of Duluth, Minnesota, will not indemnify me. They will not protect me because I was outside the scope of my policies and procedures and my training. And this, when you implement the best practices, you're gonna lower that percentage because com community policing works. It has worked across the nation. And the last, uh, uh, President Clinton did great when he incorporated the COPS program to the, this nation. And when you do that, you, you see the differences. The last time the COPS pro program had the appropriations was 2008 for fiscal year 2009. It's been 11 years since we've given that program money. This is the opportunity to bring back uh, the Bill Clinton uh, policing and the COPS program. I did it, I know it works, and I'm disappointed that I can't have the opportunity to talk about uh, the, the beautiful things that happened, the police uh, community relations, and, and looking at what their interests are, not necessarily the police departments. You police with your community when you when you do it right. And I think that it will be a shame if we let partisan politics get into 80% of the things uh, that we believe in. And I, I, I know that legislation is the art of the possible. And that is why I am asking for the Justice Act to be considered on the House floor as a substitute amendment with these bipartisan uh, provisions. And Mr. Chair, I yield back, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schweiger, you have an amendment? Uh, you can testify on that now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm actually sitting in an airport in Phoenix on getting ready to head back. But um, Mr. Chairman, I have amendment number eight and amendment nine. Um, eight is state and local, nine actually inc incorporates both state and local and federal. And it's in regards to technology. Um, I'm a firm believer, and I, and I have a binder full of articles on this, that there is a revolution taking place right now in non-lethal um, instruments, tools, um, opportunities for law enforcement. It's heartbreaking in situations where you realize there may have been um, a, an opportunity to use something that doesn't take a life. So the amendments are very simple. It's both in regards to training and acquisition of the technology that's here but also coming and and look i did not have a brilliant way to write some of this so i i would if the committee has suggestions on how to even make it better if it's so accepted for manager's amendment i would be elated but as we discuss um you know much of the discussion i've been listening to in the rules committee has been how do we affect people's hearts and minds um, I also want us to also consider the revolution we have in technology where we can engage in law enforcement activities, policing activities, but no life has to be taken in, in such a thing. And it, it even goes a bit further. There, there's actually discussions now of whether you think of the use of a taser, the next generation of tasers will be almost as good as a sidearm, as a firearm with multiple shots and yet um, you know, uh, accuracy. So would a law enforcement uh, uh, officer choose to use that weapon that doesn't take a life? The other is the future of technology where you have a suspect where you can put a band around their wrist or on their chest that actually sends you health information, letting you know, is this individual under stress? Is there something happening? Um, so other types of ways to use technology to actually deal with some of the very sad cases that we all have had to hear. 
And with that, Mr. Chairman, happy for any questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, do you have an amendment? I'm here. Uh, you, you can testify on your amendment if you have one. I'm going to testify on the amendment uh, that I intended to uh, submit, but on the bill itself. So I'm, I'm ready to. Uh, okay, you can go. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the Rules Committee. Um, I've had the privilege of being in the Judiciary Committee hearing, but at the same time, uh, through the virtual process, listened to the extended discussion this afternoon in the Rules Committee on H.R. 7120. Uh, and again, I add uh, my appreciation for the brilliant leadership of the chair of the CBC and all of our CBC members, and as well the Judiciary Committee chair who has embraced this effort. Uh, and as he has embraced this effort, let me say that this is a legacy uh, and a history and a pattern of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, coming onto this committee 25 years ago, one of the first efforts that we engaged in was to end police brutality with the killing of Abidu Diallo in the Bronx uh, in New York. We even attended a field hearing dealing with the crisis of police community relations. We know that a former commissioner of uh, the NYPD and uh, chief of the uh, police in Houston was the father of community oriented policing. There have been many efforts to try to bring police and community together and it should be uh, clearly stated on this record, as will be stated uh, tomorrow, that there is no divide with respect to uh, this nation, I believe, on the question of the importance of law enforcement, our first responders, uh, and the fact that we want first responders to go home to their families. But we also, as we watched over the trajectory of the last decades, we want uh, those in the community to go home to their families and now we are pronouncing very loudly that black lives do matter. That is the sense of this legislation uh, combined with a desire to reimagine policing, dealing with the idea of being a uh, guardian versus a warrior. We welcome all of the commentary that I've heard from this committee, and we have welcomed that from those that will be on the floor tomorrow. But let me tell you why this bill uh, has a moment in history that is so significant uh, that it is imperative that it pass, imperative that we work together with the United States Senate, but they realize that the moment uh, is such uh, that incentives and studies are not appropriate at this time. One of the major elements that we've been working on for almost uh, more than a decade has been the law enforcement trust and integrity, but the whole idea of accreditation and training. There are 18,000 police departments across this nation many of them not accredited, many of them not engaged in policing in a scientific manner or a compassionate and passionate manner. And that includes the understanding and having a definition of excessive force, uh, knowing about de-escalation, which I've been advocating for for a very long time, simple process of protecting uh, the, the perpetrator or the actors in the situation, as well as police, and the duty to intervene. Glaringly, uh, when George Floyd, who lived in Minneapolis, but grew up in CUNY homes and Jack Yates and his family and I have spent time together over the last couple of days in a listening session in Houston that included police officers and faith leaders and the Floyd family and many others who agreed with the Justice and Policing Act. They've endorsed the Justice and Policing Act because they know that their son, their uh, brother, cousin and relative who was uh, on the streets shouting, or at least being heard saying, I can't breathe and calling out for their mama, needs not incentives or studies, they actually need legislation. And so in this legislation is a training uh, protocol that will reach all of these small departments and it is an accreditation protocol. We have never been able to pass in racial profiling. And statistically, the largest number of stops on the streets of America are African-American men and women. Uh, particularly with us being only 13% of the population, we're over 50% of the stops. In the District of Columbia, with pedestrian and uh, traffic stops, we're over 80% of the stops with a population of 46%. So this legislation is, as uh, our uh, chairwoman has indicated, as, as we have indicated in various town halls uh, throughout the period since uh, George Floyd was murdered, and in his homegoing service, this is justice. 
And it is not just as unfairly, it is not just as biased against officers as much as it is that gives them a roadmap to ensure that new recruits do not have racial bias, to ensure that new recruits know that they cannot do no knock, to ensure that new recruits know that a chokehold is federally illegal, that it is against the law. On the qualified immunity, let me simply say that this was applauded by a member of the district attorney's staff uh, in saying that uh, the difficulty in dealing with the present standard, uh, which was to prove willfulness uh, versus reckless uh, and um, a modified standard that will allow at least uh, for the victim in wrongful actions to have the ability uh, to pursue um, a bad acting officer. In addition, I think we have more to do. There is a Monell standard that is a Supreme Court decision that says you cannot sue local jurisdiction. Not in this bill. We look forward to having the opportunity to look at that issue. I intended to introduce a bill that dealt with the issue that Mr. Armstrong was discussing. I hope in further opportunities we'll have a chance to discuss it. I did not introduce it at this time because I believe this bill is so significant in saving lives that it is important for this bill to be heard fully uh, and without um, additional uh, processes that have to be looked at. But my bill uh, dealt with not incentives, but actual grants to ensure that local and state officers and departments were in fact ensuring uh, that they did uh, videotape and record uh, the encounters with police. This finally, um, I would offer to say uh, that as this bill makes its way to uh, the other body, the United States Senate, we understand that a conference can take place. We understand that there may be discussion, but what we don't understand is the refusal uh, to put this bill on the floor of the Senate that is sponsored by Senator Harris and Senator Booker. That is real discussion and real reform. Uh, what we have in this legislation, again, is seismic, significant response to what has been occurring on the streets of this nation. Breonna Taylor, would not have died with no knock. And of course, Eric Garner would not have died with the ending of chokehold, which as we can see, still is occurring in our police departments. Finally, I would say, Mr. Chairman, I'm dismayed that I've been hearing uh, from a number of members and they certainly have a right to speak their position. But it is interesting in the tragic uh, loss of Mr. Brooks in Atlanta, Georgia, no one wants to acknowledge that Mr. Brooks was shot running away. He was shot in the back. I did not make that determination. Mr. Brooks' family did not make that determination. The prosecutor did not uh, indicate that on his own without evidence, nor did he pull the trigger. It was evidenced by the medical examiner who indicated Mr. Brooks was fleeing. Where was the responsibility of that officer to deescalate? Just as where was the responsibility of Mr. Chauvin in fact, uh, to um, show a duty uh, to his office and not murder Mr. Floyd on the streets. So it is uh, my belief uh, that my amendment would have been a good amendment. Uh, my amendment to record and to video all discussions uh, with police in the local and state arena across the nation, because they're not consistent across the nation, would have been a very good amendment. And I look forward to working with Mr. Armstrong pointedly focused on improving law enforcement on the federal level. During the hearing, uh, during the markup, all of the members of his um, side were discussing uh, General Flynn. We know that that was not the issue of that markup. But in looking to do that, I realized that we have many more steps to go. Now, however, I don't think we can be silenced on H.R. 7120. I think the outcries of those who are protesting, again, are not looking for studies and analysis. Uh, they're looking for actual uh, commitment to changing our police thinking to being guardians. And I believe there are so many, Mr. Chairman, the years that I've served on the Judiciary Committee, officers who seek to be guardians of this community and be that officer that a five-year-old extends his or her hand to look to that guardian that protects them and their family. Thank you. And, um, to uh, uh, recognize that I'm not sending or submitting my amendment and yeah. supporting H.R. 7120 and uh, the manager's amendment. Well, thank you very much. And as I said at the very beginning here, um, 
you know that uh, what we're doing is is the is the first step. There are, there are many other things that we need to do, uh, not just with regard to uh, policing, but we need to look at a whole range of of issues um, in response to the uh, systemic racism that sadly continues to exist uh, in this country. Um, I have no questions of the panel. Um, I'll, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no questions, but uh, I just hope all the amendments were made in order. I think they are all serious amendments. They deserve consideration on the floor. Thank you, Ms. Tor Ms. Torres. I have no questions. Thank you. Mr. Woodall. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Mr. Perlmutter. I just appreciated some of Mr. Stauber's uh, comments about the COPS program and the community policing and, and uh, the passion that he has uh, shown, I think, working together with uh, uh, Ms. Bass as this process uh, moves forward, I think will be very helpful. And I think there are a lot of strong things that can be done to reduce this violence and provide uh, departments with the tools that they need to, you know, uh, deal with the force. Uh, so I'm, uh, I was encouraged by uh, some of the things that I heard uh, on the testimony about amendments. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Ra uh, Mr. Raskin. Okay. Uh, Ms. Uh, Scanlon. Okay. Uh, Mr. Morelli. Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you. Ms. Shalala. Oh, I, yeah. um, all right, uh, Ms. Mrs. Lesko, is she, is she yeah. still here? I am. I am here. Thank I'm sorry, you. that's my fault. I didn't. I, I didn't see you on my Hollywood that's Squares uh, <laughs> screen here. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I don't have any questions, but I do want to just state something for the record from sure. a previous uh, thing that Mr. Raskin said. Asked, I think he asked me to call on white supremacists or something to that effect to stop violence. I don't know any white supremacists. I don't know any people doing violence on the streets. So I want that on the record. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think uh, 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 Ms. Matsui. No questions. All right. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. yes. Chairman, Mr. If I could get a very brief moment, um, certainly to uh, grapple with what was uh, just mentioned about uh, white supremacists or right wing persons intervening. Let's make it clear on the record uh, that every place I have been, whether you're a congressperson or not, uh, we have been pleading for peaceful protesters and applauding peaceful protesters. And as I've watched the nation, that is what we have seen. Not only have we seen that, but we've seen them as racially, religiously, and community-wide diverse. Uh, and finally, I would say, yes, the life of uh, the uh, Proud Boys and Boogaloo, they do exist. But we realize that none of them are associated with persons who want democracy and the right way to protest. People are protesting because they're hurting. I've seen them. They're crying out for a police transformation now. Uh, and finally, I think this bill is unique because it actually listens to them by putting transformational dollars in, not to go to law enforcement departments at this time, uh, but to go to communities and allow them to engage in a way that can bring harmony, uh, collective unity, and the idea of living in a community where all people can be safe. And the ending of stigmatizing of any one group uh, as relates uh, to uh, the law enforcement structure. Good officers know that their best uh, collaborators are people who trust them and who believe they are guardians and are there to protect and serve. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. And let me ask, is any other, there any other questions? Did I miss anybody who wanted to ask a question? Uh, Ms. Scanlon or uh, Ms. Shalala, I just make sure that I, are you, Ms. Scanlon, you have any, nothing? Okay, all right. Uh, no further questions in the panel. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, you are free to go. Um, are there any other members who wish to testify in HR 7120? 
Seeing none, this closes the hearing on HR 7120. Um, we have added a sixth item to today's agenda as, an, as emergency items. Uh, as an emergency item, HR 7301, the Emergency Housing Protections and Relief Act. Um, I would now like to call up our next panel to testify on HR 7301. Um, uh, Mr. Perlmutter and Mr. Tipton, um, thank you for testifying in this legislation. Uh, and I'm now happy to recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to the ranking member and my colleagues on the committee for allowing me to switch roles this afternoon and testify on the Emergency Housing Protections and Relief Act of 2020 introduced by Chairman Maxine Waters. Uh, Chairwoman Waters asked I speak on her behalf um, as she begins uh, traveling back to D.C. since we saw her a couple hours ago, or I guess a few hours ago. This bill includes several provisions that were included in the HEROES Act and independently is led by several of my colleagues on the Financial Services Committee, including Denny Heck, David Scott, Chewy Garcia, Lacey Clay, Cindy Axney, Nidia Velasquez, Ayana Presley, Katie Porter, and Al Green. I support the Rules Committee's efforts to advance this bill to provide needed housing assistance for struggling renters, homeowners, and people experiencing homelessness as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. According to a June survey conducted by Apartment List, 32% of renters were unable to fully pay their rent at the beginning of this month, with 20% of renters being unable to make any payment at all. According to the Mortgage, Mortgage Bankers Association, the number of homeowners in forbearance reached 4.2 million in June. And while we don't have up-to-date estimates of homelessness, we know that evictions are moving forward for renters who are not protected by an eviction moratorium. The Emergency Housing Protections and Relief Act of 2020 would address the housing needs arising due to COVID-19 through several targeted solutions. The bill would help renters and landlords by extending the eviction moratorium from the CARES Act to March 27, 2021, and expanding it to protect all renters by providing $100 billion for an emergency rental assistance fund to help renters cover their rent and utility bills, including any unpaid bills. Providing low-cost loans for landlords through the Federal Reserve facilities and expanding forbearance protections for all landlords and providing additional funding for federal housing assistance programs to ensure rents remain affordable and housing is maintained in a safe and decent condition, including public housing, Section 8, Rural Housing Programs, Section 202, Housing for the Elderly, and Section 811, Supportive Housing for Persons with Disabilities. The bill would help homeowners by extending the foreclosure moratorium from the CARES Act for six months from enactment and expanding it to protect all homeowners. Would expand forbearance relief to protect all homeowners and ensuring protection so no borrower is forced to pay a lump sum at the end of the forbearance period, but it is in fact rolled over. Providing $75 billion for a homeowner assistance fund that would provide direct assistance for homeowners who are struggling to pay their mortgage, property tax, property insurance, and other housing related costs, and providing liquidity for mortgage servicers. The bill would also help people experiencing homelessness by providing $11.5 billion for homeless assistance grants that will help ensure people experiencing homelessness are able to follow social distancing guidance and have access to necessary services, and by providing a billion dollars for new housing choice vouchers targeted to people experiencing or at risk of homelessness and who are also survive or and who may be survivors of domestic violence. The bill would also provide additional funding for fair housing enforcement and housing counseling resources to support struggling renters, homeowners, and people existing homelessness. Mr. Chairman, we're on a path out of this pandemic, requiring all of us to do our part, but we're at a critical moment. The Senate has failed to take up the HEROES Act the House passed last month. 
As a result, we may soon be facing a spike in evictions and rates of homelessness, making it much harder for us to get our economy back on track. This bill will take immediate action to ensure landlords provide some slack to their tenants, requires the banks to provide some slack to the landlords and homeowners, and it helps us continue our economic recovery. The bottom line is a number of the things that we did in the initial packages uh, to cushion the blow from the pandemic will expire over the course of the next few days and certainly through July where we had the pandemic unemployment assistance uh, uh, insurance payment. And as we, we've come through the emergency phase of this pandemic, the first 90 days of this thing, where we've been able to suppress and flatten the curve for so many places, we've caught up on protective gear, we're making progress on vaccines and medicines, and we got a lot of money to a lot of people quickly. And I think we should take some satisfaction in what we've done so far. But we know, you know, whether it's in Colorado, we're at 10 and a half percent unemployment. Other states are at 15 percent unemployment. We were at two and a half percent unemployment in February. We got a lot of people unemployed in Colorado, and that is repeated across the country. People have been put back to work because of PPP, but a lot of people are still out of work. And if we intend to get through this um, recession slash, let's hope it doesn't get worse, uh, we've got to continue to provide stability in the economy and particularly in housing. And this helps both the tenants and the landlords and the, the servicers, the mortgage servicers. With that, I'll, I'd yield back and I'm um, happy to take questions, uh, even though I'm just pinch hitting. Thank you very much. Um, and um, I think we're waiting to hear from Mr. Tipton. I'm not sure. I think he was having some technical difficulties and I want to just see if I can. Well, I'm happy to be the other gentleman from Colorado and give the other side of the whole. Yeah. While we're waiting to see whether Mr. Tipton um, can, can get on, um, maybe we should, if, if anyone has any questions for Mr. Perlmutter, uh, fire away. Uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I may, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to uh, place into record a letter from Mr. McHenry, who is, I know you know is our ranking member on the Financial Services Committee, and uh, he was essentially unaware of this bill until earlier today. So. Uh, Certainly not inclined to support something that's dropped at the last minute. And I'd, I'd be remiss not to point out, um, getting pretty frustrated, Mr. Chairman, a 92 page, $195 billion authorization bill with a, an hour's notice, uh, no Republican input whatsoever. So, again, uh, you know, I think that's going to happen to a lot of the legislation today. You've got the votes, you can pass it through here, but it's not going anywhere. So if you want to get serious about this, it's a real problem. I agree with Mr. Perlmutter. I have enormous respect for him. But uh, every member he mentioned that had been consulted or this was a Democratic member. So in the single Republican that was brought into discussion, you're not going to get support that way. You're not, and, and again, you guys just like to chalk up victories and say we passed it through the House. That's great. But it's not going anywhere uh, and, until you seriously engage the other party in this. They may come. We don't need to do that. But right now, it's a Republican Senate and a Republican president. Well, the problem is very real. Uh, and I would agree with my friend from Colorado. You've got to be a little bit more bipartisan, I think. Well, well and, 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 Mr. Cole, and Mr. Cole, and I'm, I'm, I yield to Mr. Perlmutter, but I, I think the frustration that we have is that we passed the HEROES Act back uh, in May. Um, we think there's an emergency. Um, and we think, uh, you know, not only the portion of the HEROES Act that we're talking about here today, but the money for state and local governments is essential. We can't get any, we can't get any indication. Uh, I mean, you know, we're, 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 we're happy to sit down with, we're, we're happy to sit, we're happy to sit, we're happy to sit down with, voting against it than you did. And, and we're happy, we're, we're happy to sit down with Senate, uh, 
uh, Majority Leader McConnell uh, to talk about you know what well, he I will accept and what he won't. We can't we can't get him to I think we can't get him to do anything. Wanted to wait and see what additional numbers work. Job numbers came in much better than expected. You know the retail sales, so they were probably well, pretty wide. I still hope we get a bill, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, but yeah. I wouldn't be uh, upset uh, uh, because they didn't talk to you when they told you ahead of time they wanted to get things a few weeks to wait on. Yeah, we're well, not just things I, through without waiting on data. It's a three trillion dollar well, bill. Well, it was essentially uh, brought up by the Democratic House conference. Yeah, well, uh, well let me just say That's that uh, as one as one who as one who spent uh, a great deal of the last couple of weeks. Um, not only on Zoom calls and conference calls, but even getting out to some of my uh, local towns to talk to my town managers and and mayors and uh, heads of my uh, first responders and everything. The need, they're desperate and they are puzzled uh, at the indifference coming out of uh, the Senate. But Mr. Promo, you're uh, you're the you're the witness. So if you want to respond, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to respond. And, and Mr. Cole, you're right. This is all happening very fast. Uh, but this was virtually all of this was in the HEROES Act. So it isn't and it may not have been bipartisan as you would have liked uh, as it went to the Senate, but it's been sitting there. We had a hearing on this on July 10th. Again, things are happening fast, but this pandemic, this virus hit us fast. And, you know, from your perch on appropriations, there's been a lot of effort here. To, to make sure that we deal with the, the medical emergency, but also deal with the economic emergency, emergency. And so far we're doing okay, but a lot of this stuff runs out and we still have a lot of people unemployed. I don't care what the numbers look like in the next, you know, just based on today in Colorado, we're at five times, pardon me, the unemployment that we were three months ago. And my guess is Oklahoma isn't any different. So we've got to make sure that we don't stymie and stop the recovery that we really plan have been doing a pretty good job putting in place. And so much of this is uh, in the HEROES Act, almost all of it is, and it is designed to help both the tenant or the tenant, the landlord and the mortgage company. Well, I appreciate that, but as you recall, we did pass four supplementals when we worked together. And there were certainly partisan disagreements and compromises, and that was appropriate. Uh, but they, when they came to the floor, they passed almost universally, a uh, heavy bipartisan work. Now, what you chose to do with the HEROES Act, there's a lot of policy in there that, that frankly, you know, uh, is never going to be accepted in the public beyond that. So that's the way you want to proceed. That's fine. We had a model that was working and delivered that, I think, significant. Uh, by you know bipartisan relief the american people that we were all in favor of i don't think the heroes act worked that way i don't think this is going to work that way so again uh you know bringing it up here at the last minute when nobody's read it no, but no republicans have been engaged thinking i mean there may may you know there may be a point to be made there i again with all due respect maybe you're just laying out your negotiating position i respect that but it isn't going to become law and so i think that's at one what you have to ask yourself. You're here to make a point, you're here to make law. This process isn't going to work very well, in my view. But uh, again, I, I, nobody at my working with more than my friend from Colorado. He got me to vote for a couple of things I thought I would never vote for. So I know he's very really persuasive and able legislator, and I look forward to working with him again. But I can't do it this fast on something this big that I get an hour's notice on, and there's been no Republican engagement for me to have along. It's not going to happen. So. That uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. All right, Ms. Uh, Ms. Torres. Any questions? Um, I, do have a, I do have Chairman. a statement. Okay. Chairman, this is, this is Al Seattle. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Al I didn't see you there. No, no. Okay. I, I don't. I don't uh, have anything to add. I just wanted to let you know that I was uh, back from the event I had to attend, and that I'll be prepared to read the motion when the time is appropriate. Thank you. Okay. We are not. We're, okay. Okay. I'll let you know. Okay. So, uh, all right, Ms. Ms. Torres. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it's no secret that COVID, the COVID pandemic has created an incredible instability across our economy, and the housing sector is um, absolutely no exception. Um, just today, we learned that 4.3 million homeowners missed their mortgage payments last month. Um, 
the situation is also dire for Americans who rent. Uh, a Fontana resident reached out to my office and asked why more isn't being done to protect renters. Um, this constituent was laid off as a result of the virus. And, and, and when, when she spoke to her landlord for assistance, as we have been urging um, folks to do, the response that she received was, um, listen, we're all struggling right now. So, you know, that landlord is absolutely correct. Everyone is struggling right now. Every renter we protect from eviction is one less person forced to, um, to face this pandemic without a safety net of, their, of a home. It doesn't make sense to spend millions uh, to temporarily house homeless individuals only to see the homeless numbers rise due to the lack of assistance for renters. The Emergency Housing Protections and Relief uh, Act of 2020 will help us do just that. It authorizes $100 billion for emergency rental assistance to help struggling Americans pay their rent and their utilities. Um, the program is designed to get support to those who need it and uh, get it really quick. Um, so for every renter that we help in this bill, a landlord will receive the rent. So we're helping both. Uh, the bill also expands the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures to all renters and homeowners and extends how long the moratorium will last. In addition to all of this, uh, it includes $75 billion to help homeowners with mortgage payments and other housing-related costs, funding for public housing and tenant-based rental assistance, and $15.5 billion to help those who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. Uh, this is the support that American workers and families are asking for right now. Um, you know, I, I, I agree um, you know, with a ranking member, you know, th this came at us uh, really quick, but this is something that we focused on in the HEROES Act. So, you know, the fact that we are trying to um, pass a standalone bill to address this issue, um, to keep people from becoming homeless, um, I think that is something that we all agree on. And um, I hope that you will, you know, as a bill moves forward, that you will consider that. Um, because I know that all of you are receiving the same types of calls that I am receiving in my district about people um, insecurity of, of, of where they would, you know, um, sleep tomorrow if they get evicted. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. And um, and we uh, we just have, I just, we think we've connected with Mr. Tipton. So if, if everybody's okay, we'll, we'll go right to Mr. Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak on this bill. I believe it's important to know Democrat leadership gave us no advance warning. We only learned of the bill's consideration this morning. There have been numerous concerns raised about the bill's provisions, including two separate financial service committees and virtual meetings. Nevertheless, I would like to be able to emphasize that Republicans support relief efforts that are targeted and effective for this devastating pandemic. We all saw the good work be accomplished when we worked together, such as the Bipartisan CARES Act. Congress acted swiftly back in March to pass the CARES Act, which in addition to providing robust financial support to individuals and small businesses impacted by COVID-19, increased funding for the HUD and its existing assisted housing program by 25% or its appropriated budget. The CARES Act also provided critical protections for renters through a federal moratorium on eviction for residents from federally assisted properties that last through the summer, in addition to the state or local moratorium. The history, historic relief has worked, stable and slightly declining nationwide forbearance rates, as well as rent collections largely consistent with pre-COVID trends, proof that the CARES Act approach has been the right one. Of course, we should never accept good enough. As an answer to when it comes to providing housing and economic security for our nation's families. But to date, we have a bill that goes in the opposite direction. Instead of following the CARES Act model to be able to focus on those hardest hit by the pandemic, this bill chooses to play politics with American pocketbooks. This bill dusts off old Democratic wish lists and policy goals predating unrelated COVID 19 under the guise of relief. In fact, the House has already voted on this grab bag of 
politicians and partisan heroes had, with several Democrats joined with virtually all Republicans opposing last month, in which the Senate has indicated and a partisan is a partisan non-starter and is not a workable solution. The truth is, this bill is about the fact that far too many large, high-cost metropolitan areas of local decisions and regulation have made the cost of housing too high for many hardworking families. It is a mistake to be able to try to use COVID-19 as a bailout for these high-cost cities for decades of self-made mistakes when we should be helping families meet the challenges this pandemic is forced upon them. To be clear, Republicans have and will continue to be able to support targeted and efficient aid that goes strictly to those who are most in need. We support the solutions for those who have been impacted by the problems that are administered efficiently, targeted toward those who are in need and most, and those who uh, include oversight as well. This bill fails on all of those tests. Of note, a critical element in any new housing assistance uh, legislation is to be able to make that money is actually helping real families with real need, not getting lost in the bureaucratic shuffle. As Chairman Waters has recently said of the CARES Act, since taxpayers are footing the bill, all Americans deserve to be able to examine and all information related to the administrative disbursement utilization of those funds. Here we do agree. That's why Republicans stand ready to be able to work together to be able to find consensus on meaningful reforms, ways to be able to help households deal with the challenges of this awful pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I have no questions, um, Mr. Tipton, but uh, uh, let, let me go back to Mr. Cole to see whether you want to have any questions for Mr. Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be sitting on case one, and I don't have any questions. Okay, uh, so uh, Mr. Hastings, do you have any questions of Mr. Tipton? I have no questions. Or Mr. Perlmutter? Perlmutter? Okay. Uh, Ms. Torres, you all set? Mr. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tipton, you were not the beneficiary of Mr. Perlmutter's wisdom a few minutes ago, but you've probably heard his wisdom on the committee before and can, uh, uh, can attest to the value of it. He was talking about the families that are really going to be running up against a, a deadline uh, here. Um, in the scuttlebutt around the hallway uh, here today, realizing this bill has only been around uh, in, 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 in our knowledge for, for about eight hours, um, it was my understanding that, that we really could have come to an agreement to give certainty to those families that Mr. Perlmutter was talking about, folks who are facing evictions in the, in the same way that we created the original eviction moratorium uh, not in a partisan uh, party line vote, but in a voice vote uh, on the on the floor of the House, that we could have done that very same thing uh, uh, in a narrow way uh, instead of adding another hundred billion dollars worth of additional uh, 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 material. Have you heard any of that same scuttlebutt? I mean, the 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 pain and the struggle that that Mr. Perlmutter is talking about, the anxiety these families are are experiencing, is real. Um, did do you see a bipartisan pathway to to solve that, and are we squandering that opportunity by by moving uh, uh, this surprise legislation instead? You know, I think, uh, and I appreciate the comments and the question. This is very important. We have a pandemic that's impacted families in rural America, urban America, across our nation. It is never a time to be able to play politics. We need to make sure that we are working together as a body. Uh, to be able to give short notice uh, in terms of legislation to be able to move to the floor where we can actually sit down and have the opportunity to be able to discuss the best way forward uh, to make sure that we're using the money efficiently effectively to be able to reach those most in need this can be a squandered opportunity i think that the american people are counting on us to be able to step up to be able to address real need but to also to be mindful that it needs to be targeted it needs to be efficient and uh, eight hours of notice, frankly, to be able to bring the bill to the floor uh, is in a time frame in which we're going to be able to get both parties together to be able to have those discussions, to be able to move to the common goal that I think and hope that we all share, and that's to be able to get targeted assistance to those national And help that we were going to be able to provide. And I just find myself mystified because, again, no one believes the suffering is academic. The suffering is real. 
I find myself mystified why we're recycling language from the HEROES Act, which had more bipartisan opposition to it than it had bipartisan support for it, uh, uh, instead of going with something that we know uh, we can find a, a, a big center of gravity on uh, here on, on Capitol Hill. And I, I know with only eight hours, you, uh, you don't have a chance to, to look at that. But I, if I could, could I, if I could be an encourager uh, uh, to you both, uh, uh, despite your Colorado uh, ties, uh, you've got uh, 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 legislator uh, uh, credentials of, of, of bringing uh, folks together where they might have been apart uh, otherwise. I, um, we're, we're here all week. We're here all uh, all next week. I hope it's not too late uh, to be able to 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 solve this in a way that we know it can cross the House floor, in a way we know it can cross the Senate floor, and in a way that we know the president can put it on its uh, put his signature on it uh, before those uh, those very limited days uh, expire uh, and families across America are counting on us. So I, I thank you both uh, uh, for your work on behalf of those families. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, um, uh, Mr. Raskin. Questions, Mr. Chairman. No okay, questions. Uh, Ms. Lesko. No, oh, no. Okay, uh, Ms. Scanlon. Um, yeah, no. I, I just wanted to thank Mr. Perlmutter for his testimony. Um, one of the things I've heard time and again from my constituents as I've been home over the last few weeks is the fear that they have that they're going to lose their homes, lose what they're renting, lose um, <clears throat> their homes because they can't keep up with their mortgages and their rent, uh, given the current pandemic and the impact it's had upon their jobs and the economy. So I think this is really necessary. Thank you. Back. I, thank you. I just saw Mr. Burgess. Uh, I, I did. Uh, do you have anything you want to add? You all set? Well, uh, there you go. I'll, I just want to thank our witnesses for being here. and. Uh, I know it's been a long day. I, I, I have no other additional questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morelli? Mr. Morelli, you okay? You all set? Ms. Matsui? No questions. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair? Other? Can I? Mr. Pro, uh, you want to ask yeah, yourself Ed, a question? Ed, I'd like to ask myself a question and, and just respond to something uh, Mr. Tipton said. and. And that is that this is the, the, the problem is uh, high rents in urban districts. Absolutely not. First, it's COVID. And in, in fact, um, we're seeing in rural America uh, a bigger problem with foreclosures and evictions, uh, not just because of COVID, but because of the crash in the oil patch and real difficulty in farm country. So this is something that extends from coast to coast and it's rural, suburban, and urban. So I don't, it's not something that's really just an urban phenomenon. In fact, it's, it's uh, multiplied in rural, uh, the rural parts of our, our country. And I just wanted to add that component. All right, are there, are there anybody else uh, wishing to ask any questions of this panel? Hearing none, the, uh, thank you, Mr. Tempted and Mr. Perlmutter, you're back on the Rules Committee. Uh, so, I, 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 uh, are there any other members who wish to testify on HR 7301? Seeing none, that closes the hearing. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, on that measure, um, we're going to we're going to break for five minutes. Uh, but before we do, uh, Mr. Woodall and and, uh, and then Mr. Cole had raised some issues about uh, uh, about uh, the virtual proceedings and you know and and how they're running, um, you know, in the various committees. Um, and as I mentioned before, I received a, a letter along with uh, Mr. Uh, Poyer and Ms. Lofgren uh, from all the uh, ranking members uh, with a series of questions. Um, and, um, and we are, I, 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 I just need to get the sign off from one other, uh, one, one of the, um, one of the, uh, one, one other member, you know, who uh, was sent the letter. Uh, but my, my expectation is either later tonight or early tomorrow morning, that we will provide you with the answers to all of those, um, all of the issues that were raised. Um, I do want to say that, um, you know, um, that, you know, the rules committee, or I, I, I don't want to be the arbiter of every dispute uh, that occurs uh, in every committee. And my hope would be 
Um, and I, I say this as chairman of the Rules Committee, my hope would be that if in fact we are doing something in terms of these virtual hearings, that um, that my ranking is unfair or you know goes against kind of the spirit of of uh, of kind of our pledge to operate in a way that uh, is consistent with, with the way we operated uh, before this that uh, that he would approach me and we would try to work it out and hopefully we would because as kind of the one of the authors of these new procedures these virtual procedures and the uh, in terms of not only how we operate on the floor but he but in, in committee i want to make sure this is done right i want to make sure that that uh, that we're doing this in a way that people think is appropriate and, and has integrity uh so um i mean i'm happy to go into a lot more detail right now uh you know about some of the some of my views on this or we can wait until you get the letter and respond to it uh but i would say to mr cole and mr woodall it's, uh we could either we could do we could get into this a little bit more now or uh we you can wait until we get the letter and we, then we can go into it more then uh, but i i leave it in in your hands well thank you, thank you and uh, certainly would wait for the letter wouldn't you could waste the committee's time tonight or along what's already been a long day let me make very apparent first of all i i think you've tried to operate this uh, fairly openly transparently professionally i think you uh, that's been your spirit from the very start what's animated you I have a great deal of faith uh as well in the majority leader who i think uh, is also uh, approach that but uh while i'm not questioning by his goodwill there inevitably in something new there's going to be questions, particularly when we think we see something that's at odds with, uh, with the, I know how you're trying to operate it, or, or, or sometimes clearly statements that you've made. So we're not exactly sure where to go other than back nope. to you. Right. And, uh, and, and again, we're, we're content that we're going to get a fair hearing there because I know what you're trying to do. But uh, not every chairman is as serious about this as you. And there's in the beginning, and again, I, Please know we recognize we're in a strange or a brave new world here. We're all learning as we go. There's going to be some of these sorts of things, but um, we want the process to be open and fair. As I know, when we got to raise the points, we've got to go someplace. This seems like the logical place to go. You have another place you'd rather us to go? Um, you know, uh, uh, let me another place you'd rather us direct our questions to. You may have a place you want us to go. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, I'm quite content to, to follow your lead there. And again, I want you to understand from us, we uh, we have enormous respect for you professionally and personally. We know that you have uh, uh, taken on a heavy task for the entire house, and that you've tried to operate totally above board, totally inclusively and transparently. So we appreciate that. We got a question. We just actually are more comfortable, quite frankly, coming to you because we think you're fair. Well, first of all, I appreciate that. And I would say that not every ranking member is as reasonable um, as you are. Um, and I will be, uh, you know, and I know that not all of our chairs are, uh, you know, are is, uh, you know, I mean, well, let's put it this way. There may be some, some <laughs> issues that we're have to, going to have to deal with. Um, but, um, but look, no, and I don't, and, and look, and I, and I appreciate, I appreciate the letter. And, I, and, and look, I, as I said before, I want to make sure that this works. Um, my hope is that this is all short-lived, uh, and that in a very, you know, in a very uh, short period of time, we're beyond this. Um, and, uh, and I hope for the rest of my career, we never have to go down this road again. Uh, but I'm, it, it may be that, you know, depending on what happens in the fall, and with the number of cases, that uh, this may continue for a while. But we, but but you know, we, we want to make sure the process has integrity. So I don't I don't have any I don't have any I'm not complaining that um about the questions or the letter i want to make sure you get answers um but um but but some of these issues quite frankly that be resolved between the chairs and the ranking members and if and if they can't be resolved then i think we need to you know maybe we can uh, nudge some people and you can nudge some people well, I, I know you'll be shocked to hear this mr chairman but not every chairman's as fair as you oh well uh, you, you're okay. nice to say that but in any event so all right so at this point then this is going to close the hearing portion of our meeting. 
we, we need to uh, we need to adjourn for five minutes so that we can notify the speaker that we have uh, we have to re so we have to recess for five minutes. We have to notify the speaker that we have complied with all of our regulations so that we can actually have a a virtual markup and and then we will just reconvene in five minutes. At which point I'll yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, to read a motion and then we'll entertain amendments and discussion. So with that, uh, the committee stands in recess for five minutes.
the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. The rule uh, further provides for, for consideration of H.R. 7301, the Emergency Housing Protections and Relief Act of 2020 under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Financial Services. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. Um, uh, the rule provides one motion to recommit. Furthermore, the rule provides for consideration of H.J. Res. 90, providing for congressional disapproval under Chapter 8 of Title 5 of the United States Code of the rules submitted by the Office of the Comptroller of the currency relating to Community Reinvestment Act regulations under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Financial Services. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the joint resolution. The rule read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the joint resolution. The rule uh, provides one motion to recommit. Section 7 of the rule provides that the provisions of Section 125C of the Uruguay Round Agreements Act shall not apply during the remainder of the 116th Congress. Finally, the rule provides HRES 967 agreed to May 15, 2020, and the rule amends HRES 967, agreed to May 15, 2020, in Section 4, by striking July 21, 2020, and inserting July 31, 2020, in Section 11, by striking calendar day of 19, July 19, 2020, and inserting legislative day of July 31st, 2020, and in section 12, by striking July 21st, 2020, and inserting July 2020. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hastings. Uh, you've heard the motion of the gentleman from Florida. Is there any uh, amendment or discussion? Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to ask my good friend Florida to read it all again. I might have missed something there, but <laughs> I will spare the committee that. Um, not surprisingly, Mr. Chairman, we have some suggestions. My first motion is to provide an open rule for HR 7120, HR 51, HR 5332, HR 1425, and HR 7301. Let me just run through briefly, um, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, on uh, um, this legislation of this monumental size, many pieces, and frankly, this little Republican input, uh, we think it's very important uh, that every member uh, have an opportunity to shape uh, legislation uh, on something like, for instance, the D.C. statehood. We actually think the right amendment could lead us, uh, as my friend Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Woodall suggested, maybe there's another representation question. So. Uh, we have some ideas there. On the ACA, I have to tell you the fact that 70% of that particular piece of legislation never went before uh, the committee itself uh, is uh, troubling to us. And uh, on H.R. 5332, we, uh, again, are worried about protecting consumer private information. Finally, H.R. 7301, again, was a bill dropped on us at the very last minute. Uh, it's 92 pages long, it's too, close to $200 billion, someplace between 125 and 194, which numbers, but in any, any event, all these things are going to be passed uh, largely on a partisan vote if they're done this way. Uh, and I don't think that's going to get us very far. Maybe it gets you to a negotiating position, but it's not going to get us much past that unless there's a lot more good take than we've seen. And, and I just remind my friends, you certainly have the votes here to do as a majority what you choose to do. I respect that. Uh, but uh, you, if you pass these things with no Republican support, um, it's not going to be well received in a Republican Senate by a Republican president. So 
I actually think we legislate better, honestly, than the Senate does. Uh, and uh, we showed that in the four um, bills that we were able to get together. To be fair, working with the Senate on the coronavirus relief, I think we've shown that in other occasions. So we just think if you open up the process, you've got a much better chance of ultimately getting to a product. So, again, Mr. Chairman, I would move that we provide an open rule for the bills that I enumerated at the beginning of my presentation. If you heard the gentleman's amendment, any discussion? Uh, hearing none, the vote is on the gentleman's amendment. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 An opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Chairman, can we have a roll call on the A roll call has been requested. The clerk uh, will call the roll. Mr. Hastings? No. Mr. Hastings? No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Ms. Shalala? Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui? No. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Uh, no. Mr. Chairman? No. Book report to total? Four yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, further amendments? Mr. Cole? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I noticed a little hesitancy in your voice, so maybe if we pared this down, you'll be more persuaded. It was it was indigestion. Ah, well, I, uh, whatever it was, it gave me a little <laughs> cause for hope. So uh, let's try <laughs> something a little different. But clearly, we all know uh, uh, HR seventy one twenty is a very important piece of legislation. And frankly, we know from the discussion we had today, we've got some very able legislators working on this on both sides of the aisle. And frankly, we have a bill that has considerable overlap. Uh, I think that provides some hope. Uh, that we could get to a, a good place. Um, I'm a little worried about what I heard happened over in the Senate today. I think that's going to complicate things. But certainly if the aim, uh, I can assure my friends uh, that, uh, well, it's just my opinion. I haven't talked to the majority leader of the United States Senate, but I don't think he's going to take a House bill without a product of his own to go to conference with. Uh, so, again, I, I would suggest we start the bipartisanship on our side of the rotunda open up uh, H.R. 7120 to uh, an open rule, see if we could find some common grounds and actually set a good example for the Senate to work from. So uh, my motion, Mr. Chair, would be recorded an open, a modified open rule for H.R. 7120. Regarding the gentleman's amendment, any discussion? Uh, hearing none, the vote is on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Chair, I have a roll call. The court of vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings? No. Mr. Hastings? No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Ms. Shalala? Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui? No. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? No. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Cole. Thank you. I just got to observe the record, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure we're winning these voice votes. But we're <laughs> right here next to you. And uh, you just give us one of those and I wouldn't press the recorded ones because I'll grant you we're losing those. I, I
I have the Democrats' uh, microphones and sense around. I can't, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move um, in order to admit uh, amendment number two, which is Mr. Stauber's amendment on HR 7120. It would allow uh, for a substitute uh, yeah, motion. So we would actually have an opportunity to vote on the Republican bill as well as the uh, as the democratic bill and i think it's important i think just starting again a bipartisan dialogue at some point would be a good signal i would expect that we would win that vote uh still be able to advance your bill but allowing our bill to arrive before i think it would be a good faith that we have a bipartisan dialogue and uh, i would hope you see it that way so that's my motion Thank you. Um, you know, uh, anybody have any comments? Um, let me just say, if, if I could, that um, as it as as the amendment is drafted, it is not uh, rule compliant. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I'd also like to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a um, a letter signed by uh, a number of uh, civil rights and human rights organizations that. Um, that have a strong, uh, op strong opposition to the Senate bill as drafted uh, without objection. Um, the vote is now on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Uh, an opinion to the chair, the uh, no, uh, the uh, no's have it. Mr. Chair, I still continue to hear us winning that voice. <laughs> <laughs> It is clear that the Republicans are more technologically astute than the Democrats are in terms of using the uh, microphones here. Anyway, the the, uh, uh, the vote is now on the uh, on the uh, call amendment. All um, uh, the uh, roll call has been uh, requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Matsui, no. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Work report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Cole. This will be my last amendment. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I move the committee make an order amendment number four by Mr. Murphy of North Carolina. That amendment uh, actually recedes uh, the District of Columbia back to Maryland, as, as was discussed when we actually focused on that. You know, this to me is a reasonable solution. It takes care of the representation problem. Uh, it's clearly constitutional. We've receded territory out of the District of Columbia before back to the state. So it seems to me a bipartisan answer to uh, what's likely to be a very partisan vote. I think it ought to be put up for consideration. So with that, uh, I'll go for that as an amendment. Mr. You've heard the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor, uh, any, any discussion? Hearing none, the vote is on the call amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Oh. The chair of the no's have it. I'm going to try one more time. It's still winning, my voice. I can tell you. The, uh, the, the, the a roll call has been requested. The clerk will call, call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings, no. Mrs. Torres, no. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, I'm sorry. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, Ms. Matsui, no. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. 
Lesko. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Woodall. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment uh, to the rule, and I move that the committee make an order amendment number one offered by Mr. McHenry to HR 5332. Um, the McHenry substitute um, removes uh, the reliance on Social Security uh, numbers. It removes uh, paid non-elective medical debt from credit reports. It allows parents to electronically freeze their minor children's cre uh, credit reports. Uh, it requires sources for public record uh, uh, data uh, that's reported in credit reports. It prohibits the inclusion of adverse information related to predatory mortgage lending, financial abuse, or fraud uh, associated with student loans in credit reports. And it directs the CAO to study and report to Congress uh, on the use of non-traditional data uh, in credit scoring. Uh, I think as we all heard, uh, H.R. 5332 uh, does not uh, come anywhere close to meeting the standard uh, for a partnership uh, bipartisan bill that we can get to the president's desk. Uh, but I believe uh, this uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute uh, uh, would. Uh, and uh, I would ask the uh, committee to make it in order in its consideration. You heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, the vote is on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Can you chair the noes have it? A roll call, please, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings, no. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Matsui. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman. No. Work report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Uh, further amendments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule and move that the committee make an order to grant the necessary waiver for amendment number four, offered by myself to HR 1425. Uh, this amendment would strike sections 204 and 205 of the bill and requires a report by Medicaid expansion states on the number. Medicaid enrollees within the expansion population that are above the state's Medicaid income eligibility threshold. If I may speak to that. Um, and before, Mr. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, before you do, let me just encourage everybody who's in the room with you to to mute their um, uh, their microphones if they haven't already done so, because you kind of you echo. Um, okay, or you may proceed. Sorry. Very well. Uh, I, I, I won't mute my microphone, if that's okay. Um, so we have state Medicaid budgets right now that really are expanding rapidly. And it seems to me that we should be helping the states, not in fact trying to hurt them. The Foundation for Government Accountability published a report on June 10, 2020, entitled States are about to be hit by a Medicaid tidal wave, close quote, saying that the coronavirus and all the coronavirus is putting an extra budget pressure on states with general revenues expected to decrease by 20% because of demand destruction with the stay at home orders. It also states that expansion states will be hit the hardest. I would like to request that this report be inserted into the record. The bill before us today would reduce states' administrative FMAPs if they do not expand Medicaid. So this is punishing states in a way that would further hurt state budgets, state budgets that are already pushed to the limits. So let's not forget that back in 2012, when the Supreme Court heard the case of the National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius, it ruled that threatening states' Medicaid funding for not expanding Medicaid.
Medicaid was in fact unconstitutional. And it seems to me that both sections 204 and 205 would violate the same principles and be coercive of states rather than incentivizing states to expand Medicaid. In addition to striking these two likely unconstitutional sections of this bill, this amendment enhances transparency in the Medicaid program, and it requires expansion states report on the number of Medicaid enrollees who have income above the Medicaid eligibility threshold. There was a study done at the Mercatus Center published uh, recently in November of 2019 entitled the ACA's Medicaid Expansion, a review of ineligible enrollees and improper payments. And I would like to request that this report be made part of the record. Without objection. So uh, sections 204 and 205 of this bill are destructive to non-expansion states and their Medicaid programs. In the midst of this pandemic, we should not be adding to states' financial burdens when they're trying their best to provide care to vulnerable Americans. And I urge a, I vote and then yield back. Uh, you've heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Uh, if not, then the vote is on the um, Burgess Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. No. 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 Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Oh, Mr. Chairman, actually, we will need a roll call vote on that. Okay, uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Shalala. Ms. Matsui. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman. No. Work report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Is there any other amendment or discussion? Mr. Chair. Ms. Lesko, where are okay, you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order, amendment number four by Mr. Armstrong from North Dakota to HR 7120. Mr. Chairman, recordings of interviews are accurate. They protect interviewees, defendants, and police by eliminating the potential of abuse and bias by federal law enforcement. Interviews can last for hours and people are inherently prone to mistakes. Requiring all interviews to be recorded eliminates inaccurate or incomplete note-taking done by federal law enforcement while simultaneously reducing the burden on judiciary, law enforcement, and defendants alike. Recording should extend throughout the entire interaction with law enforcement. As currently written, subsection C requires law enforcement to wear a body camera and have dash cams. Court proceedings produce a written transcription. Why should interviews conducted by law enforcement be any different? This common sense requirement simplifies the adjudication of interview statements which saves resources and time and reduces motions to suppress statements and confessions, improving the law enforcement interview process altogether. All of these reasons serve to increase public confidence in law enforcement and are why organizations such as the Innocence Project supports this policy. I ask my colleagues to support this amendment. You've heard the uh, amendment for the gentleman. Any discussion? Uh Hearing none, the vote is on the Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. No. 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 Any of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chair, I ask for a roll call vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings, no. Mrs. Torres. No. <laughs> Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Promoter. No. Mr. Promoter, no. Mr. Raskin. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, no. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. 
Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Working for the total. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Is there any other amendment or discussion? Hearing none, the question is now on the motion offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings. Um, uh, all those in favor will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. 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 The opinion of the chair the ayes have in the motion is agreed to. I, I really believe you don't have to that to the When you call them out, there's at least three that I think are. So this, the roll call has been requested. For your consideration. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mrs. Torres. Torres, aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Ms. Shalala. Aye. Ms. Shalala, aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Mrs. Lesko. No. Mrs. Lesko, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Report, report the total. Nine yeas, four nays. All right. I ayes have the motion is agreed to. Accordingly, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, will manage this for the majority. And the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, will manage for the Republic. And let me just say to everybody, uh, thank you uh, for uh, bearing with us for over seven hours now, I mean, seven and a half hours of, of hearing. And I want to thank uh, members on both sides um, uh, for their participation. And, uh, you know, uh, and I especially thank the staff on both sides, uh, majority and the minority for being up with us. They don't get paid nearly enough. Um, and so I appreciate that very much. Do we have enough food for everybody? Because I don't, I don't. And and uh, uh, and without objection, the committee is adjourned.